Hello and welcome to the IRDR Annual Conference, Risk Without Borders. I want to say a warm welcome to all of you to UCL, to the MAPS faculty and to the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, IRDR. It's really wonderful to have those of you with us who are in the room and also those of you who are joining us online. And I hope you all enjoy today um, and excited as I am to hear all the different speakers, panellists, chairs speak. Uh, we've got a great programme and I want to say thank you in advance to all the speakers, um, everyone who's got to stay together behind the scenes and also to the audience because I know you're going to ask us lots of exciting questions and I look forward to hearing them on you. There's no pressure there, just uh, that's the expectation at the beginning of the day. The idea has grown a lot since last year. Uh, for those of you who were here last year at the annual conference, we've had many new staff, new students. So I'd like to welcome in particular those staff who have joined us in the last 12 months. Associate Professor in International Relations, Philip Cunliffe. Professor of Risk and Disaster Reduction, Mark Pelling. Professor in Geophysical Hazard Risks, Fatima Jalea. The Lecturer in Disaster and Crisis Risk Finance, Stefan Liefers. Two associate professors, uh, sorry, two associate lecturer teaching in risk, disaster, and humanitarianism, Miles Harris and Caroline Russell. A future leadership fellow in climate and change adaptation, adaptation Susanna Fisher. Um, and we're also soon to be joined by two lecturers um, on the 3rd of July, the lecturer in risk and uh, perception and communication, Sarah Dryhurst, and the lecturer in disaster and crisis response, Dan Haynes, who you will be hearing from later today. We've also had an increase in student numbers. We're running our BSc Global Humanitarian Studies second year for the first time this last year, and next year will be the first time, first time we have our third year students. So at next year's conference, we'll be saying we're graduating our first set of BSc students, which is particularly exciting. We have about 90 students across our master's programs, the MRES in Risk and Disaster Reduction, the MSc in Risk, Disaster and Resilience, and the MSc in Risk and Disaster Science. And we've got some exciting changes coming to those programs related to some of those new appointments. Our BSc in Global Humanitarian Studies, as I've mentioned, has grown and is developing through the years. And we're excited to see those students with us and to be the future leaders of tomorrow. Some of you know IRDR well and you know what we're about. Some of you, this might be your first experience here with us or joining us for a conference. We're all about multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary working. Working across sectors, working across boundaries, working across borders. And so I hope many of the conversations we have today reflect that very ethos of what we're about and what we aim to do. We want to look at understanding the causes and consequences of disaster and really think about how can we catalyze change? How can we make a difference? Yesterday at the Humanitarian Summit, the common themes came through. The need for data, the need for evidence, for the importance of analyzing the evidence use, and using it, and then bringing in innovation and making change. And there was a call from many of the speakers to say, we need to change the sector, we need to look at things differently, we need to accept sometimes that we might not be doing things in the best way, and we need to have new voices from different fields coming in with ideas. So that is an appeal to all of you to say, be some of those new voices or the existing voices, but think in a new way. And particularly to our students, you will be those voices of the future. So use what you're learning and look at these challenges. Think about some of the questions posed today. Think about the challenges that are coming out from today and think, one day I'm gonna solve them. And I always say this to our students, I say, this is what we want from you. I want to see in the future that you have solved one of these problems, or all of them, perhaps. <laughs> Your names are going to be there. You are going to make a difference. And there is a desire for you. So really you know, keep that with you as you go through. So with that, I'd like to say again, welcome. Um, I'm going to hand over to a in a moment to Rosanna Himmes who's going to introduce the conference today and go through the themes and what's, what's coming up today, and then we'll hand over to the speakers. So be involved, listen, challenge, innovate, be part of the conversation, but don't let it end today. Listen to what we're hearing today, absorb the themes, think about the challenges, but then do something about it. We don't want to have the same conversation in five years' time. In five years' time, we want to say, oh, I remember those conversations from five years ago, and this is what's happened since. This is how things have changed. This is how we're doing better. 
And now we've got a load of new problems to solve. So with that, I hand over to Rosanna Himmes. Welcome. everyone. So a very warm welcome to the IRD annual conference on risk without borders. Uh, to everyone who's here in person and for all those attending online. Um, my name is Rosanna Himas and I'm an associate professor in economics at um, UCL IRD and I'll be chairing this session uh, with um, Stefan as the keynote. The pandemic was a really good reminder of how disaster risk knows no borders in a physical and metaphorical sense. Uh, now, risk spills over almost effortlessly across space and time, and working across these borders to reduce risk is a challenge for researchers and practitioners. So in today's conference, we will examine some of the challenges and possible solutions that risk researchers and practitioners face when assessing, managing, and reducing risk across different borders from multiple perspectives. And so these include economic and political, formal and informal borders, uh, borders considering data, communication, collaboration, and diplomacy. And we've got a lineup of prominent um, extraordinary experts who have contributed immensely to their fields. Before we begin, though, um, there are some housekeeping announcements. So in case the fire alarm goes off, uh, please note that the fire exits over there um, and uh, the fire exits um, you outside. With Wi-Fi access, you can log into the UCL guest um, in the available networks and then register your own details. Um, it's a very warm day. Water fountains are on the ground floor by the machines and the toilets are on the ground floor. Yeah. Coffee and tea will be available during the morning and afternoon breaks and the evening reception. Lunch will be provided to speakers and staff and students but in, in Mallet room 1.2, uh, and you can follow me, but we don't have lunch, unfortunately, for the other attendees. But of course, uh, the good news is there are several wonderful cafes outside <laughs> the building, uh, and one of our event assistants in the, at the front desk will be very happy to provide guidance if any of you are new to UCL or new to London. Now, with that, I would like to introduce to you Professor Stefan Dercon, who will be presenting the keynote address. Stefan is Professor of Economic Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government and the Economics Department at the University of Oxford. He's also the Director of the Centre for the Study of African Economies that runs this wonderful conference. How many years is it now, Stefan? 15, we 20? Lost counts, but 31, it seems. It is, it is the most amazing conference. Um, um, there you have, I will recommend you to join if you haven't, but um, yes, he's the director of the Center for the Study of African Economies. Between 2011 and 2017, for nearly eight years, Stefan was chief economist of the Department of International Development. That's the DFID, and that's a government department in charge of UK's um, aid policy and spending. And between 2020 and 2022, he was a development policy advisor to successive foreign secretaries at the FCDO. Um, so Stefan comes with a very strong academic and um, policy practice background as well, policy influencing background as well. So he'll be speaking on agency, anticipation, and disaster dis risk reduction for about 45 minutes uh, in his keynote address. And then this will be followed by a question and answer session. Here's your chance to ask Stefan all those difficult questions. All those things that you, all those problems that you want to solve in five years, now's the time to start asking him about it. Uh, Stefan, we're really privileged and honored to have you with us. Thank you so much.
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rosanna. And um, it's great to be here. I'll be honest, I didn't quite know much about uh, the setup here. And it's uh, just exciting to see so many people interested in many of these issues. So, um, so this is, I'm going to talk about a bit on the policy side and a bit on the research side around things that have really annoyed me when I was working in DFID. Uh, which is actually something where um, I come very much out of the development side of uh, international aid kind of context as a researcher on development. I actually did my PhD a long, long, long time ago about how <coughs> poor farmers cope with risk in rural Tanzania and how they um, basically try to get rich by accumulating cattle and things like that. And, uh, but it was all focused on, on risk and uh, this quest for getting more evidence around how do we think about both risk and then over time, how do we respond to it? You know, how can we do as, um, as, as policy makers in the policy set, you know, how do you respond to it? So once I joined DFID, um, as chief economist, you of course discovered that quite a lot of the aid money goes into disaster kind of relief and, and, and programs. And then you discover that actually we're broadly talking about, and I know I'm going to upset a few of you, an evidence-free zone. Relative to what's actually being constructed as an evidence base around development and arguably often the failures and the difficulties to do it, there is just so little rigorous, careful evidence around anything to do with the humanitarian sector. And it's very striking. They all talk about data and evidence. It was meant to be good. They've been doing that forever. And it's a very hard sector to actually get ready to say, look, just trying to do good is not good enough. You need to think about how you do it. And not just assume, because you have humanitarian principles and good principles in terms of what you want to do, that you actually do the right thing. And so this is something where I've uh, coming out of DFID actually very much really felt like this is an area where also as research I should try to get more involved in. Um, I have a series of, of, of pieces of work over time. I wrote a book with, with a former student of mine, Daniel Clark, who is now the director of the Center for Disaster uh, Risk Disaster Center for um, uh, is it again? Reduction of something, yeah sorry. <laughs> CDP. The protection, sorry, I should know, since I'm on the board of it. Uh, <laughs> but it's early days, it's early, it is early in the morning. Anyway, uh, CDP, that's what I, what I knew, I was looking for my P. Uh, but, but, you know, sent it there, that actually focuses. But, you know, I'm an economist, I'm a social scientist, and I'm trying to think, he's very much comes out of the actuary world, of the finance side. There's a lot there that, you know, the whole humanitarian sector often is just obsessed with just giving the money and trust us, we do well with it. And actually, you know, we need to think about the systems, the structures, the way we do it. Okay? So, and it's in a way that I want to talk about. I won't talk about my, my last job in government because, you know, as, as, as Rosanna uh, also noticed, my CV, I don't put the names of these uh, foreign secretaries I was advising, but, you know, because one cannot be quite proud of the success one has with advising Dominic Raab and this trust. Um, but, but anyway, but you still sit there in it. What I definitely learned in it, it's a highly political environment, and where evidence is actually this real struggle of trying to get, you know, serious evidence to take a place within it. So, and it's a, some of the things I want to talk about, and more specifically see uh, doing it. Look, let me start with a basic uh, basic fact, okay? So for all the research, what we do know that, of course, shocks, extreme events, climate disasters and other extreme events, they have long-lasting effects, okay? So, and it's the, it's the basic thing. That part of research, is huge amounts of evidence about it, okay? And, and, and the logic is really is that, you know, it's not just a temporary bleep, but it destroys people's assets, resilience, ability to, to actually recover. These things matter, okay? Um, clearly something has gone wrong already with my titles, let me not uh, worry about it. Uh, I have twice the same title, but don't worry. Clearly something went <laughs> this morning wrong with, uh, with my changing of the titles. But I want to actually first talk a bit about the existing system, the, in the way the existing system tends to work, and then actually want to mainly focus on today on, you know, how can we begin to both use evidence 
also political commitment that it needs to be part of it to actually get something better. So the typical setup in a crisis, an extreme event happens. An earthquake, a flood, a drought, it happens. Somehow a serious crisis gets people uh, are alerted to it. Could be with early warning, it could be with other systems, but typically at some point it's in your face. Okay? The moment at some point it comes in the press. The way the system tends to work is then and we'll go in. You know, the UN goes in assessing needs, needs assessments, doing the whole thing. We're going to do a nice planning process, all the UN agencies and so on, a humanitarian plan gets designed. Then we need to actually probably do an appeal, mobilize the funding, try to get the funding, and now we're going to actually give support to people. Okay, that's the kind of classic model. So, you know, when I was in DFED, I was very involved in a number of these crises. 2015 in Ethiopia, it's a very striking one, it was an El Nino drought. Basically, around, around the 1st of September, I'm a researcher on Ethiopia as well, I follow all this information, it's very clear the harvest was going to fail. In quite a lot of places, not just in the pastoralist areas in the east where it's often happening, much more recurrent, but actually in the highlands as well, the central and southern highlands. So we kind of know it, and we, we know it. Okay. The sequence that then happens is exactly what I described then. You know, first of all, yeah, people take until the end of the whole series, yeah, wait a little bit, but by early October, UN says we're going to mobilize ourselves. Of course, of course, much more deeper into it, they assumed Ethiopia at the time was a country like Somalia, bringing all the, all the experts from South Sudan and South Sudan and, and behave as if that country, which actually was functioning remarkably well then, but let's uh, start doing it, start mobilizing, getting your plan together by the early December, the appeal was ready, appeal was announced, um, early, early January, the money comes in, um, of course only 53% are a normal, normal thing with humanitarian plans, and I will start doing the whole thing. Strangely enough, you know, by the time anything started being delivered, we were talking March, April, um, while well, actually we knew it in September. And the whole sequence is both a lot of time gets wasted, actually a lot of other things go really wrong, which is essentially um, we are highly politicizing it uh, because, you know, there was a big battle between the government who actually has a safety net systems in place. The UN saying, yeah, no, but there's American money involved, so we can't go through the government. We have to set up a whole parallel system and we're going to deliver it all in parallel, and you get endless stuff going on uh, in the whole thing. Nepal, the earthquake, similar issues started happening, you know. Uh, I remember being there in 2014, everybody says the big one is due at some point, of course we don't know when exactly, but the big one was going to come. You could walk in every government office, and you see the multiple disaster response plans that every agency has funded so beautifully on the shelf. It's already there. What happens? The earthquake happens. Um, president is in Indonesia at that time, but basically the team gets his head and so which one of the shell, and they took one of the shells and they started acting to it, probably as they, they should have done. Uh, they started trying to organize themselves a little bit. President flies back in after a few days and says, no, I'll take charge. We up all the plans, I'm going to take charge. And we're going to take charge in the whole response plan, and then, you know, money begins to slowly flow in. Um, and so we're talking, I think it was in May 2015, and by December 2015, at last, the cabinet manages to agree how they're going to spend the money. So six months later, and uh, that kind of thing. So you get these things that are functioning, and, it, and our argument, my argument definitely has been over for a while now, is that it's a lot to do with how we set up these systems where we wait for the disaster, then everything, we're going to start acting on it, we're going to set up the systems, we let actually political control to come in, whether it's from the international agencies or locally and whatever. And so what we get is that post-disaster, very slow, politicized tactical decision-making, in this case, like in, in Nepal, a response that every agency needs to own thing. You know, as I said, you know, if it's American money, it can't go through the government, so it's going to be uh, parallel systems, NGOs, and whatever need to be all in there fighting over it. 
And in the end, when we then raise money with his appeal, we get typically about half the money we need to have. Think about incentives. Incentives matter in this story. If I'm the UN, how do I make my humanitarian response plan if I know that on average 53% will be funded? You know what you will do. You will inflate it, but you can't prioritize. You actually make all kinds of a massive plan, and then actually it gets a very uncoordinated, very, very uh, poor response. And the other side to it is that, of course, pre-disaster, you know, you don't really plan, because actually, why should you plan if you just don't know what the resources and who will be in charge afterwards? Why would you plan anything beforehand? How would you decide which one of the disaster plans on the shelf that you're going to pick if you don't know what the president will say and how they will want to take, uh, take charge of the whole thing? Uh, and as a result, you know, you underinvest in all these things, because what's the point? Any, any outside agency comes in for a disaster planning, you take the money because, you know, it keeps your system going. But actually, it is not real. And a big part of it is then essentially is the financial side. You know, you're just not going to invest in the things that you need to invest in. You may actually not invest in risk reduction either, but actually you just don't get it right. And then the whole financing model is very 12th century. 12th century is because it was before we discovered uh, risk-based financing systems. <laughs> um, basically, you just do begging bowls. That's 12th century. You wait until the disaster happens, and then you go around and ask for the money. And I just want to emphasize, I mean, some of you may well be experts also on the finance side, but many are not. How important the finance is to create incentives to do the right thing. If you know it's afterwards, I have to go around. Why would I plan carefully? Because I've no idea how much money I get. If you go and look at humanitarian response plans of the UN, there's a huge variance. Sometimes you get 40%. Sometimes, if it's somehow a country in the news, you get 70%. And you know, what are the incentives to prepare the plans if you know it's always underfunded? How do you design effective, efficient systems of response if you actually finance them in the end with a begging bowl? You have delays, you have all this kind of stuff. So one of the things that you get, you get exposed systems always responding afterwards based on these appeals that are done late, politicized, insufficient, and so on. And then the thing that I really value here is actually this simple point. Well, where are the people here? You know, they are facing the disaster. They have no idea whether aid will come because it's all going to depend on how much support is going to come in. It doesn't need to come from outside, even from their governments, because these processes are translated in local governments as well. In the US, it's between local governments and the federal disaster response uh, planning. In, uh, in, in India, it's also between the center and the state. You don't know what it will be. Why are the people there? They have to just wait. They, can't, they have no idea what the right response is. They have no certainty that actually support will come. They have no agency. They can't plan anything. Because disasters are part of life, but the one big unknown is it's about the nature of the support. So you need to do with your own resources. Yes, they do. And we know have a lot of evidence that poor people prepare themselves for extreme events. But when it comes close to it, well, they have no agency in actually dealing with anything because everything comes exposed. When it's late, well, how can I actually then really act still? And it all becomes this kind of passive recipient of our support while there's no more agency around people. So, and this is a bit where we're kind of thinking about, you know, how can we get systems going that actually have agency and that actually anticipate what's happening? So I'm going to talk about an example of some work we've been doing also with that World Food Program, but also with OCHA in, in New York, the basically humanitarian coordinator's office, at least the previous one was very interested in that, and, uh, and basically systems that we're trying to set up. And actually, think what most suggest this is an example, not the only one, but of the way we should think more systematically about these responses. And so the question is really, how do you design a better humanitarian system that are reliable, better targeted, that are faster, and that actually respect people. And how can we actually do this, uh, that we do it? So in a book with uh, Daniel Clark that I mentioned earlier, we talked about the basic framework. Actually, the big part of it, can we actually deliver these things, was not clear then. And so we now have a set of examples working with international agencies where we can actually show this kind of approach begins to work and actually is quite a lot of interest now in beginning to scale some of these things. And what are the three things? 
You know, if at the moment a decision-making process is exposed and highly politicized, uh, and you know, very much like, oh, well, the, the big man has to, or the big woman has to be in charge, usually the big man, um, has to be in charge and making all the big decisions, um, you know, can we actually get a much better decision-making framework that actually is so much more evidence-based? Similarly, rather than expose, starting to get, you know, all the experts from Somalia and Sudan into Ethiopia and say, oh, we'll just start setting up all these parallel systems and, and we ignore what's there, actually say, can we actually get pre-established, clear action plans that, would have, that we would uh, implement? But then the key part of it, and I will talk less about it, but hopefully in questions it can come up as well, it's about the financing. You know, that's the glue that keeps these things together. If the financing for particular plans is there, pre-arranged, can do it. Okay? And that's the illusion that I will make. It's a bit like insurance. If you have an insurance policy, you contract with someone that you will get a certain type of support. By the way, I'm not trying to suggest we buy insurance for these places, but you think like an insurance system. There's lots of reasons why it wouldn't just be market-based stuff, but basically let those who need to respond, whether it's a government or an international agency, and hopefully together, they think about it. We need to pre-arrange the financing as a way of enforcing the contract we have with the citizens. We have a particular way that we will respond, a fair way of responding, but the finance will guarantee that you can actually implement it, that it's not weak. And that, that's why the finance can't be exposed with the begging bowls. It has to pre-arrange as well. So, what are the ingredients that we could use in the cases that we're working on? So, first of all, it's a massive body of evidence that actually tells us that, keep it simple, cash transfers are not perfect, but they are amazing relative to virtually anything else you ever compare it with. So basically, we have a massive body of evidence, whether it's in crisis settings or in, um, or in um, more social protection, more regular crisis type of things, uh, seasonal hunger and things like that, that actually keep it simple, actually is probably the best guarantee that people actually get it. Okay? If we start tracking in food, we end up complicating things because we're going to have to deal with traders, with imports, with distortions, with price effects and the whole thing. If we give the transfer in cash to people that they can buy the food, it seems to be typically much better. I simplify it, but I will actually say, and that's a strong statement to make, there is no area in development where there's more evidence than on that cash transfers really make a difference in terms of welfare of people. There's probably no area at all when we look at beneficiary impacts uh, that actually it does make a substantial impact. Not perfect, but it's, uh, it's quite stuff. I can talk more about it later. Um, for me, the, the, it was brought home uh, once where we were doing an evaluation of a social protection system, of a cash transfer system in Western Kenya, and we were walking around in the, the, the village to talk to some of the beneficiaries preparing for our evaluation. And uh, there was this one lady and said, oh, it's nice to see you here. Can I tell you what the most beautiful sound in the world is? And she said, ping, ping, ping. I said, well, what is this? No, it's the sound like the raindrops falling on my tin roof. Ping, ping, ping. And we looked all very confused. That's the noise that my mobile phone makes when the cash transfer uh, arrives. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's something there, and this, uh, you know, we have to be careful with these beneficiary feedback type of things, but it's there. We also know in humanitarian setting, even in refugee camps and so on, how even we may not be able to prove that cash is so much better than more in-kind support, but it's definitely more dignified than many other things. And the restoring of dignity it definitely in extremely set circumstances is clearly very important. I'll come back to that on some of the evidence. The second ingredient we have we can do better is that once we accept that if we keep it simple, we may actually help better, is actually the second thing is digital, uh, uh, digital the change of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, the extent of digital access in, in even in poor settings. Basically, mobile payment systems 
that in many developing countries are arguably better developed than they were here. Now it's going much faster after COVID, but actually, you know, we were doing this in Kenya for a while. We have these amazing schemes now in India that very fast, within a few years, totally digitize up to the poorest uh, groups of population. Uh, the systems, it's digital payment system. We're working in Bangladesh on the things I'll talk about more, where I was surprised by the numbers because I was concerned with our revaluation. I was just concerned that actually the bank data suggests that 80% of households now have digital wallets. Okay? Now that's 80% of households, even though we know they don't always have a mobile phone, but they just have the SIM card, a digital wallet in it, they can use it with someone else and they can receive it. Mobile payments, of course, simplify, even in crisis settings, the way we can actually reach people fast, timely, with clear beneficiary feedback systems possible and so on. So it helps with accountability and corruption as well. And then the last thing, you're pleased to hear, science. Science helps, you know. It's, uh, uh, you know, despite the fact that sometimes economists and social scientists may behave, it isn't, but it helps. And actually, one of the things, of course, the big changes is that whether it's based on climate models or hydrological models or seismological models, if that's the right word, uh, we, can actually, we can actually model much more. Okay? And this is what we can exp uh, exploit, because if we can model with predictive power, we can go faster. And so it's basically what we'll exploit is the ability to use forecast models in a more effective way to actually go faster. So that you don't why wait until everything has happened, but you can be earlier. And so basically, I'll give you a, a, one, one version, an anticipatory humanitarian system that can be looked at, has these principles where you do a lot of careful uh, work on the forecasting and the decision-making process, where you have clear action plans, and where you use the prearranged financing, I typically would say to tie the hands of the politicians, and the UN, both of them, and you basically tie their hands to something you're actually going to do. If you use that, I will show that we can actually do this, we can actually be earlier, and as a result, provide more agency to people as well in the choices they can make. So, and it's all these things need to be built in. So, what we're talking about is a set of research programs, this is a slide of where OCHA, so the humanitarian coordinator in, in New York, has been supporting it. So this was Mark Loco, okay, the former chief economist, of, as a former permanent secretary of DFID, that was there, was very interested in that stuff. Um, and um, he managed to mobilize people to do it. Um, one of my nicer stories that I heard at some point is that this book I had written about disaster risk finance, when he joined OCHA on the first day, he did exactly how a manager can scare his whole organization to read the book. He waved the book around and said, maybe you should all read this. And so the result is endless pilots in the system of, uh, of trying to do it. Um, where well, are we actually trying to, uh, very few, only few of them I'm involved in, but mainly lots of other people, try to see can we actually get this going? Can we use these principles to just be faster and as a result getting before the crisis is, is, uh, is, is at its extreme level um, and, and can we actually do this? So what did we do in Bangladesh? Just make it concrete. So, Face value, we'd say, okay, what we did is not that different. We managed to get, with a, well, WFP managed to get uh, $50, about $50, sent by mobile phone uh, towards people's uh, digital wallet, about $50 to a number of households, 23,000 households, uh, when the Amuna River in Bangladesh uh, flooded. Now, the main thing that we managed to do is that rather than the usual thing where the aid tends to come a couple of months later after the plan has been approved and the whole thing is it, we were there five days before the flood. So we managed to target people, uh, and I'll show you how, how well the forecast algorithms worked, basically that we could actually get that money to them before the crisis. We think we got it 50 to 75 days before normally the response would have been reaching these people. So that's the kind of thing that we could achieve in it. Um, that was a massive flood in 2020. 
uh, second highest uh, Yamuna River flooding. And of course, this is where the science can help us because you can know quite well in advance what will happen with flooding if you do the hydrological modeling well. Basically, Yamuna River, I remember hiking in the Himalayas to its source, that's a long way up in the Himalayas, and it's a long way before you reach Bangladesh. And so, with the, during the monsoon period, you can follow how it's evolving, and actually, a very careful hydrological models were used all the way from inside India then to actually get this, uh, this, this work going. And in fact, um, what we managed to do then is by basically having a trigger-based system. And a more effective system is basically trigger-based and forecast-based. So we managed to do the, the, the forecast model. We built in beforehand five to ten day projections and we built in triggers that they needed to be triggered at uh, what, what we think would happen five days later, ten days later. Okay, and so, so you can see it, so, and the, basically the system worked. First, the 10-day trigger with more forecast error would be triggered. Preparation starts. The five-day trigger, we decided to act. Okay, and so we basically do it. It's essentially like that. We could, of course, only do this sensibly. It's not just a bunch of scientists somewhere in an office and saying, oh, it's going to happen, and then make some noise. But actually, we had pre-arranged uh, an identification of vulnerable people based on previous experience of vulnerability and we managed to uh, identify them in the period after it got triggered we could call them, check whether they were still who they were and so on and so on we could uh, do this whole thing and then actually manage to get the cash transferred to their digital wallets all within a matter of days and we had then arranged the finance Basically, we were guaranteed that however much we would need, we would get the money literally with the press, press of the button. Immediately, the money would be available. Uh, in this case, it was from a fund in the UN that we had it. So here is a little bit what the, how the science was, was working. So uh, let me try to explain. So this is 2020, what was happening. We have here the observed water flow is blue. But the dotted line is the prediction, the prediction model. It was pretty good, no? <laughs> uh, and it was the prediction, and this was the five-day prediction. So, you know, we were pretty well exposed to also pretty happy to see this, that actually we really got the models really right. I mean, I didn't do the models, but the, the modelers did an amazing job on that. And, but it's important that, uh, you know, if we did it just the five days, that's when we needed to make sure the money could start going into people's pockets. So we triggered everything to be ready and we just simply corrected who should be getting it five days before. Just a basic quick uh, algorithm correction doing it. But all the preparations were triggered 10 days before. And so in this 10 day period, a call center called everybody, checked their details, when it's all there, whether, they're there, what, whether the, the digital wallets were in place and the whole kind of thing. And so and then we could five days before uh, starting to, to operationalize it and you see then two days later everything started going into people's wallets and a few with, with some corrections most of it so this is the the the, the distribution the histogram of, of the cash transfers the recipients and so on a few came a bit later because there were still some errors and we wanted to correct those creates a bit of issues with the evaluation i will be honest uh, but relative to all the things you know the all the the the, 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 the bunch was there and then basically the Unitarian plan was announced well after we had already done all the transfers. And then you see, that's the plan announced. Then they go to fund trace, then they're going to get the trucks in, then they go to start the stuff, and then they start actually moving it. Because that's, that's how it is, you know? Cash transfers, even though typically in the humanitarian system, it's literally a truck with cash going to the village <laughs> and start distributing it. So don't have any illusions how these things are actually working. So we could really get a fascinating type of thing. So this is this is an illustration of what the science can do. Now, the rest of the talk, I want to actually talk a little bit about, and so what happened. And so this is probably one of the first evaluations of a humanitarian response. I say that because actually it's incredibly hard to ever get a humanitarian agency to help you find the decent counterfactual so that you actually can actually get some evidence of the impact 
we have endless evidence of, yeah, the people are really happy that I gave them $50. And that's basically the nature of most of the evidence of humanitarian evaluation. You only talk to the beneficiaries, but you don't talk to those who didn't get it at counterfactual. And so, and this is what we managed to do. I will go quick a bit. The cash transfer evidence doesn't tell us that. The cash transfer evidence mostly, there's a bit of exceptions, but mostly tells us in more secure settings, social security systems, cash transfer systems, where we have to be able to even to be able to randomize and we have been able to do things, we could actually get some careful things. This is not something you can do in a crisis situation. You know, randomizing in a crisis situation, lots of good reasons why you would probably not touch it. You could probably do it, there's a limited resources, but it's not a very comfortable thing to do. Okay? We also couldn't really we also felt like we shouldn't try to do this here. But um, where the evidence are, well, we have very little evidence of um, what happens when you have a fast onset disaster, a climate, uh, climate uh, thing, earthquake, transfers, and so on. We also have very little evidence whether the timing actually matters. Okay? Whether the timing actually matters, because you could say, look, maybe it didn't matter that it came 50 days later. They would run down their savings and then you could bring the money in. It's all fine. Maybe it works. Um, in general, the impact of our interventions, very, very little. And so this is what we now uh, try to do, is to actually say, well, what, how did this one of cash transfer um, matter? Well, I'm very glad to say, I probably wouldn't stand here telling you all these things excitedly, that we do find that actually three months later, when we could do, this was middle of COVID, so we had to do a phone survey, a careful phone survey, people have perfected this, how to do this, we could actually, um, and the fact that we work digitally of course helped here, um, we could actually establish that um, anticipatory cash transfers, three months later still got us better welfare outcomes, uh, surprisingly small, uh, sorry, surprisingly um, broad effects, even though the transfer is only $50. Uh, we clearly have evidence that the agency of the recipients, the choice set of the recipients, was increased. And the gains, and I will talk you through these results now, but I just want to signpost them. And the gains from the early action are actually quite significant. And even five months later, we still have better outcomes for those people than the people who didn't receive it, even though it's only $50. Okay? So, how did we do this? How did we do this? And this is the, 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 I need to briefly talk about the nature of the counterfactual. So, as I told you, World Food Program had made pre-arranged lists of people of who they were going to, had classified as vulnerable for these kind of events across, I think it's 171 unions, so very widely spread. Um, th those who actually probably should be eligible to do it. Now, one of the things was, that because we had to work fast, in fact, we designed this project five weeks before it actually triggered, so we had very, very little time. I think, actually, I like this. You know, research that has really needs to go in the field very quickly and uh, all, all hands on deck and, and really focusing on it. But actually, the one thing we didn't succeed in doing, or they didn't succeed in doing, and actually helped us in the end, there are multiple digital wallet providers in the country. There's no difference in the cost. You have the black one, Bcash, but you have some other, the post office one, you have other ones as well. So multiple digital wallets. It's close to zero cost to starting it. Literally one little phone call that you don't have to pay for. So a little bit of time to actually set it up. Lots of people have multiple wallets because a lot of government support programs in the past were delivered through these digital wallets, but not always through the same one. So you've got lots of different ones. One thing that happens, if you haven't used it for six months, it goes, it goes stale. And you have to do a new phone call to unlock it. And if you don't wait too long, somehow it seems to be then getting harder. Basically, we seem to have that 96 of people that the WFP called had digital wallets. But only about half of them actually had the wallet with the company we managed to do a contract in time with to actually do it, Bcash, the black, the black company. And so basically we exploited the fact that you know, virtually everybody had digital wallets, but they may not have had a particular one activated. And so the counterfactual is those people with digital wallets 
but actually didn't, we couldn't really reach in time. That should have been eligible, but couldn't reach in time. And so subsequently, we, since we were all, because this contact with them was re-established through a phone call, we know that we could call them, so we could call virtually everybody from both of these lists, and they provide our account to factual. Some got uh, the money into their account in their, in their digital wallets, and others didn't do it. And so that's our counterfactual of our design. So, so those who didn't have the right or incorrect ones. And Bcash, again, so this is a digital wallet of, of, um, of, of BRAC. Okay? And now we could do, after three rounds, we checked with them, um, a phone survey, fairly simplified. Um, and then after five months, we could check one more time. And then we could use also the satellite actual data on the, on the flats to actually check later on you know, the severity of the flooding and the timing of the flooding, did it actually matter in the kind of the way it, it was responded? So I'll tell you a couple of these responses. So it's relative to that counterfactual. Some of you may have spotted that. I do not have a counterfactual for a classic aid program that comes 50, years later, 50 days later. Okay? So the counterfactual is those who didn't get the support to those who got the support. So there's another piece of research we do where we will have that counterfactual, where more the classic approach is actually used. Okay? So this is relative to those people who were in vulnerable that should have received the transfers, but they couldn't because mechanically it wasn't possible. So we basically say, well, um, you've got, uh, we, we know what people did with it. They, they stocked up on food and water. They, did, uh, they spent it on health and, and, and services and so on. And then we know that the simplest indicator and the clearest Days going without food during the crisis, in the treatment ones, uh, there was about 15% uh, uh, that, that, uh, didn't, that, that couldn't uh, get it, but actually the counterfactual was 30%. So we managed by half the probability that they would go uh, without food uh, at all during the crisis. We have done a whole series of other indicators. So three months later, we find that child consumption is still better. Uh, three months later, $50, and then three months later, relative to those who didn't get that, they're better. They're still definitely a higher score on life satisfaction. Anyone who ever uses this, this is on a 10-point scale, the ladder of, uh, ladder of life. Where do you put yourself on that ladder from, from 0 to 10 uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, what, what the overall how you value your life? I just want to show you the control mean, too you will virtually never in the world see that as low as that, okay? These are desperately poor people. We managed to push it up. It's still tough life, okay? The drought does cause still troubles. We can do much better. Here, we would score on average about seven, okay? Most developing countries would be about five or five and a half. This is where we are in a crisis situation. The way they don't judge their, their life on, on, on the best life possible, 10, the worst life, zero, they're actually pretty low. But we can at least improve it. Now, what we find really striking is that, and I should actually, if you worry about reading it, I should have said that. So this is a picture here. This is all measured relative in standard deviations improvement. Control would be at a zero. This tells us how much better they are. And then it gives us the standard error, uh, the, the confidence interval there. And so we find they do more, they're more likely, almost uh, half a standard deviation, more likely to do uh, preemptive actions. You know, they act. I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment. They're less likely to lose assets, less likely to livestock, other assets, crop losses. They manage to do all kinds of preemptive stuff. They seem to be less uh, likely to borrow. It's a little bit more ambiguous. It's not significant either, and I could talk more about it. They later on declare themselves they have a better earning potential, an index about the, the opportunities they see there for themselves. They're basically able to replant, more likely to replant, thanks to this earlier, the, thanks to the particular intervention we did. Um, and then, give an idea of these, the agency that they have, they can, uh, they're more likely to evacuate their households, they manage to evacuate, more likely to evacuate their, their livestock, more likely to have purchased food in advance, uh, less likely to have lost small livestock, less likely to have lost poultry, uh, less likely to have to borrow money uh, to do it, and they're more likely to be able to work for wages uh, to actually compensate for their earning losses. 
So it's actually pretty kind of a kind of a strong set of, of, of impacts that we can see. What is also interesting, and it would take us a bit too long and I won't take the time for that, is that actually the speed of delivering the cash, we can do it because you could see there was a histogram in it was a few days difference in terms of how quickly the money came. Moreover, as you can imagine with the hydrological map, not everywhere is the flat, flat peak at the same moment. So we can actually calculate how much before the flat peak, on average is five days, but how much, how much in advance did we manage to get there? And does it matter whether it was four days or seven days in advance? We can actually find that actually by being in advance, every day improves three and five months later their consumption outcomes. Every day you were earlier near the peak. We can't simply say should it be 20 days or 30 days, of course the range is limited. You can't say should it be five months before, whatever. But we can actually show that the timing actually mattered. Right? You can see here actually the, this line is the flat peak, the most likely when the when the, 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 the flux peak is at its highest, and you see that the mass of the cash transfers happened before that, uh, before that peak. Okay, let me come to conclude and actually compare it back to where I had started. So we have an example here of actually where we combine new things, you know, knowledge and evidence around that cash actually is a sensible thing to do, knowledge about that digital payments, you know, really should try to get into that world and getting the systems going because you can go faster. Also about the science and the predictive power of it, that actually we can use that to actually improve welfare uh, during the flood and flood three months later. Okay? Basically, failing to act quickly has a real cost. We seem to have evidence on that. Also that it offers agency. You do actually a bit better that you actually allow them to be a bit more in control of the decisions they take, you know. Of course, they're not totally in control, there's no illusion there, but they can do some of these things. And we also find evidence that the speed of delivery speed matters, okay. And all this kind of political bickering typically exposed, and when should we do it, how should we do it, it really has a cost. And we should just be very careful about it. And so this is what we managed to do in, 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 in Bangladesh then, you know, an impact basically combination of an early warning but early action system. I don't like early warning systems, I like early action systems. And, uh, and this is a form of an early action system. Something where the cash is in beforehand offered thanks to the early warning system, it's data driven that we can do it. So we're trying some of these things out, we're doing a big evaluation in Niger in a very different setting. This is for seasonal hunger which is a slow onset disaster. Again, a bit like the Ethiopia case, we know roughly in September what the crisis will be. Most of the time, the cash transfers or any support or food aid tends to be given by about August the next year, during the deep of depth of the crisis. And the whole thing is set up like that. And so, well, why don't we do something slightly differently? We know that actually this is when we know where the rains have failed, because it's in June to September. They harvest then, and we have lots of great data, why don't we actually try to think, should it be not be better and give people more choices to use it actually the forecast of how severe the crisis will be on the ground to actually start doing early transfers. So we're doing this now with a system where, and it's ever in the Sahel, it's that latter thing. They only do it during the rainy season in the end. Yes, then it's, the situation is most desperate. What would happen if we spread out a transfer, we start actually in January, and continuously do a small transfer, or alternatively, what is it if we give the same transfer that we would give through the rainy season, but we do it in March or April, so that they have time to prepare their response. So in the midst of it, it looks very interesting what's coming out, but I've been told by my colleagues who can't tell them. But anyway, it looks interesting. It, the, the end line is still going on, so we're not complete in, in everything. But basically, it gives us a sense where you can go away from, from this kind of crisis and then we'll get into action, to actually something say, well, get a system going beforehand with a clear action plan, how you're going to deal with it and have the finance in place. And that's then the example uh, we, we've given here. And, you know, and I want to just end with a brief comment on, you know, one of the great attractions for this is that we know from a lot of the evidence that politicians don't like this. I've worked with them, they don't like these things. 
our politicians in the UK or a local politician in, a gov in, in, in India or whatever, they love a drought. In fact, there's a famous book written in India, um, uh, Everyone Loves a Good Drought, you know, and it's basically about the system loves a drought. I worry at times even the humanitarian system loves a crisis because that's the adrenaline going, the adrenaline junkies can go. But definitely politicians like it because that's the moment to show leadership, plant their flag, and so on. Crisis is when they can make their name. We know from a lot of evidence that actually it's really hard to convince politicians to spend before a crisis. In fact, we know a lot of evidence that from the US, from Mexico, from India, that actually voters don't support, don't uh, reward you for, for preparedness. If you do preparedness planning, they don't reward you because, of course, they don't see anything has happened. They don't see a crisis. The crisis is, as I call it in my book, dull, because no, there's no journalist that will talk about it because it's handled well. There's no journalist or politician that can make their name on it. So you get really this problem of how do we get them to do it? Now, because they get an electoral advantage of responding well to a crisis, they get zero electoral advantage from, not re from responding beforehand. Very big problem with climate, by the way, in general, and adaptation investments. So this is, an, uh, this is a suggestion here, is that say, look, we still make it visible that you're doing things. Can we actually get them to agree to have systems here in place that, you know, for extreme events, that they still can act and that we can seem to be acting? And I think these are examples I think we can actually convince politicians to do because they can still do their flat planting, but actually we do it properly evidence-based, science-based, forecast-based, uh, with proper uh, financing. I thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan. That is absolutely amazing. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Any questions? Yes? So we do have a lot of questions, but I have the advantage of being the chair <laughs> in sort of asking Stefan the, the sort of burning question that I had when I was listening to that totally, totally amazing, inspiring presentation. Um, you, you, you said that the main impact um, seems to, it, it's driven by the cash transfer. But I was wondering whether you could actually unpick to what extent that effect was due to a credible early warning versus the money itself. Because could it be that it was actually that when people actually knew that something was coming, and I was serious, so serious that someone's giving you money, someone's calling you beforehand to make sure your wallet's set up and all that. Is that what drove the agency? So the credibility, it's not just the early warning as well. We always have early warnings. I mean, Sri Lanka had early warnings. Everything placed for a, a drought that was impending and, and nothing happened. Nobody moved. It, it, it was just, it failed miserably. So can you unpack that early warning effect? So how much of the agency was due to early warning? How much was it actually due to the cash? And, and how much actually the credibility? Sorry. Very good. No, I'm smiling because Stefan is sitting there. And, um, and, and we, um, you know, if, if, um, if some particular funding, funders had given us the money, we would know in about a year in Mozambique whether this actually would have happened working with Stefan Liffers and uh, we would have uh, been able to do this. So it's still any funders in the room. Uh, it's all ready to go. So, so yes, you want to impact that. And, and, and we've had lots of arguments around it. But you made actually the right point. It's not that the early warning wasn't given. And, and again, we, we, we don't have the clear evidence or that, uh, you know, what is the information content and people had in this particular case. But just like in Sri Lanka, the flood warnings were being given, you know, and, you know, you have all the agencies getting ready, everybody is there, so the flood warnings is there. So we, we, we given the nature of the effects that we then see, 
um, and the fact that it uh, there is um, you know, the, it, it, the, we, we think that in that sense, the liquidity constraints, the idea of having actually the cash and the resources at that moment, the extra cash available, is kind of, kind of doing it. But I will not try to claim that we have the, because that's not how the, the evaluation was set up uh, in, in, in doing it. So we will, um, the, we will be able to get better information like that also from our Sahel work. Where we made a point is that saying that, that people were told early on, and we found it actually fair that everybody was being told that uh, that there, but we have a proper control group there as well that actually doesn't get that information. So, so basically, what I said, everybody who got a different modality of cash is being told also there's something happening. Uh, so it means also the people who get the late money they're already told in advance, and so we should be able to disentangle the credit constraint from uh, from the. From, from the information constraint. Thank you. And it's a little bit as well as that, you know, I am generally very concerned that uh, we overinvested in early warning relative to early action systems. And that's, uh, that's the kind of choice. There's so much more money has flown into all the data. And often you have the sense that in London we know that a crisis is happening, but it's actually not quite clear that there is a system in place to actually mobilize people and help them to, to start coping with it. And it's, it's also about the credibility. So maybe the cash actually gave credibility as well to the fact that the warning was serious. Because I, I do know in, in other country contexts, I mean, I can talk of Sri Lanka, that sometimes the fire alarm goes off. And yeah. no, no. That again. And so there's an interesting thing, because this is the cry wolf problem, you know, the kind of, uh, if, you, if you remember the, the, the um, Aesop uh, fable, um, it's, it's actually a real issue, I think, in generally in the humanitarian system. Sitting in London, the cry wolf problem was there all the time, because almost every day the UN does an appeal. Uh, that is the worst crisis that ever has happened. How many times the Ethiopia the country I know well, Ethiopian uh, risk of famine has been declared the worst ever in history? And then say, well, you know, that's, and, and I remember sometimes even sitting with, with, with government officials meaning well in the country and saying, why did they call it like that? You know, this is extremely localized. This is a very different. So the cry wolf problem is there as well. Wouldn't be surprised that citizens start responding in the same way to it. Okay, so I do have some other burning questions, but I'll... I'll hold my questions back and let me uh, maybe take about three questions the first time and then Stefan can answer. Um, Estella, you had a question? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Can you please introduce yourself, just your name and where you're from? Before you ask yeah. So I'm Stella Carpi, a lecturer in humanitarian studies here uh, at IRDR. I mostly worked on displacement from Syria, and I really wish we had had anticipatory cash at the beginning of the crisis, honestly, uh, because there I can say that um, cash as a synonym with dignity came quite late for very particular reasons. Uh, most Western and secular humanitarian actors actually believe that cash uh, negatively affects um, uh, political neutrality. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was just wondering uh, what's your take on this, because of course it's an animated debate in, uh, in humanitarian studies. Okay, maybe I'll take another two questions. Yes. Uh, No, I think, I think it won't be recorded if you um, don't use the mic. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Rasha. I'm a master's student at uh, Disaster Resilience at the Institute. And my question basically comes, like, how can you implement anticipatory action in a dysfunctional state? Okay, and we have... Um, Lisa as well. My name is Lisa. I'm also from the IRDR. I, I guess the obvious question is, I really appreciate the talk and I thought it was great, uh, but we're mostly talking about pilots and the obvious question of scale-up. So my understanding from talking to the IFRC that each of the one hazard anticipatory action agreements has taken about two years to get to, to agree. And so if we're talking about one hazard and one agency, the obvious um, 
ambition, I assume, is to scale up to multi-agency, multi-hazard anticipatory action agreements. Uh, also given that this impacts coordination, because we know from you know, very long running programs like Cash for Work, if different agencies give different amounts of money at different time, it leads to a lot of problems. So just the simple question of uh, scaling up. Thank you. Um, Stefan, I think you should. Yes, no, that's, that, that, that's great questions. And in some sense, they're, they're, they're a bit linked. So look, the, um, I, was, um, I was just in, I can't remember when it was, was it last week? This week, I can't remember. In Berlin, in the Social Protection Conference, must have been last week. Um, the, and, and there I was actually talking about the system part of it, you know, and it comes about how do we, how do we get these kind of systems set up so that we don't do pilots, that we are ready to do it. And I think, you know, even the way you asked the question shows how wrong the system is. And it's not about criticism of you, but just the way it seems to be operated. Let me, let me be clear is that um, one thing that by, by keeping it simple, and by consciously keeping it simple, we create a, the opportunity to actually possibly building up a system. Okay? Uh, digital cash transfers, you know, it's a, it's a technology that even in Syria was available in the crisis. Even at the beginning it was actually available, in principle it's there. Um, I work a lot on digital sites as well as a development person. There's nothing that you can get more easily, even the most crooked government excited about than is digital stuff. They like shiny stuff. Even our ministers in London, they always like the shiny stuff. So this is actually a real important part of it, to actually saying, look, this is our entry point to actually begin to build up systems. Okay, we can argue about how it is and what the models would be, and maybe afterwards I'm happy to talk to a few of them, but I really don't like the proprietary systems, including the M-Pesa system, because actually, in the end, it's one company. You want to actually get the interoperable systems going. But anyway, there's a lot of thinking going on. India has been fascinating in that respect in rolling out interoperable systems that other countries want to do it. Now, if you start with a system, you actually have plumbing, so to speak, in place. So in, a, in, in any country where there's a window of opportunity, whether it's Somalia today or, or, or in Ethiopia in general, this is what we should try to build, is the plumbing. And so we should stop be doing, except for as we've done for the last 70 years of the kind of humanitarian, the outside cavalry that comes in and then every, every cavalry has different color horses and then they all make an absolute mess of it, which is what basically happens and we should get everybody there in New York to calm down and stop doing their stuff and actually think carefully, can we start building up the systems? Because if we were very close in Syria that we could do it. We were very close and there were lots of people looking at it, can we actually set it up? And then you get well-meaning principled people making it too complicated, saying, ooh, this is really tricky politically and so on. It's easier than a lot of the other stuff we do, okay? It's so much easier politically than the other stuff we can do. And basically, I remember telling to Mark Locke, one day, when he was a humanitarian coordinator and thing, one day you should be in a situation when a country like Syria go pear-shaped, that you literally, with the pressing of a button, actually the cash will just go. And no more white trucks driving around the country, and no more UN stuff uh, doing things they shouldn't be doing, no more semi old, old military people doing logistics. You know, just do that because you know that you can reach it, but you need to get the plumbing in place before. And we were very close there to actually being able to do it, and too late we actually took the opportunities to actually do it. You know, because it's so simple with, with, with the system. So if you start there, I think it's you, it's easier to get a political commitment there and doing. Why do I emphasize this relative to my things? Because if you have the plumbing, I don't end up having to do all the negotiations that you do it. I actually have an interoperable system that, you know, WFP doesn't have to keep on fighting with UNICEF and all the others in the UN system. Actually, you all use the plumbing. And if you find doing it, let's try to coordinate, but at least we don't have to coordinate all the time about the whole system and who's on the ground or whatever because we have the plumbing set up. So, so that's what we need to do. The finance is a big part of it because something needs to go through the plumbing. Yeah? So what you do in a dysfunctional state, 
how we don't know what we do in a dysfunctional state. But most dysfunctional states have l moments of less dysfunctionality. <laughs> you grab the windows of opportunity and again you try to build the systems. You know, there are far fewer countries dysfunctional now than there used to be. There's many countries that are today dysfunctional that weren't. You know, if if Ethiopia stabilizes, we need to build up that system in Ethiopia because we know that fundamentally civil war happens in countries where civil wars happens before, and so you basically need to get a functioning state there. And and you know you use Windows opportunity to do it. So there's a lot of that stuff that you need to do it. So how do you deal in dysfunctional state? Yeah, I don't know. You hope for the best during the dysfunctionality, but you every time there's a window of opportunity, you think about the plumbing. Okay, I could talk at length like South Sudan. We totally missed the opportunity since the, since, the, since the original peace deal during the periods that we could to build up the system. Nobody's building up the system today. Everybody's behaving as, oh, it's fine today. And we do all as if business as usual. No, no. We need to build up today the systems for the next day that Salva Kiir and Rik Mashar uh, fall out over and sharing of oil profits. And uh, we need to be ready for it because it's going to happen. And so, so that's what you do. So, so you don't, during the dysfunctionality you can't do it, but you can build up the system before. And so then, 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 then finish on that, is that this is actually, it comes back to the, the pilot versus scale thing. You know, the pilot shows this proof of concept. At the moment, we need to now get the systems going because all the stuff we described, we can only do if we have the system going. If we do it from the spreadsheet of WFP, we can't put 3 million people on the spreadsheets. We could do that with, with 12,000 or 25,000 people. And at the moment, all the social registries are some, some spreadsheets, and then you have some other stuff there and so on. This is not digital system. So you need to get it integrated and doing it. And that's what you need to do, because that's the, that's, I think that's the only way forward. Otherwise, we'll, we'll sit here and talk about exactly the same problems in 20 years. Brilliant. Um, any further questions? Uh, more hands. Okay. The <laughs> question. Shall we start with? Okay. Yeah. Yes. There we go. <laughs> um, thank you so much for a, a great talk, and it was also really exciting to see the data, the impact evaluation, those effect sizes. Um, my name is Sarah Dryhurst. I'm a soon um, here at the, at the IRDR. Um, so one question that I had was, it was before, for, your, for your pilot where you were showing the data, that, that forecast that you had from the flood, as, as we saw, was, you know, the, the uncertainty around it was very, very effective. It was almost a prediction. But what happens in situations where you have much more uncertainty around the forecast that you're using, using to trigger the financial investment? perhaps when, because of the probabilistic nature, that event actually doesn't happen, yet the money has been transferred and released. Because um, at that stage, arguably, that's not then the best way to spend that money, but equally, you can't go to people and try and, I mean, can you go and take the money back? Um, that's the difficulty. So, yeah, that was... That was Excellent. Philip Kenliffe, Associate Professor in International Relations here at the IRDR. And it was a wonderful talk and it's heartening to hear, in this field, it's heartening to hear about um, programs that can be rolled out that look so tremendously successful. But one thing where I was less convinced, and in fact I would almost say, you know, I think it would be guaranteed to fail, um, and something I would like to hear you talk more about, is when you talked about the assumption of tying politicians' hands. And that seems to me that it simply wouldn't work. Um, that's been the model, I think, for the last 30 years in the international system more broadly has been efforts to tie politicians' hands in various ways through all sorts of institutions and agreements. And that model is breaking down now. Um, you know, we're in an era of greater geopolitical competition and rivalry, electoral volatility, populist insurgencies, not just in the West, but around the world at large. And in that context, um, it seems to me it would be very unwise to try and uh, build on the idea of tying politicians' hands. Um, the assumption being that politicians are, have no le real legitimacy or function or representative function at all. And at times in your talk, it seemed like you would have 
you know, the idea would be just to kind of subtract the politicians and the politics, and you would have this perfectly kind of spon spontaneous system that would function smoothly and would be perfectly calibrated without any kind of uh, interference. And so, I suppose what I'd like the challenge I'd like to put to you is how would you um, how would you scale this model? How would you um, work further with the kinds of assumptions and ideas that you've put there, but without trying to tie politicians' hands, but rather trying to build build their incentives into it more. And then there's one more question from... Uh... Hi, I'm Dan Haynes, uh, also soon to be starting here as a lecturer. Um, is there still a place for public giving in a model that relies on anticipatory transfers? Would there be any DEC appeals to the public in this case? Um, okay, that's, uh, these three. Great, great. Okay, so the, the, they're quite different here, the, the questions. So let me first briefly on the, the uncertainty that, 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 uh, that's in the, by, by its nature. And um, so, so in, in a sense, you know, coming, you know, when we, when we talk about, you know, the, anything that's parametric, uh, as a, that's, that's predictive, that's based on algorithm prediction, you know, we will we'll get some people that should have gotten the transfer that didn't get it, and people that got the transfer that shouldn't have got it. And, uh, and so, so you, you make errors, you know, like in, a, in an insurance setting or in risk, we talk about basis risk is there, fundamentally there. Now, I mean, it's, it's, I should first of all say is that, um, you know, we, we'll have that with any system, also with the exposed system, you know, they, they, they make errors and then everybody, you know, and so as, as a critique of trying to do this anticipatory, it's not the, the strongest one because, you know, the, the basis of which, you know, humanitarian uh, response plans are done is, is still, you know, with very little data and, 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 and all kinds of, of issues there. But, but the point is a bit it's like by, by doing this algorithm is that, you know, you can do some updating, you know, Bayesian updating you can do. And in a way, it's also something we did. Our initial trigger had a particular list, we started calling them, but we updated it five days later before the thing. So you, you, and, and so this is actually typically how I like to think about it, is that you try to think about, and surely, you know, for each intervention, and we may never be able to establish it, but it's probably an optimal moment of release the money before the crisis. You know, you may well be able to calculate or structurally model it one day, but may well be different, different crises. But what you would typically set up is, is I, I always thought a bit, a bit like a rocket launcher, you know, and uh, where, you know, the countdown, you know, at 100, so think of a rocket uh, going into space, you know, you start with 100 and then you got to go to zero. Um, so you can abort mission. And so you, uh, but, but the important thing that I definitely experienced inside the UK system, and in fact, I was there with the Ebola crisis stuff, if we had, had these triggers for early action, even if it's not about the cash going or the, or the support going to people or the other support going to people, but if we had started counting at 100 or basically six months when we knew already there was Ebola there and then slowly do it, you know, you do certain actions, okay? And then there's a moment, of course, you release the cash. And you will know then, maybe so soon afterwards, you make errors. Not going to take anything away. There's no, no, there's no need to it. But you can, people that should have got it, you can still add something. You know? And the way you would think about this is not to fully replace everything you do, but actually you just keep on updating. Uh, an example could be is that you could do an early release of, of half the money or something, and then you do it. So you, you can play around with it. And I think doing this as a data-driven thing, you have the information to try to update it. Something we didn't mention, there's a lot of research going on uh, to do another part of it, it's on the targeting. So you have the one side, we relied on the WFP giving us the targeting list and then just assuming they're without errors. Of course, people's circumstances change and even if you have a registry of people that to do it. So similarly, people are doing this with kind of um, big data algorithms trying to actually update this and actually saying and so on. So in all these things, that's the approach you can be using. You have a decency principle that you never go and take money away. You know, you're not going to do like uh, you should have known that you shouldn't receive the cash and so on, as typically in our social benefit systems work. Uh, that actually, you know, if errors are made, you you bank them. 
still going to be so much more efficient than, than doing it ever, ever uh, exposed. So I think we can handle that. I love the question on, on political commitment. It's quite useful that this slide is there, you know. Uh, there's a book there that you may want to read. It came out last year in paperback only a, a few weeks ago. Um, and it's basically about fundamentally political commitment is all. And it's actually if we don't think carefully about the nature of the politics. And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I will actually say, and I may have misspoken a bit, because, you know, the system to some extent, ties people to politicians' hands, but it has to be their choice. So it's not about a kind of a technocratic outsiders decide this is going to work. It has to be a political choice. So if you want to have a system that works a bit better, there has to be something in it for them as well. So that's the first thing on local politics. You know, come on the geopolitics there as well. Actually, we have evidence that that's possible. You know, we can go to Mexico, where in 1987 earthquake, uh, Mexico City was, uh, I think it was 30,000 people got killed, massive damage and so on and on. It brought in the politics of Mexico, it brought disasters there. There's always disasters, but it brought it home to the capital, to the, to the elite. And actually, interestingly, it became the theme to run the elections on. And in fact, the leading party was kicked out. And the platform of the position was we're going to have a much better system of actually pre-arranged stuff that actually this doesn't happen. From risk reduction, from better enforced building codes, to exposed responses that could, could do it. Okay? And so it became a politically salient thing. The system is called Funden, is uh, actually the funds that actually the pre-arranged finance for rebuilding. They work with a pre-agreed, politically pre-agreed, a uh, plan of which infrastructure is the most important, which is not. So basically, when the money comes, you avoid the Nepal problem that you have to argue forever about which bridge I'm going to build first, and so on. But it's politically agreed that, what the plan we're making. So it's not as if there's some bunch of technocrats going to sit in some, some kind of modeling office and then tie these people's hands. It's still the politicians that need to decide. It worked very well in, 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 in Mexico because the latest, I think, I can't remember when it was. When was the last, the big earthquake? Was it 19 or 20 or so, the big Mexico one? And I remember there was a wonderful interview on Radio 4 uh, on, on, with, with an opposition politician who was asking the usual questions. And who do you blame that there are 300 people killed? Who do you blame? The build people say the building costs are not being enforced and the whole kind of thing. And the guy said, no, no, wait, wait a minute. Actually, I don't blame the government. You remember, 87, similar, uh, similar scale of earthquake, 30,000 people died, now 300 people died. We're actually making massive progress, and the building standards have improved dramatically. And you got a, even a journalist trying to get a politician saying what they like to say, blame the other politician. And they actually, there was a consensus about it. We did actually pretty well. It was actually a much better handled earthquake, including with pre-arranged finance, where they had basically bought cat bonds on the market to get, within days, money to do the reconstruction. It was actually kind of remarkable, but it needs the political thing. So I'm the first one to say, politics matters crucially for this. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You can't do it technocratically. And by the way, that's probably one of the problems in, in New York all the time, that they behave as if there is no politics while they're playing it all the time. So it's actually really centrally, and in this environment it is. Okay, quickly on, is there space for public giving? Well, actually, look, give, them, give them credit due where it is, you know, give directly, totally reliant on cash transfers, you know, Rory Stewart's outfit, in case you forgot the link with it, and so they're basically working with us on these things. They find it really attractive to actually make that case. And, you know, yes, it needs to have a particular thing in the, in the, in the public, public horizon. You know, DEC can still do what they usually do and whenever there's a crisis go on TV because we know full well that only a tiny fraction of the money that creates reached by a particular appeal from the Disaster Merchant Committee will ever go to that particular crisis and the fine print is we will use it for lots of good other reasons and it's something like 10% or something only uh, seems to be going to the particular crisis because of course by the time you give the money it's far too late to mobilize the money and so on and so on. So we can still play the game if we want to. But I think rational and reasonable NGOs can also use this and say, look, this is an alternative model of doing it. And we can actually, wouldn't you rather invest in resilient systems than, than actually having to every year saying this is the worst ever crisis and whatever. So I think I'm, I'm pretty hopeful on that. Um, so we are nearly running out of time. But then I'll, I'll ask Stefan just two, uh, I think are just quite important. 
questions. And there were two more hands that you didn't Two more hands. Uh, me first. Um, <laughs> very, very quick one. Very quick. Um, we've got a lot of... Um, we do a lot of work in terms of um, physical science modeling, yeah, yeah. Um, tsunamis and probabilistic modeling, engineers. We've got a lot of research happening there. From a social scientist's point of view, what more do you want? Uh, how do you want us to sort of collaborate? How do you see more fruitful collaborations happening? And, and then we'll take the other two questions. I, I just oh, saw maybe, maybe earlier five hands, so that's why I... Okay, uh, five asked. hands? No, there, were, there was a hand here and there, maybe... Yes, yeah, Sangeeta, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, Stefan, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sangeeta Thiwalimbo. Uh, I'm one of the PhD students here at IRDR. Uh, my question is more along the model where is it, you know, is there a possibility to imagine that the model can be flipped whereby the beneficiaries are not just at the end, you know, it's almost, it can be, you know, it's almost like an oxymoron to say passive agency. They do have agency, but somehow in this particular model, they somehow feature at the end. But is there a way to think about a model where we do put people, uh, you know, at the heart, uh, you know, as we think about like designing and planning? Um, and also, I guess, yesterday in the humanitarian summit, um, what struck to me was how much of these interventions um, are sort of assuming this nation state model, or you know, much of the humanitarian funding also goes to national governments, uh, which also means that you, know, you have to be recognized by the state, and especially for those affected who are not recognized as the legitimate you know, actors, and you know, that really constrains whether they will benefit from these projects or not. So I guess, in short, I just want to say, is there a way to think about a model where it begins with people, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, different actors, particularly politicians and others doing the planning? Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes, just... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, more hands coming, but I'll do it quick. Hi, um, I'm Mary Gordon, PhD student at IRDR. And these are, apologies, it's quite a big um, question about concepts that you're using. So two that I noticed were kind of in the background being agency and dignity. Um, and if I heard correctly, you mentioned that there is no agency of the people affected when the flood occurs. So you're, and then later on in your presentation, you were talking about metric of measuring versus those who did receive finance and those who didn't. So I was sort of wondering if you could expand a bit on what you mean by agency in this sense and why people do or don't have it, how you've been measuring it, um, also from like a conceptual to a practical measuring side. And then the same with dignity, there is actually um, a paper that's really good by Jennifer Ward, I don't know if you know her, but about how you cannot give or take dignity from people, so how are you working with that? So. In some, how are you framing these two big concepts of dignity and agency within humanitarian and disaster research? And there's this lady, quickly. Maybe just one quickly. more question. Yeah. Well, very quick. You can make it very quick. Hi, uh, thanks. I'm Susanna Fisher. I'm a principal research fellow in the department. So my question is again about the kind of politics and thinking about this parallel systems idea. We, of course, also have now parallel systems coming down for uh, funds for climate change. Uh, and there's discussions now around addressing losses and damages and how we get funds down that way. So even you know, beyond the humanitarian system, I wondered if you could reflect a little bit. And if we've got these really great plumbing systems in place, like how could we build on these politics to kind of bring some of those other areas together? Right. Um, big questions and has to be short, short answers. Your question on the science models, okay? So where, where the where the science models are typically least useful in practice is that the final link between the physical damage and the hydrological damage or whatever it is, all the models, linking it to what actually impacts on people's living standards and ability to act. There's so much weakness there that we can model whether the building will collapse but you don't really have any sense of who is actually the, the people that are vulnerable in there. And there is a relatively speaking so much attention on the one and very little on the other one. And I think it's a big problem in this whole in the whole space. Because in the end, you know, whether we want to do it via, you know, systems that I describe or even just basic social protection or targeting systems, 
You know, we need to have a sense of, you know, uh, come back to this problem, who are quote unquote and big questions there, but who should we who should we give support to because we can't give it to everybody, and how much should we do it? And middle modeling, bringing that into the human dimension is actually a real limitation of a big a lot of these big big models. Um, and, and in practice, it limits, for example, um, you know, it just creates a lot of opportunities for, say, insurance products that insure buildings or units, but actually very little that they can actually get, for example, that thinking underlying, say, social protection systems and so on, because we miss that thing. So I think that's where the biggest, biggest gap lies, and it's a hard one. The second one is there on the... You know, putting 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 people first. Um, I have to be very careful here. Um, there's a lot of language always in this space, and I've been long enough in the kind of more practical world of having to do it. Is that you know, whenever people say, "Oh, it needs to be a, a human-centered model," I will want to ask, you know, can you give me? a sense of what I can do at scale carefully in doing this, okay? And so there is this, um, you know, yes, there is this sense of, of the nation state uh, largely there and, and, and an attempt to, at the same time, attempt to build up more of this plumbing that is, you know, the word interoperable is an important one here because it means different groups can actually operate within it. Uh, and. Um, could talk in detail about the difference about, you know, um, giving people a place in that system and actually then what the nation state may decide who should be included or not. But if you have plumbing that is in principle interoperable, you can't, if you can't, if you can't stop people from being excluded from simply having a mobile phone, you could actually already get quite a lot of things, for example, there. Um, and it's, I, I will be the first to say is that you know there is a sense of passive inclusion, but in some sense that's what we're talking about. You know, you know all the other stuff that I would do in development is to actually say, well, I'll give people opportunities to build up their own lives. But we're talking about crisis systems that actually, when at some point outside support is needed, can we do it? On the other side, there's a whole series of things. How can we strengthen that they never need it and do the development work and, and so on? So. Yeah, so, the, so there is this thing, but, but then it's about people, uh, you know, and then we get to dysfunctional states, so will the state decide you shouldn't be getting it, you know, Bangladesh, Rohingya, or whatever, shouldn't you get it? I think that's where humanitarian system needs to be making its call. My problem with humanitarian system is it wants to do everything. It wants to do drought in Malawi. For God's sake, get out of Malawi. That's not your task. But do what you just say, people that are non-legitimate, be there ready to do Syria. Do there the crisis situations where actually there's a real humanitarian principle at stake. But where you have a nation state, the state that can potentially function okay, that's not where we should be building these systems from, from the international thing. And that's where you actually do it with, with government. And then, you know, you come back to this legitimacy issues and so on there. But, you know, this is in a way... The, the, the structures we have that we can work with. If people then are really systematically excluded, then it becomes the space for where humanitarian system needs to come in. I actually keep on thinking humanitarian system should go back to its core business and not trying to do everything. Okay? So, and that's actually one of the big problems because that's where the humanitarian principles in principle applied and not in sort of the basic things. I think climate and disaster things, it shouldn't be external agencies. It should be largely building up from countries and, and doing things. And then it comes to this question of the of the parallel systems. Yeah, scares the hell out of me. I mean, it's just you know we we you know we we basically a lot of that stuff is you know a whole legitimacy of the international system is gone gone away. And oh, well, let's now have another one because we can reinvent ourselves. We can reinvent the World Bank. We can reinvent the UN. Oh, we'll do we will we'll, we'll be doing that because it's all it's all global public good. No, no, this stuff is not global public good. It's actually. Basically, people, it's, it's, it's essentially private transfers to, to private individuals. This is not about the globe. This mitigation stuff, yeah, fine, but this is other stuff. 
And so again, it's this encroachment, this thinking we're reinventing agendas to redefine our own purpose again of these organizations that are outside. You know, and I'm just trying to build, and I'm very, actually quite positive, more and more countries show some commitment to have actually decent social protection systems. Let's build on top of that and help them to build this plumbing and avoid all that stuff. And then finally, the kind of conceptualization. Yes, I was very fast, and hopefully in the paper we talk a little bit more carefully. But I kind of want to be at this stage at least quite pragmatic. And, and, and the measurement is to do as much as you can work with when you have to call someone and, and, and deal with it. But the mapping is, there's at least a bit more agency. There's a little bit less passivity because you give people opportunity to act. And for me, the agency is basically giving us a space, an opportunity to take actions that are their, their decision and not someone else's decision. That's the minimal amount. Can we give agency? I don't know, but we can create systems that allow people to have more agencies. That's different from giving it or taking it away. Uh, the dignity part, I take your point as well. It's the thing. I, I took the language actually from some of these humanitarian evaluations that want to actually say the minimal amount it is that, but maybe I should have used the word agency as well. I want to give even people in refugee camps a bit of choice of how they actually build up their lives rather than telling you, this is the ration of food you get, and by the way, if I see you reselling it, you're really going to be excluded the next time. That's what I mean by what you want to go away from. Okay, I think that's it, no? Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Once again, Stefan, thank you very much on behalf of the IDR, on behalf of us all. Thank you very much for that um, very thoughtful, energetic, and enthusiastic presentation. There are a lot of students here online as well, and I'm sure that um, they can take away a lot from what you said. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being such an engaging audience. And now it's time for coffee. Yeah. Oh, yes, the time you have to come back is a quarter past, 11.15, when we meet um, another very interesting. And if anyone wants to write to me and ask more questions, also the people online, just do it. I tend to reply.
Okay, hello everyone and welcome to in conversation session within the IRDR 13th annual conference, Risk Without Border. Uh, thank you for attending today and we are honored to have a special guest with us, uh, Dr. Mikola Gnatowski, a judge uh, at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and with us in the audience are members from IRDR, wider UCL uh, community and beyond academia. Uh, in this session, we will uh, be talking about international law and how it addresses armed conflict and migration. Uh, this topic fits within the wider discussions of this annual conference on the definition of borders from multiple perspectives. And when we will be talking about borders in the context of this conversation, we'll be talking about borders uh, between the states. For a quick introduction, Dr. Mikola Gnatowski has uh, 25 years of experience as international law academic uh, practitioner, advisor to Ukrainian government. He served as a president, vice president, and a member of European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Inhumane or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, or CPT, for over 10 years. And uh, since 2022, uh, Dr. Gnatowski has been the judge at the European Court of Human Rights appointed by Ukraine. Um, just for non-lawyers out here, uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, is an international court of the Council of Europe, which interprets European Convention on Human Rights, which is a different court from the court, which is the, co the highest court of uh, European Union, uh, which sits in Luxembourg. Uh, judge Gnatowski holds a PhD in international law from Institute of International Relations of Taras Shevchenko National University. So uh, before taking a deep dive in our topic, uh, would you mind starting with sharing how you got into international law, a bit about your background, what drew you to international law, and what keeps you motivated to keep going? Well, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, many thanks to you, Yulia, for um, the idea and, 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 and for, for being here today. Um, uh, talking to me, um, and I'm very grateful also to, to UCL for this invitation. I'm really delighted to be uh, here amongst you, and it's it's a particular pleasure actually to be present at a, at an interdisciplinary conference, not not just uh, um, uh, you know another event uh, uh, among lawyers when we discuss the uh, um, sort of the intricacies of of, of, of the recent judgments and, and the case law, but uh, to be able to speak to people who are uh, uh, interested in who, who, who work very much in, 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 the, in, in the extremely important domains and, and the topic of your conference the, uh, um, is, 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 is certainly much more important, I would say, that uh, law is such. Law, law has a certain um, function there, but uh, um, issues you are discussing, they, they are far more, far more important. So I'm, I'm very, very, very glad to be, uh, to be here. Um, and turning to your question, well, I mean, international law is indeed my, my profession, and, and um, I uh, became very interested in international law uh, whilst already being a student of law. And uh, I thought that uh, this is uh, a, a, a fascinating uh, project of uh, making our world better, a better place to live, so to say. Because uh, ultimately, all these ideas that, that, that underlie international law, these are ideas how to achieve something for the humankind. Uh, starting from, the, from meeting the, the basic needs such as peace, uh, security. Now, uh, we, of course, nowadays uh, one would immediately uh, talk about environment because, well, it, it, it wasn't the case before. It were, was, you know, for, for, for centuries, people didn't even think it was a problem at all. They, they were taking everything for granted. But now certainly there's, um, uh, there is this consideration. Um, uh, there's the project of human rights, which is extremely familiar to me because this is how my professional life has um, uh, evolved and I, I'm basically uh, concentrating there. But also humanizing certain things, bringing human dimension to uh, things that are not not so humane themselves, such as war, for example, and he, hence the whole project of the so-called international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict. So, so, so these, these, are, these are matters which have always interested me, and I must say I have never been uh, particularly excited about the perspective of becoming a, 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 a prosperous lawyer who has plenty of money, who 
deals with, uh, you know, with, with, with corporations, with, with some, you know, purely business interests. Um, because I, I, I think that's, that's not the most direct way of uh, actually earning money. You can earn money by actually producing something or directly trading. This is sort of a service function. You, 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 you are, you are, you are a servant of the, of the money, you're a servant of business, which is, I mean, totally legitimate and important and it's necessary, but not, not, not what interested me so much. So that, uh, that's why I've always, uh, you know, life is, life is about choices. So every time I was making a choice in favor of uh, uh, something that was just interesting, but perhaps less uh, obvious in terms of uh, having some direct uh, result in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, money. And, and this is how I first chose international law, preferred international law over, let's say, civil law, private law, um, commercial law. Then within international law, there's, there's plenty of things you can do because international law is vast. It's, 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 it's enormous. It's, it's really, it's like an ocean. You know, you, you find anything there. Um, and again, you find things which are very practical, which also, which are also related to, 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 to money and, you know, to, um, uh, to, 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 to industry. And they are super important to trade again. Like uh, the entire law, of the, the what is now known as as the international trade law, the law of uh, the World Trade Organization. The, the, these are fascinating things, but I was never interested in them. That's the, that, that, that's the thing. Uh, so I will, I I I, I, cho I chose the, the topic of uh, um, looking into uh, European human rights law, how European law was was evolving, also how European European law, not in the sense of the European Union law. That's important, but rather the the, 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 the more global European project, the, the project of the Council of Europe, um, which emerged immedi immediately after the Second World War, uh, with I mean, predominantly on human rights, but also on, on things like rule of law or, or democracy and things like this. Um, and o European Union, among others, but also let, let's say the Organization for for Security and Cooperation in Europe, how how those were influencing domestic legal systems, how. We were all becoming sort of uh, uh, parts of the, of the single sort of legal space in Europe. Uh, so that, that was my initial academic interest. I got then um, very interested in, in international humanitarian law, in the law of armed conflict, at, at the time when uh, this appeared to be of no relevance to Ukraine whatsoever. And I'm very unhappy that it is so, so relevant now. I would have loved uh, to keep it as far possible away from home, as, you know, as far away from home as possible, but this is how it uh, uh, worked. Um, uh, so, so then then um, uh, th 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 there was um, uh, more sort of uh, emphasis on uh, uh, human rights, and I was very lucky to, uh, as you mentioned, uh, to join the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture. I, I, well, I... I simply submitted an application when there was a when, when, when there was a call for a call for applications because there's there's members elected in respect of various European countries and and there was this this, this competition uh, for for uh, basically the, the, the Ukraine needed to nominate three persons and then it was for the Council of Europe to elect um, and I did it once because I was interested in the topic academically academically um, uh, I never set foot in, in a prison let's say or a police station. Uh, but, or, say, or psychiatric hospital, but, but uh, I, I was academically interested, I published something about that. Uh, and I was unsuccessful the first time, and I was successful the second time, to my huge surprise. Um, and, and that gave me very practical, um, very practical experience of actually, uh, I mean, practicing human rights, doing, I mean, working with people who are the, the, the bearers of those rights, and those people who have to put up with a lot of uh, suffering for the reasons that could be sort of due to their own fault, or which could be purely, you know, a, uh, a whim of, of, of nature. If, they, if somebody has a, a mental disease, that's, that's not the fault of this person at all, and, 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 and this person suffers and, and, and of, is often treated in a way which further increases the suffering, or the migrants, that's another huge category, and I, I, I think that many of you would, would be interested in that, and, and that's, that's, that might be one of our, our main topics today, the situation of foreigners who come to another country to looking for a better life, but then they end up in detention. 
and, and, and their situation is, is one of the most desperate ones, you know, among any category of, 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 of detained persons. So th that kind of thing, and being directly there, talk, coming to, the, to, the, to their quarters, to, to, to prison cells, to these detention centers, to police cells, to, 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 to psychiatric hospitals, you know, working directly with them, talking confidentially to those people, and these are the powers that the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture has all over Europe, 40, at that time 47 countries in Europe. Uh, far beyond the European Union, again. Uh, so that, that, that was, uh, well, that completely transformed me, I think, I think, professionally. I became much less of an academic and much more of a practitioner. Um, and then, uh, yes, there was, there was another vacancy coming up. There was a vacancy of a, of a judge elected in respect of Ukraine for the European Court of Human Rights, and I, um, again, applied. Uh, well, um, uh, and the, the procedure was tedious. There were three, three uh, uh, complete repetitions. It was, was like everything went up to the very end. I was included in the final list of three. And then this procedure was derailed for some reason. And then, and, and, and then it started all over again. And then it happened the second time. And then it happened the third time. Uh, no one was elected. It's just, you know, we, we just had all these procedural issues and so on. Uh, but finally, I ended up in the final list of three, and then the, the, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe elected me, so I became this judge. In the, in the meantime, just before uh, election, you mentioned that I worked for the government. Just don't misunderstand. I, ne I never worked for the government in the sense that I've never been a civil servant. Um, I never received salary from, uh, from, from, from the government for being a civil servant, only for, as a university professor. Uh, and, uh, but, 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 but there was a very urgent practical need uh, because, um, uh, well, with, with the large-scale invasion of the Russian Federation into Ukraine, last, which started uh, on the 24th of um, uh, February last year, um, it was, for me it was obvious that uh, I would be useless I I I in the military, you know, uh, unfortunately. I, I, do have, I do have a training as a military interpreter, but, but they, didn't, they didn't need one anyway um, at that point. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, uh, I offered my free services as an independent advisor to the foreign minister, and uh, who happened to be a former colleague from International Law Department, so, so it was you know I could do that, and it was kindly accepted. And then uh, um, I had a project together with the UC, with a, a, a UCL professor, Philip Sands. Uh, we had a project uh, of uh, of a special tribunal uh, uh, for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. The project is still ongoing. I had to leave the project because uh, I was elected to the court. But, but th 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 those were several months when I, when I was, 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 was uh, very much involved there. So basically, th this, you know, this keeps me running. That's, uh, sorry, it's a very long answer, but it's so, sort of a self-introduction as well. That, that's why I, I, I took the liberty of speaking uh, uh, so, so long. But that's, that's just to show. And, 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 and these are all extremely interesting things. Uh, well, the, uh, the, the, this anti-torture work I was busy with was, was, was absolutely fascinating. And it was, it was a part-time, admittedly, it was a part-time job, even though being the, the, the president of that committee meant effectively a full-time job. But formally, it was still part-time. My university had always been extremely tolerant to my side activities, so they, they really... Uh, accommodated uh, all my needs, and then um, and, and and the judge is a full time time job, and then and then you you are you are overwhelmed with lots of uh, judicial work, which is also extremely interesting. So I, I, in, in in that respect, I'm uh, I would say I'm extremely motivated to continue my work. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, excellent answer. A lot of things to oh, sorry to follow up on. But uh, what I've learned, the main point is just apply everyone to the jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and you might become a judge at the International Court at some point. At least that's what I will be doing uh, after this uh, presentation. You absolutely should. <laughs> sure. So, uh, Judge, you were talking about armed conflict and uh, international law. And uh, when the European Convention on Human Rights was initially adopted in the 1950s, it was presumed that it will function in the peacetime, and it wouldn't necessarily uh, protect human beings uh, in the time of war. Uh, but we can now see that uh, the court you're working uh, at uh, is dealing with a lot of cases that uh, are connected pertaining to the armed conflict. Uh, uh, are regional human rights courts, like European Court of Human Rights, is the best place uh, for this uh, kind of cases, 
And uh, do you predict any sort of changes in the court's approach to the cases as associated with armed conflict? Well, thank you very much for this question. I, I, I honestly, I think uh, um, uh, the European Court of Human Rights was uh, um, uh, set up to supervise the, 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 the implementation of human rights in the post-war context. So it is related to war, I mean, genetically, but, uh, you know, the idea was actually to prevent future wars by making sure that Europe is, is, is a continent where, which is basically run uh, with full respect to human rights, whilst understanding the value of an individual, so basically, because if you, really, if, if you value an individual, if you, if you are serious about individual rights, you would, you would not contemplate you know, aggression, a war of aggression. These are simply worlds apart, because, uh, worlds apart, because you know, you, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely not your agenda. You know, it's just, you just can't work like this. But, um, the, the, this liberal uh, understanding that it will be possible to keep everyone well behaved uh, if you make sure that they um, take all these, assume all these human rights commitments and then uh, their democracy is functioning, they, they have regular elections, uh, they have uh, free speech, uh, they have, uh, you know, um, uh, the, 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 their courts domestically function well, there's rule of law in the country. Uh, those countries would never actually face the, the uh, you know, war. This, 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 this liberal dream has unfortunately not uh, uh, come true because it, it, it you know, um, now with, with, you know, there, there is an elephant in the room, so I'm, I will try not to, you know, uh, speak, uh, every, uh, you know, answering every question about the, the, the you know, Ru Russia's war against Ukraine, but at the, at the same time, uh, both were par parties to the European Convention of Human Rights. Both so accepted the, juris the, 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 um, uh, the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, both were members, member states of the Council of Europe, so accepting the obligations to maintain a democratic regime, to have regular free elections, uh, to uh, uh, respect the rule of law, at least basics and so on. Uh, but, well, that didn't help, ultimately. Um, so now the court, the European Court of Human Rights uh, is back to square one, or even before. So it's back to um, the situation which predated the, 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 uh, the creation of the court. Uh, and it has to make these, these rather hard choices how to react to that. Uh, the idea was that the court would be uh, seized only in very exceptional uh, uh, cases where uh, there would be an issue with, with, with how a, a domestic government is treating their people, you know, the, whether it is in, 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 uh, you know, in accordance with the European Convention on Human Rights or not. Um, Hence, there was the, uh, the, the right of individual petition, the, the, the possibility for an individual to apply to the court, um, uh, created and, and developed. Uh, with time, the barriers were just disappearing because they, you know, the, the European system started as a two-tier system. You, you first had to go through the commission and then exceptionally through the court. Uh, Interstate cases, when one, when one state would complain about the non systemic non-observance non of uh, human rights by another state, were highly exceptional. Uh, well, of course, there was case, the, 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 the was Ireland versus the United Kingdom. There was the Greek case. There were, there, there were cases, but 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 these are really unique unique cases, really really um, exceptional. Um, and 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 it turned out at the end that uh, um, it, the European Court of Human Rights in Europe is the only international court, is the only international body which has the right of individual application. You can directly go there and say that because of the war, my rights as, or as the rights of an individual have been violated. Uh, and, the, and, and the court does have this jurisdiction. That's it. So the court has to adapt and respond. Because saying, oh, sorry, we were created for, for peaceful times. Now, please, you know, let us uh, continue business as usual. The court is not in a position to say so, obviously. That's why the court has to adapt. 
uh, so whether it was created for this or not, now it now has to it ha now has to, to, to do this. And, and and then of course you asked about changes that would be associated with, with armed conflict. Of course, of course. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, throughout decades has been literally forced to uh, engage with, uh, um, with, uh, with, with the situation of armed conflicts. Uh, it had to adopt some of the concepts that belonged exclusively to the law of armed conflict, to the so-called international humanitarian law, into the domain of, of, of human rights, because you know, lawyers know, would know that, 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 that these are considered to be separate legal regimes. They are considered to be uh, independent of each other, applying at the same time, but independently of each other, um, if that is possible at all. But I don't think it's conceivable. But this is this is what this is what uh, so the the, the 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 theory would say about this, um, and uh, the European Court certainly can only rule on whether a state uh, has complied with its obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights or not. It cannot say that, oh yeah, maybe there was no convention issue. However, international humanitarian law was violated. I mean, the Inter-American Court tried things like this. They, uh, you know, as you know very well, they, uh, you know, they, they basically, uh, they, they had a very general clause in the, in the American Convention which allowed them to, on human rights, which allowed them to, you know, to uh, say that, for example, there was a human rights issue because Article 3, common to uh, uh, the four Geneva Conventions, uh, has been violated in, 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 a, in a given case. But even, even they slightly went back, so they, they weren't sure that they were doing, I think, they were doing the right thing because they, they're not consistent. I mean, this approach is, has not been consistently maintained by them. Uh, but uh, the European Court had to view the Convention rights through the lens of uh, uh, international humanitarian law. So some concepts were, initially, the, some concepts were adopted from uh, law of armed conflict without saying that these were concepts of the law of armed conflict. So anonymously, basically taking the, the 1949 Geneva Convention principles uh, into European human rights, but not mentioning a single word, not saying a single word about the Geneva Conventions. But it was obvious that it was it, it, was it exactly it. I mean, you, you assessing, let's say, um, uh, the, the, the proportionality of the um, you know, in, 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 in the use of uh, armed force uh, under the criteria that were developed uh, for, for international humanitarian law, but saying, no, 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 it's, uh, it's actually human rights law. And th this was, uh, uh, these were the, the cases, that the, the so-called Chechen cases, where, where the, um, the, 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 the non-international armed conflict within the Russian Federation uh, with, 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 with Chechnya uh, was, was the subject of these, uh, of these cases. And then gradually the court had to say, that in fact there was international humanitarian law and, and it had to be um, taken into account and had to be at least called by, by, by its name. So um, the court, even through some historical cases, cases which were basically dealing with the crimes of the past, for example, like, like, like the Latvian case, the Kononov versus Latvia, so, uh, where there was, there was an obvious war crime committed in 1940s during the Second World War and then the person was subsequently convicted, and then the person was complaining, that, why do you convict me? It wasn't a crime at that time. So the court had to look whether it was a crime, so it had to check, roughly, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, but it had to check whether international law of armed conflict at that point was already criminalizing certain conduct, certain, certain things which, which would certainly be considered as, as war crimes um, um, you know, today. So, so gradually, the, it, you know, the, the, these changes came, and, and uh, one can, you know, it, you can, it's not even enough to have one lecture about this. You, can, you should have a proper university course because there was a, quite a significant development. But ultimately, I don't think that uh, everything has been answered. I, 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 I believe that uh, the European Court will have to further develop this uh, line of its uh, case law, and unfortunately it has plenty of opportunities for doing so. Perfect, thank you. I'll just follow up on something you already said about uh, interstate applications. So as we understood, court uh, mostly deals with uh, human beings, individuals who apply to the court, but states can apply as well, and as you mentioned, historically it wasn't such a common occurrence, but we see now Ukraine has four pending interstate applications. 
uh, connected to the armed conflict that started in 2014. So uh, how do you perceive this uh, more frequent use of interstate applications? And uh, what are the advantages for states to pursue those cases before European Court of Human Rights instead of, for example, International Court of Justice that deals specifically with states? So arguably, that could be a more logical option for states. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much again. I, I think that's um, uh, the, 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 the most important thing that the European Court of Human Rights is, 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 is faced with now. Um, there are, at the moment, there are 14 pending interstate cases in the European Court of Human Rights. And there has been, there has been more, but, but uh, Georgia versus Russia number two has been finally completed also with the with the compensation issue so it's 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 over so what remains is 14 cases uh, four of them are um, uh, in, uh, ukraine uh, versus russia there is still one russia versus ukraine uh, russia is not communicating with the court since march last year so well, one can easy, quite, quite easily, I think, uh, at least uh, imagine the limited uh, number of options that the European Court of Human Rights has. I have to choose the words, of course, you know, um, in this respect. Um, and there's, there's cases of uh, Armenia versus Azerbaijan. There's cases of Azerbaijan versus Armenia, Armenia versus Turkey. And there is just... Uh, uh, as, as you know, uh, now for something completely different, the, 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 there is Liechtenstein versus the Czech Republic. Uh, on, uh, well, quite happily not on a on, on a case related to an ongoing armed conflict, uh, but but uh, it's, 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 it's a property issue, an, an old old property issue, but still. Um, and this means that the European Court of Human Rights has to uh, operate as an interstate. As an, as, 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 an, as, as, as an international court for states, like the International Court of Justice, which you know extremely well as you, as you work there, uh, it's, it's a different type of exercise. You know. um, it, you, when you have uh, 70, currently we have about 70,000 70, pending individual applications, which are normally, the, I mean, this, this, these are individuals, or sometimes uh, the non governmental bodies. Uh, companies or NGOs, uh, you know. Um, and, and this is the way you, you, you approach those cases, the processing of those cases is totally different from how you approach interstate cases. Uh, interstate cases are uh, very rich in terms of facts. So it's very, it's voluminous. You have to, you have to do lots of things. These, these are just enormous files, you know. Uh, uh, the standard also to decide on the standard of proof and how, how to achieve it in a given case. Um, there's there's uh, tens of thousands of uh, pages of, of, of applications, you know, and, 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 and various memorials submitted by parties. Um, third parties, uh, now the interstate case, the so-called big interstate case, uh, Ukraine and the Netherlands versus Russia, um, which started as a case about events uh, in the two um, regions in the east of, of Ukraine uh, from 2014 to 2015, and then the, uh, the, 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 the Dutch application, the application of the Netherlands concerning the downing of the MH17 flight uh, was uh, um, added because these are factually the same sort of circumstances, the same location and the, the same actions. Basically, um, and, and, and now it has been joined with the 2022 application of Ukraine concerning the events since the large-scale inv invasion of, of February last year. So um, it's, it's a huge case, and it's also joined by, as a third parties by, well, I, I'm, re I'm really afraid to be mistaken. I, th I think the final figure is something like 26, but I might be mistaken, states, member states of the Council of Europe and also the, the, there is the Geneva Academy for Humanitarian Law is, uh, as a third party and so on. So that all, all those parties, they also make submissions. Well, uh, one would hope that uh, uh, not every uh, state would actually decide to send its separate submission to the uh, uh, European Court of Human Rights, but they would rather coordinate. But that's up to them. Actually, the court cannot force them to, to coordinate. It would be nice if they do, but, you know. Um, 
So you rec that, this, this requires um, lots of resources for the court. And I, I, don't, I don't want to sound like the court, uh, you know, like my colleagues uh, you know, from, the, from the court, uh, from the Bureau of the Court or the President of the Court, uh, who are coming with this to the Committee of Ministers and the Council of Europe says, we are now doing the job of two international courts, not one international court. So could you please kindly augment the budget, you know, or, or, or you know, but, but in reality, this is, this is, this is true. Uh, in order to process all these thousands of applications coming from 46, or not from, but against 46 uh, member states of the Council of Europe, um, um, and, and, and also the uh, uh, residual cases against Russia, which used to be a member, um, uh, the court uh, has deployed uh, huge human resources. We, the registry of the court is ab uh, uh, employs about 650 persons. And, and plus, we are 46 judges elected in respect of each, uh, of each member state of the Council of Europe. So it's, it's 700 people, so it's a kind of legal factory, you know, of an enormous uh, uh, scope. But uh, uh, you would still need um, uh, the, these resources for, for the European Court of Human Rights. The difference with the ICJs, uh, the International Court of Justice, is that uh, uh, it's much easier to apply to the European Court of Human Rights because uh, you only apply against states who accepted the jury's uh, uh, diction of the um, European Court of Human Rights. <clears throat> and uh, you cannot be part of the Council of Europe or party to the European Convention without being a party to the European Convention of Human Rights. And being a party to the European Convention of Human Rights means that you accept the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. Whereas the jurisdiction of the ICJ, yes, 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 of course, you, 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 know, you, you know better than anyone in this room, I guess, is, you know, is, um, is, 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 the, is the most complicated matter. It's just very difficult to go there. You have to be a state, first of all, so no access for individuals. But, the, but, the, but then that's not enough. You, you, you must make sure that the other state actually accepted the, uh, the jurisdiction of the, Europe, of the International Court of Justice. And the, in most cases, they don't. And when one is wondering why Ukraine has, uh, has cases at the ICJ against the Russian Federation on the International Convention for the Financing of Terrorism and International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, this is because these are conventions where Russia accepted jurisdiction why, when becoming party to the convention, because this is part of the convention system. Same for the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Uh, again, you, you, you must accept the, the, the court's jurisdiction to be party to that convention. And, and it's not because, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, financing of terrorism is the most important issue there. You cannot, on the most important issue there, you cannot actually go to the European Court, whereas, or to the, to the International Court of Justice. Whereas for the European Court, uh, yes, there is this human dimension. The human dimension is something that, as we discussed, I think, uh, also amongst ourselves, uh, is something that ICJ often lacks, because this is a very much, it's very much an interstate court. You know. uh, but, but the European Court of Human Rights is Court of Human Rights, so it's, it's, it, even if we are talking about interstate disputes, the main question in, in interstate cases in the European Court of Human Rights is to prove the existence of the so-called administrative practice of a state uh, violating human rights. So there's a consistent pattern of behavior of, of the state that, which violates human rights. Um, that's why uh, there are more cases, in the interstate cases in the European Court of Human Rights than interstate cases, uh, at least from our region, uh, at the International Court of Justice. That's, that's quite uh, natural, I would say. Thank you. Fascinating. Uh, just drawing on this, uh, uh, on armed conflict, but also thinking of, of migration and also considering all your work uh, on migration uh, as part of uh, CPT, the Anti-Torture Committee. Uh, here in the UK now, the country is experiencing aggressive anti-migrant rhetoric. Uh, the plans to send asylum seekers to Rwanda are underway. And uh, the only thing that seems to be stopping the UK government is the European Court of Human Rights that issued a number of interim measures preventing the UK government to send asylum seekers to Rwanda, um, with the anti-migrant rhetoric growing, uh, not only in the UK, but beyond, uh, do you see the role of the court increasing uh, in the sphere of protecting migrants and asylum seekers on top of what they're already doing with regard to armed conflict? 
Well, migration is certainly one of the main topics for anyone who deals with human rights in Europe. And, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, my, my perspective is, uh, you know, was initially more more practical one because I, I was just uh, talking to migrants, and I, m I must tell you that's the, the most emotionally difficult exercise. I mean, it's much easier, believe me. I mean, it, in, my, in my in my perspective, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm sure that that, that 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 would be the case for uh, almost everyone doing this job. It's much easier to enter uh, a um, uh, cell um, and, uh, in a prison and, and talk to somebody who killed many people, you know, um, than to uh, actually speak with a migrant who has never committed any crime whatsoever. He just didn't, didn't have the papers that would allow this person to, to, to stay where, where, where he or she finds uh, themselves now because they, 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 they simply wanted a better life for their, for, for, for their children and for themselves. And, uh, well, or, or even, even had to leave their country. You never know. It might, might well be that you know, they couldn't really stay there. So, because they, they, they are mightily frustrated. These, peop these are people who uh, feel such terrible injustice. They haven't done anything. I mean, and they're being treated like criminals, or worse than criminals. So, the, and, and, and that's why, um, uh, you know, I, I, I can give a totally, you know, uh, I hope unexpected dimension. Like, from the point of view of the government, what's easier, to maintain a functioning prison or to maintain a, a center for administrative detention of migrants? Well, prison is much easier. Because all those centers for mi migrants, you have to repair everything basically every month or every two weeks, because everything gets broken. Because people are frustrated, so they break things. Well, as simple as that. They set their environment on fire. They, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's constantly the, this, uh, the, the, the sight and the smell and everything of, of mattresses being burnt in those uh, uh, facilities is something that you can never forget. And, 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 and also the, the, how, how all these installations look uh, you know, in, a, in an almost brand new center just a couple of months after it was populated. Well, let alone places where, which were not designed for migrants as such, but uh, uh, are converted, like converted pri old prisons are used to accommodate migrants by some European governments, I'm not talking about the UK here, uh, who are perfectly in a position to provide, if need be, excellent living conditions, but they're sending a message to those migrants that they are not welcome. So they, they, they would rather stay in, 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 in a prison-like environment, not in, a, in an open environment. Uh, now, the role for the European Court of Human Rights and, 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 and also the, 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 the difficulties that uh, exist, I, again, I'm, you know, now I'm entering the, 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 the field where it's, where it, which is a minefield in a way, so I, I'll try to choose my words carefully. Um, uh, so this is, this is one of the, of course, uh, critical uh, issues between the court and the United Kingdom. And certainly the court has heard loud and clear all these uh, political statements, including threats to leave the European Convention on Human Rights, which in my view would be a disaster. It would be a disaster for the entire system because the UK is a cornerstone of this uh, whole arrangement. Um, the idea of the Council of Europe Convention and so on, I mean, it literally it belongs to Winston Churchill, you know. It, 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 it is very much a UK production. It's, 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 it's very much based on the values that have been uh, perpetuated in the, in, in, in the United Kingdom for uh, centuries. You know, so, it, it, you know, it's, it's really, that, that for me, it's, it would be uh, a, a, a major blow, not, not a single authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regime can harm the system that much, especially leaving it or, or undermining it from, from inside, than the, 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 than the oldest uh, democracy and the, the, the oldest uh, um, you know, uh, human rights uh, sort of uh, oriented uh, uh, democratic political regime. Um, so can the role, of the, the role of the court is there, the court um, uh, has actually developed the, these, uh, the, this, this exact tool, the so-called uh, uh, Rule 39 of the, of the Rules of Procedure, the, the interim measures to address the situation of migrants who face extradition or 
any other form of return to um, a, a, a country where uh, there's an imminent danger uh, to their most fundamental human rights. So it's, it's danger to life or it's, or it's, a, or it's a realistic danger of, of, of being tortured there. Or, or enslaved, I would say, or, or, or anyway, be, being uh, arbitrarily deprived of their liberty. That would be it. You know? So th th these, these are not every single human right. You know? there, there's a long catalog, but, but really something that is in the very sort of hard core of, 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 of human rights. And, and these are uh, non-derogable rights. These are really key, 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 key rights. Uh, but interim measure is an interim measure. It can never be a solution to the problem. The solution to the problem can only be found by the state itself. And, and, and uh, this, you know, um, it's true that uh, uh, for any politician it is easier to uh, adopt a discourse which would uh, potentially bring more votes than a discourse that, would, uh, that, that can run against some popular understandings or, or, or misunderstandings um, that would require uh, a very sort of painstaking exercises of uh, explaining to people, but also uh, surrounding it by many policies which need to uh, be put in place to, to have a more, um, uh, to a, a more sort of humane system. That being said, migration is a challenge. Migration is a challenge. Every society has its capacity. Every society has, you know, it will also be, you know, being very liberal and pro-migration and so on, um, uh, would, uh, and, and, and completely forgetting about uh, the realities of the world is, 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 is an absolutely sort of, it's a, it's a path to, 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 to nowhere. You, you, you will not achieve anything positive here. So um, there, are many, there are many problems here. And uh, um, finding the right balance is something that is extremely challenging. But blaming all, it on, on human rights and blaming it on those who actually want the state to, rem, to you know, re, to, to maintain its human face, so to say, uh, would be would be a very wrong uh, um, idea. So that you know, you must understand your limitations and then form the policies that uh, uh, are viable in, in a given situation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll try to be not very greedy and ask the last question, then we'll open up uh, questions for questions in the audience. Uh, so uh, we talked about the elephant in the room, uh, Russia, a permanent member of the UN Security Council uh, that start started an unprovoked uh, war of conquest, committed numerous war crimes, threatened the world with nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm personally, for me, it's difficult not to be disillusioned with international law when uh, such fundamental principles are uh, undermined by the power that is the founding power of the UN and the entire international, contemporary international legal system. Are you still optimistic about international law? Uh, we have many students here who would like to pursue a career in international law. What would be your advice to them? Well, uh, that's really tough, but uh, um I'll start again with something obvious, as you, you might have noticed, I normally speak obvious things, you know, just... just uh, uh, so one obvious thing would be that uh, it is generally counterproductive to be pessimistic. So if you... If, <laughs> because, you know, I, I th be, be, being a pessimist means that you, you, you are giving up, essentially. Um, and yes, that, that's, well, that's a solution, of course, but then what, 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 what comes next? You know, I, if, if I may, I will just, again, draw from my sort of practical experience. Uh, you know, the, the question that, that you are asked most frequently uh, by, let's say, by prisoners, talking with them individually, so, and what will be the result of this conversation? Will actually some things improve? Will, will something change? Can you make sure that things, uh, uh, you know, really, really, really get better? Um, and, well, certainly there are people who are so delighted to see somebody, you know, a, a person from abroad and you know, interested in their, in their personal affairs that they would be idealistic and they, they, they would assume that you, everything will change. Uh, and then you have to warn them in advance that, you know, just do not have very high expectations anyway. But then my answer usually, I mean, what, depending on the circumstances, it was, was more or less long, but the, the gist of it was that if you don't do anything, you will not achieve anything. That's it, again, very obvious. 
So international law, is, 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 as I mentioned, it's a project of uh, making this world better. It's true that uh, um, when it comes to ensuring international peace and security, the system that was set up after the, the end of the Second World War, which vested five major powers, the, the, the victors in the, in, 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 in the Second uh, World War, with extra rights and extra responsibilities for the maintenance of international peace and security, it's obvious that the system has not worked well. I mean, for, you know, I mean, you know for Ukrainians it's easy to say because then you, you I mean, you, you see the, uh, all, 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 this, all, all this human tragedy that uh, is unfolding every single day in your country, but then um, um, trying to step back and, and, and look at how this uh, evolved, you will see that uh, there were clear signs that it was going in exactly in that direction. There is nothing surprising, to be honest. I mean, if you, if, with hindsight, we can say that, in, 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 in what has happened, uh, because the behavior of the majority of permanent members of the, Council of, uh, of the Security Council uh, of the United Nations was far from perfect. It has been far from perfect for, 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 for so many years. Uh, yes, I mean, a war of aggression uh, in combination with uh, in the idea of territorial conquest in Europe, that's something that's, you know, is completely beyond the, um, uh, any, any, any limits. But, you know, like smaller violations, so to say, I mean, they, they, were, they, they, were, they were taking place and, and the system was, I mean, the erosion of the system was, uh, was there. Um, so it, it's not, it's, it's impossible not to be disappointed with, with this particular part. However, once there is an understanding that things must change, they will change. It will be too late, as always, it's, you know, yeah. international law is usually one war late, you know, when it comes to security issues and when it comes to humanitarian law issues as well. But uh, it, 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 it will change. But also international law is, um, um, is a funny system. It's, uh, it, it is, as, as, as it was a huge fashion in international law uh, uh, doctrine um, in recent years, it, it is a fragmented system. It is, I mean, everyone was writing about fragmentation, for, you know, for, for... Including me in my PhD thesis. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, uh, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I, you know, I'm also guilty of that, and you know, I, I, I know, I know, I know others who, who did it. Um, yeah. But um, uh, it's true that there are certain projects. I would, I would put it not in, this, in, the ter in terms of regimes, but uh, rather in terms of projects. How to, how to, to make, to make things better. The project of world trade, let's say, liberal world trade, trade. The project of uh, protecting environment. The project of uh, migration. The project of. Uh, whatever, law of the sea, God knows what, and human rights, of course. So, and, and you can still achieve a lot of progress in some of those projects, but it's true that the foundations are, 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 are shattered and, 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 and uh, they, will have to be, uh, they will have to be changed, but uh, that will come with time, I think. So we, we, we just have to do whatever we can uh, in, in each particular role and each particular situation. Thank you. Uh, now I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, Let's, uh, if anyone can help with the microphones. Uh, oh, yeah. Could we collect three questions that we have here and then yeah. we'll answer all of them together. Mm -hmm. So we start with them. Okay. Thank you for the talk. My name is Rasha, not like the country, not spelled <laughs> like the country. Um, my question is about jurisdiction and access to justice for individuals. So we know that the European Court allows people to actually access justice, but that's not the case for people outside the European Union. So if you take the example of Syrian refugees that sought justice against the Bashar regime in French and German courts, same thing for Lebanese people that couldn't see um, justice for the Beirut blast in international courts because Lebanon does not rec did not sign the um, optional protocol for the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights. They did open up several cases in smaller courts. So we had the case against Savar LTD in the UK. We have several other attempts to open other 
cases and other courts, but do you think that we're moving towards a more inclusive international justice system? Can we actually get to the point where individuals can access justice on an international court when, when their local courts fail them? Thank you very much, uh, I'm Mary, PhD student at IRDR, and I had a question, um, apologies if it's a bit simple, but we've spoken a lot about access and individuals having access, but what, what is the outcome, um, sort of the impact? So you've spoken about all these cases, what does the court do, how does that impact the individual, are there sort of sanctions or something to the states, how, how does that work in that case, maybe specifically um, with the UK versus Rwanda, I know that would be a hypothetical, but just a bit more explanation on that, please. Thank you. Anna, um, I think many of us are aware that um, conflict and disaster can be a deadline, it's not really clear. Um, differences. I think my question is mainly on to what extent would you agree or disagree that victims of disasters fall within the domain of RCP in that it's a sovereign state's responsibility to from harm? Perfect. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Excellent questions, uh, all, all very different, and um, I'll just take them one by one. I don't think there is any, any, any point in trying to regroup them. So I'll, I'll start with Rashak's questions. Um, um, now it's, uh, of, of, of course, uh, the, 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 the major premise of international law when it comes to international justice, the courts, that uh, you can only um, apply to an international court against the state when the state is accepted, is juris jurisdiction. That's very simple. That's why the, this whole, the, 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 Europe, the European system, where basically it's impossible to be a member of the club, sort of, 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 sort of civilized European nations, without accepting the, the, the jurisdiction, uh, was so good and, and remains, remains so good. Uh, up until very recently, in the entire European continent, there was only one single state. Uh, uh, very well known to us because it's a, it's, it's a neighboring to Ukraine state and a very, it's a, also people with whom we are re very much related in many ways, uh, Belarus, uh, which were not part of, the, of, the, of this uh, um, effort. And well, now, of course, Ru with, after Russia was expelled, uh, then also, of course, Russia is not there. Um, uh, and this is not the case for any, or literally any other any other region. So it's, it's extremely complicated. And you, you are right in mentioning that um, foreign courts can, can at least be contemplated as, as, as an option. And here um, it, it depends on the, uh, on, on the exact uh, subject of your complaint. Because if it's about crimes committed in Syria, in Lebanon, let's say, and, and so on, um, uh, then uh, it is quite possible to um, initiate criminal prosecution of the, of the perpetrators uh, in the states which um, have incorporated the concept of universal jurisdiction in their, in their, in their, in their, in their law. And in fact, when um, international criminal justice was being rapidly developing, uh, um, developed in the um, uh, late 1990s, beginning of uh, uh, 2000s, um, the, there were some people who just said, were imagining a wonderful system whereby, first of all, every state has the primary responsibility for prosecuting most serious crimes against international law. By most serious crimes, I mean the most serious human rights violations, uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. You know. um, and then, where they would not be able to do that, there would be other states acting by virtue of universal jurisdiction doing this. And only when nothing of this worked, then the ICC. Now um, this is more or less this is this is more or less what's happening. However, the, uh, the in reality, universal jurisdiction is a concept which is not fully embraced by 
many states, and then there's many limitations, and the, our uh, beloved International Court of Justice uh, reminded states that they, that they are, uh, in terms of classical international law, they have very limited opportunities when it comes to people who enjoy immunities uh, as high officials of their states in the, in the, in the case of the DRC versus Belgium. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then, and then it, it, it turns out that the International Criminal Court, which is, I, I, I would still insist that it is probably one of the best achievements of the civilization, uh, it has been so terribly inefficient. You know, it's just, uh, it's basically, it doesn't have a record it can be proud of, you know, for o over 20 years, which will change, I, I very much hope so, but, and ho hopefully is changing now, but uh, that, you know, so far they have been rather, uh, you know, unsuc un unsuccessful. So this, that, that's, that, that's why, um, the more inclusive international justice would only be possible with changes in international law. And now it's more of a combination of domestic and international justice, but you know, uh, so far I would expect that perhaps the, you know, universe, the topic of universal jurisdiction will be further revisited and, and, and perhaps uh, embraced by more states. Um, now, um, uh, Marie has asked about the outcome and the impact of, uh, of cases. Well, in principle, the function of the European Court of Human Rights is to establish, uh, to answer the question about the existence of the international legal responsibility of a state uh, for compliance or non-compliance, for non-compliance, possible non-compliance with its international legal obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights. Well, European Convention on Human Rights as interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights, certainly. You know, because it's, this court is very much the master of, of what the convention means. I mean, whether you like it or not, this is how it is. Um, then the court itself does not uh, deal with um, uh, the execution of its judgments. F except for one case, I will come back to it now. Uh, but uh, it, it's a responsibility that is given by the convention system to a political body within the Council of Europe, the Committee of Ministers. So they have the, the mechanism for um, uh, supervising the execution of judgments. Uh, and then they discuss problems which arise occasionally. And then they adopt resolutions uh, so that the state could do something. Well, this is more or less that, uh, that similar to what might exist in the, in, uh, at the global level. It doesn't, though, it doesn't manifest itself so clearly, but in fact, when, when, when a state does not comply with uh, uh, a judgment of the International Court of Justice, in principle, is the, the UN Security Council who can push that state uh, in the right direction, but uh, that doesn't actually happen. And, well, we, we currently have a situation when uh, the Russian Federation is clearly not complying with uh, the order of the International Court of Justice on the, it's not called interim measures, it's called in the ICJ, it's called uh, provisional measures. measures. Uh, on provisional measures in the genocide case, because the ICJ clearly told, uh, the, in, you know, it was, was just one week into the large scale invasion, the ICJ told them to stop the, any, any armed activities in Ukraine and uh, the, any armed activities of uh, um, uh, those uh, um, groups that they control, so just told them to stop. They, clear, they, are, they, have, they are clearly ignoring it, they, they, they bluntly refused to. Uh, 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 comply. Uh, and of course, it would no normally be for the Security Council to do something about it, but then we know how Security Council is organized, so it's, it's, it's not, not a viable option. You know. um, uh, for the European Court of Human Rights, the vast majority of uh, its judgments are complied with. Rule 39 uh, uh, orders are also the, almost, almost all of them are uh, complied with, but uh, certainly there are issues when that uh, there's problems when 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 when, when there's non-compliance and then it well ultimately the after uh, after the adoption of the of, of protocol 14 to the european convention on human rights um, uh, now there is a possibility for the committee of ministers of the uh, council of europe to go back to the european court of human rights under article 46 paragraph 4 of the european convention on human rights and to say that uh, well please rule whether the state has complied or not complied, and he, 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 here's the evidence. It has only happened twice so far, 
one case uh, in, against Azerbaijan, one case against uh, Turkey. Uh, and uh, in both cases, the European Court of Human Rights had to say that indeed the state concerned has not complied with, with the judgment. But then, uh, so far, no tangible repercussions for that state. Um, well, Azerbaijan has, uh, in effect, complied later. So it's, it's, the matter is closed, because there was one person who was in prison, so he's out of prison, so that's, that's it. Huh? But uh, at that time, they didn't comply, so later they, they did. Uh, they hadn't. Uh, but uh, for, Tur for Turkey, it's not, not yet the case. Um, uh, but then it comes back to the political question on how you exert pressure on that state to actually comply and uh, because uh, it can end up with even with, with, with the question of whether the state should be expelled from the organization. But this is so traumatic for the organization, incredibly traumatic, that, of course, this is the measure of the very, very, very last resort. Um, uh, you, I will not comment on, on the UK Rwanda, I'm sorry, but, but further, but, but that's, uh, yeah. But, the, but this is the framework. And on uh, the extent, and your, your question on the, uh, yeah, on the conflict on justice and, and, and to what extent victims um, of uh, disasters sh should be uh, considered as persons who must be protected by states as a matter of legal obligation, I understand. Currently, um, to what extent does victims of disasters fall in the domain of the RTP and the Human Rights Commission? R2P, um, I'm not a big uh, fan of R2P uh, in principle. I, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 the, it's, it's a slightly more modern, at that time it was a more modern tune of the old song. It's not, I mean, it, 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 it didn't create anything, I think, to, to, to be honest. So in principle, I'm, I'm very sort of uh, reserved about r to I think there are uh, more important obligations at stake because I think that state, states under human rights law, international human rights law, have positive obligations to protect such persons. And these, these are legal obligations. It's not some you know, resolution or whatever, some, wish, some general wishes. That, so I, I think you can find a way to um, uh, build a case that this is the obligation stemming, let's say, from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, National Co Covenant on, on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights. So you can do that in, at the global level. And certainly you can do that within the framework of the European Convention on Human Rights and protocols there too. So I think that there is, the, the, it's, 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 a, it's a plausible line of argument, let's say. Thank you again for the, for, for the questions. Over to you, Julia. Uh, thank you. I think, uh, I'm afraid we ran out of time. I'm very sorry uh, for being so worried. <laughs> but thank you so much for this very interesting question and thank you very much to the judge for taking thank the you. time to come to us and to have such an interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And I think we are followed by Professor Elon Kelman. Uh, I'm sorry we ran a little bit yep. late. So track one, two. That's okay at the back. Okay. So thank you very much. So I'm Elan Kelman. I'm half here at the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. And I'm half at the UCL Institute for Global Health. So it is sort of a gamble regarding which half of me you get on any given day. And today I'm going to be talking about disaster diplomacy in this context of risk across borders, risk without borders, risk through borders. And we start with the usual day of 26 December 2004. A massive shallow earthquake off the coast of Indonesia shatters in morning. Indigenous people on the island of Similu, right beside the epicenter, 
know exactly what is coming next. So they run for the hills with a remarkably low mortality rate. Others are not so lucky. Within minutes across Aceh, Indonesia, over 130,000 people have died, including Indonesian soldiers fighting the Achenese separatists and Achenese separatists who were trapped in their prison cells and could not escape. The tsunami crosses the Indian Ocean, slamming into over a dozen countries causing fatalities, including Sri Lanka, the second worst hit country, over 35,000 dead. And like Aceh, subject to a long-standing conflict, which had become particularly violent over the past three decades. The world slowly wakes up to this devastation. Facebook had just started, and Twitter did not exist. Those were the days, weren't they? <laughs> but videos of the waves r ripping through the tourist resorts soon appeared on the 24-hour news channels. Away from those tourist resorts, though, the places most ruined were those least accessible by the outside world. Aceh had been off limits, and Sri Lanka, the worst hit areas, had been too dangerous. But yet, from the devastation, a remarkable consequence emerged. A month later, on 23rd January 2005, Achenese fighters in the Indonesian government started peace talks in Helsinki. On 15 August that year, a peace deal was signed, and it has so far lasted. Apparently, we have disaster diplomacy. Except that across the ocean, in Sri Lanka, the situation was deteriorating. Humanitarian aid was being blocked by many parties in the conflict. They appeared to be just spoiling for a fight, despite their citizens desperately needing humanitarian aid. As Aceh's peace deal was being finalized, Sri Lanka's foreign minister was assassinated. And three months later, Sri Lanka elected a president explicitly opposed to a peace deal. Four years more of bitter fighting until the Sri Lankan government reached a military victory. So why the difference? Did Aceh's peace deal really come from the tsunami? Did the exacerbation and continuation of Sri Lanka's conflict, was that caused by the tsunami? Well, to try and investigate this question, we asked the overarching disaster diplomacy query about how and why disaster-related activities do and do not influence peace and cooperation. So disaster-related activities, it's not just post-disaster. Yes, we had the humanitarian summit yesterday. Yes, we heard about post-disaster financing this morning. That is an important element of disaster diplomacy. But we also have to think about the fact we are the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. And today is about risk with borders across borders, through borders, without borders, not just disaster response. So disaster diplomacy does examine pre-disaster activities, disaster risk reduction, mitigation, prevention, preparedness, and planning. That's the good news. The bad news is that we've investigated dozens of studies from around the world, recent, such as the 6 February 2023 earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, and ancient going back a thousand years, if not more. We've looked at different geographies in terms of within countries, and of course across countries, bilateral and multilateral. We've considered different hazards raising, ranging from earthquakes to haze from forest fires, but also recognizing that the key to disaster is not the hazard, it's the vulnerability. So we've considered different vulnerabilities, such as discrimination, in disaster aid, such as prejudice through disaster risk reduction, such as what happens when racism infiltrates disaster casualty identification. And across all of these dozens of case studies throughout humanity, we have yet to find a single clear success for disaster diplomacy. So why does disaster diplomacy fail? across all forms, all hazards, all vulnerabilities, all geographies, all locations? Well, the answer really comes in the general patterns that we witness. So disaster-related activities have not yet been shown to generate new, lasting, 
genuine diplomacy. What disaster-related activities do achieve, both post-disaster and pre-disaster, is supporting, influencing an ongoing process. So it can catalyze, it can spur on, it can affect people, organizations, institutions, governments who want peace or conflict for other reasons, and then they use disaster-related activities as one excuse among many for achieving that diplomacy or rapprochement or cooperation or peace or conflict or war goal which they wanted anyway. What are those pre-existing bases? Well, it might be secret negotiations. Could be ongoing trade or desire that money and economics are much more important than lives. We know that doesn't happen too often, but that can be a pre-existing basis. Certainly cultural links. Pre-existing links, either historical, cultural, sports, arts, entertainment all can spur on, can influence, can bring in disaster-related activities towards those diplomatic processes. But when this catalysis does happen, when we do see that, see that clear influence of disaster on diplomacy, it is inevitably short-term, basically on the order of weeks or months. And in the longer term, when we get to years, other factors simply take over and supersede whatever happened regarding the disaster-related activities. These other factors, leadership changes, other disasters, including possible conflicts, or too often, sadly, the inertia of historical dislike. You've only been here 300 years. Why do you call this home? You don't belong here. And then a disaster happens or there's disaster aid, and these prejudices, this discrimination simply recurs and perpetuates irrespective of what's going on with respect to the disaster. So how bleak is this? Well, we do know that it's very difficult to be entirely comprehensive. As I said, we've looked at dozens of examples of all forms. Dozens is not hundreds. And we have many possibilities of ongoing work which may yet yield disaster diplomacy successes. So for those students who might be looking for a dissertation, <laughs> we certainly have ideas for you to investigate going into historical archives, uh, doing research by interviewing people who were actually there at the time, those who were the decision makers, or just trying to improve the concepts that we've come up with. The fundamental basic challenge which comes from disaster diplomacy is judge to just say the obvious, as we heard before, that fundamentally disaster-related activities are not necessarily a political priority. Oh, I didn't give a trigger warning. I hope that wasn't a shock to anyone. <laughs> that sometimes politicians may be aiming for something more than saving the lives of the people. That sometimes politicians may want something more than actually stopping a disaster and helping their country? Something more as in ideology, as in power, as in consolidating the resources which they have already, and no disaster and no disaster risk reduction is going to stop them from achieving their own personal political goals. These really put another way, politics can simply be uncaring. I don't think this is an innovative insight, but it is sometimes forgotten, particularly in the media and humanitarian rush, to say, oh, disaster has happened. We have to help, and we're all going to ha hold hands and sing a song, Kumbaya, at midnight while dancing in a circle. Some people want that, but often those with the power don't. Just as we know, as I alluded to, disasters come from vulnerability, not hazard, not the environment. These, those with power, resources, and opportunity inadvertently or deliberately seek disaster, want disaster, or simply don't care about disaster. What does this mean for humanitarianism? What does this mean for risk and disaster reduction? Can we be neutral? Can we be impartial? The seven principles which pervade many humanitarian organizations now moving into disaster risk reduction, as we heard this morning, 
Is that actually feasible or is that an ideal dream? And ultimately, what does this mean for a specific example, like that devastating 26 December 2004 tsunami? There is no doubt in Ache that the earthquake, tsunami, the deaths and the devastation created the space whereby peace could happen if it were desired. There is no doubt that the events on that morning led the possibility of rebuilding better, of reaching a peace deal, of ending the conflict if people wanted it. And it turned out that in Aceh, Indonesia, actually the people wanted it. Our research showed that the secret negotiations that led to those talks in Helsinki and ultimately the peace deal, those talks had started secretly on the 24th of December 2004, 48 hours before the earth shook. But no negotiation starts like that. Those talks appeared based on months of previous back and forth by leaders on the various sides who already wanted peace and were seeking any excuse to achieve it. So they used the earthquake, tsunami, the disaster, the humanitarian aid as one excuse among many to achieve that peace. Whereas in Sri Lanka, the main parties had very clear reasons for wanting the war. They gained from it. It helped consolidate the power, resources and opportunities that they had. So they were looking for any excuse whatsoever to continue that conflict. And the tsunami, the disaster, the humanitarian aid gave them one excuse among many in order to continue that war. And they used it. So what do we do about it? And who is we anyway? Some of us are operational, some of us are not. But by virtue of being in this room or online, we are privileged. And so is it our duty, is it our responsibility to say, if we just sit back and, you know, be researchers and say, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Oh, yeah, people died. How, you know, let's tally that up. Are we really doing what we ought to be doing? Or do we have more of duty, responsibility and obligation to be active, to get involved, either using our PhD by becoming a practitioner or by doing both academics and practitionership, by saying, we know that disaster diplomacy might work. What can we do actively to ensure that it could work? And then what are the dangers of it backfiring? Imagine if we go in and say, oh, there's been a disaster with your enemy, and if you help them, you'll actually achieve peace. And the leader says, well, I don't want peace, so I don't care if they die under the rubble. I'm not giving humanitarian aid. Again, in humanitarianism, and risk and disaster reduction is do no harm ever really feasible without knowing in advance. So who, who is a we? Are we perfectly complacent, perfectly content in our nice, I guess, purple ivory tower discussing this? Or should we be more active? Also thinking about the vocabulary and the words we use. I've just thrown out synonyms, right? Diplomacy, cooperation, rapprochement, collaboration. Those are actually very different and different disciplines, even within international affairs, international relations, disaster risk reduction and others, actually define them quite differently, which means we're often talking at cross purposes, which in itself can cause problems. So when we do talk about risk, disasters, disaster risk reduction, with, across, without, in between, through borders and different types of borders, what is it that we want to achieve? And how are we going to ensure that we do actually achieve that without causing more problems, whether or not that is with or without disaster diplomacy? Thank you very much. Do we have questions and a microphone, Jasmine? So we have a microphone, we have a Jasmine. Do we have questions? <laughs> Thanks very much. That was really illuminating talk. Um, I wondered how far you would see a loss and damage fund under the UNFCCC as an opportunity for some kind of disaster diplomacy. Well, loss and damage was first proposed by Vanuatu before the UNFCCC was even founded. 
We're now a generation on, and of course you have a wonderful agreement, but no money, and no mechanism for dispersing the money, and no one who's going to be actually responsible for the money. So I'm not optimistic about loss and damage. Other challenges with loss and damage, number one attribution. Remember, loss and damage is, for some bizarre reason, focused on only human-caused climate change and nothing else. But, you know, earthquakes cause loss and damage, and tsunamis do, and many other uh, hazards and hazard influencers. Number two, it is very top-down and very much from a certain class of countries. So they talk about climate justice, but there's an exceptional amount of academics, again, practical, who knows, but academics, who point out the colonialist and neo-colonialist approaches, interpretations, and results from taking a climate justice framework. Uh, and number three, then we need to think about loss and damage from colonialism, from the internet, from television, from tourism, and the final aspect is from the beginning of the recognition that human-caused climate change is a major problem, there is also recognition there's huge losses and damages which are happening now. Some actually benefit. There are some gains. And even in the UNFCCC and IPCC definitions of adaptation, it explicitly says climate change adaptation means exploit beneficial opportunities from climate change. So should we subtract the gains from the losses to achieve loss and damage. And none of these issues, in effect, are actually addressed by it. So yeah, I mean, the UN may have done some good. Uh, has it actually achieved disaster diplomacy? We've not find and found an example. In the climate change negotiations, we've looked at them and really not found anything emerging beyond those climate change negotiations. And loss and damage right now has been a very uh, disappointing distraction, particularly because they're going for on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe up to billions of dollars a year. But fossil fuel subsidies every year exceed $400 billion a year. So let's say they get $200 billion a year, then that's actually paying them to take double that amount in direct subsidies. So we're not really achieving anything in the end, even if we get that loss and damage fund up on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. But in good news, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much. So you talked about how sort of disasters maybe have negative uh, or they help sort of patchwork negative impacts that are happening in the country already. Can you think of a positive example where a disaster has then led to better diplomacy afterwards after a disaster or hazard event in your experience? So we have many examples where it's influenced and spurred on, and that chase one. Another clear-cut one is on the 17th of August, 1999, an earthquake rocked northwest Tur Turkey, Turkey, killing over 17,000 people. Greece immediately offered assistance. Quite conveniently, three weeks later, Athens was shocked by an earthquake on the 7th of September, 1999, which killed over 100 people, and it was actually Turkey's search and rescue team who rang the Greek ambassador in Ankara to say, your capital's in trouble, we will offer anything you need. And both countries suddenly said, well, this is a, how we're going to come together and actually create earthquake diplomacy. And there was great hope for that. Our research showed that that process had started three years earlier in 1996. So it definitely helped, definitely spurred it on. And we find this again and again and again, but it did not cause. The other element is disasters influencing elections. And again, we heard this morning about Mexico. And there is a whole field out there and many examples of how poor humanitarian relief or solid disaster response actually helped win a relatively free uh, or, or helped lose a relatively free, open and fair democratic election. Relatively, depends on the country. And so this is sort of an example where politicians might want to say, oh, it's an election, let's have a disaster. Uh, or try and use that conveniently, coincidentally, in order to do better. Now, of course, there's a number of moral issues. Why are they only helping after a disaster to win an election? Number two, shouldn't they do a lot better in terms of preventing the disaster and trying to be appropriate with politics? And number three, you ask for a positive outcome. When someone wins or loses an election, there's always people who think it's positive and people who think it's negative. So it's a balance. But the core of your question and the core of disaster diplomacy, why are we waiting for a disaster to lead to peace or positive politics? Why can we not just stop disasters happening, 
and have positive peace and positive health and positive democracy and positive society without waiting for that catastrophe or potential catastrophe. And in a sense, why do we not support prevention is better than cure? Why do we not do better for ourselves and our society without even thinking about catastrophe is a question that maybe you want to think about over lunch. <laughs> as well as beyond in your work, in your studies, in order to say we have major problems, let's do better. But thank you for being here. We are back, Rosanna, at 2.15? 2 o'clock. So please come back. British summer time, 1400. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone, see you back here at 2 o'clock for Data Without Borders.
Okay, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Okay, we are going just to start uh, the afternoon session. Uh, also, welcome again back here. Good afternoon again and welcome for IRDR conference. In the afternoon session, uh, we are going to talk uh, about data without borders within the theme, main theme of risk, without borders or cross borders. So, uh, in this session, you already understand, already mentioned yesterday and today morning, the importance of data, and uh, now we are going to talk about data without borders. So, based on the technological advances that we have now, we have access to unprecedented amount and size and volume of data. So in that sense, it's important to understand how we can use such data without borders. You know, there are oppositions saying that, you know, no, we don't have such type of data, but yeah, considering different sensors that are and technological advances and different sensors that we have in collecting data, now we have much more data when we compare to last decades. So in, in terms of data, when we have data without borders, we have much more amount of data. Uh, so we can also talk about how we can analyze them and how we can use them. Today, my name is Salman Ghaffarian. I'm also a lecturer in geospatial science at IRDR at UCL. We co-organize this with Dr. Zoom, uh, who is also a lecturer at IRDR. I'm not going to chair the panel. I will be one of the panelists here. So just starting and introducing the session and why we are looking at the data without borders within the risk without borders. We will look at, uh, we, have, we will have different panelists from different disciplines, from meteorology, from, we have a journalist, we have a computer scientist. I will try to talk about AI and also remote sensing, how this affects data without borders and how we can actually use this to address disaster risk reduction topics. So now I hand over the session to Dr. Soon, who is going to actually chair the session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Salman, for elegantly setting the tone for today's uh, Data Without Borders session. I'm Tim Soon, lecturer in uh, meteorological and climate hazard risks. And uh, it's uh, absolutely my privilege to introduce our distinguished panelists here today who will be sharing their insights with us. So firstly, we are fortunate to have Professor Mehmed Angshid on board. He's an excellent computer scientist with uh, in-depth experience in the realm of digital twins, and uh, a warm welcome to you. Next, we have the privilege to introduce Dr. Islin Johnston. Uh, she's a data journalist and the reputable economist. Personally, I've been impressed with uh, all her coverage in different topics from uh, energy to climate to technology. I'm thrilled to have you here, Ainsley. Joining the esteemed panel is uh, Dr. Samantha uh, Burgess. Uh, she's a deputy director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service and the European Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecast. Dr. Burgess offers a unique blend of expertise uh, working tirelessly and the science policy interface to improve understanding of climate science. An energetic welcome to you, Dr. Burgess. And our panel won't be complete with our very own Dr. Simon Gaffarin. Uh, he's our in-house data scientist, and uh, he will provide pr perspective, uh, data uh, insights into data science uh, from uh, our own RDR perspective. Okay, next uh, we will unfold today's session. So, each panelist 
will give a very short opening presentation, each uh, for no more than six minutes. Then after that, we will go into our very vibrant panel discussion. I look forward to the ex exciting exchange of ideas. Let's get this started. First, Professor Amshit, please. Thank you very much for inviting me. Do I need to use microphone or is it? Can you hear me at the back? Or? Hello? So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it is, uh, I, I am computer scientist from University of Twente, but last three years I was in Turkey uh, working on disaster management. And basically um, we are interested in uh, automating disaster management processes. So what are these? Oh, this makes a lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, just, just. <laughs> it was meant to wake you up. <laughs> okay, what is a disaster? What is a process? What is a process automation? Is you have to carry out a certain number of activities to accomplish certain goals. A very simple example: you go to an ATM machine and you want to withdraw money and you have to press number of buttons, and you have to follow certain procedure, and this is what we call a process. And process, in our case, most of the time, traditionally executed by humans, we try to automate these processes. So it is maybe a different way of looking at disasters. And for example, uh, data gathering, of course, many people do that. Uh, also, simulation is complementary, but we try to also detect what has happened, and then starting tasks. For example, task generation for us is to determine the number of uh, uh, teams uh, for firefighters or ambulances, rescue teams, to compute them automatically by uh, the help of machines and to optimize them. For example, if there are no re enough resources, you try to uh, compromise in the best way. So. Um, by this way, uh, you can, of course, uh, take over uh, difficult tasks, like managing so many things are happening when a large disaster occurs, and we try to automate them and do them in the best way. And while you are doing, we are using a lot of techniques, of course, including AI, but this way of looking at problems probably is somehow different, but not only, of course, uh, traditional uh, intervention activities, but also evacuation and protection, distribution of aid goods. So we look at the problem from the perspective of processes. And what does it mean? This is uh, maybe not very well understandable, but okay. So we have a platform to support this. Platform should support is a model of the environment. It's a, what we call digital twin but we have a lot of event buffers. That means you have to detect certain events that are happening, and then you start, for example, uh, the, the, the related task accordingly. So the tasks are started automatically when certain events occur. So therefore, for everything, any process, I say it here, there are input events to wake up the, the, the process, and then you carry out the actions, and there are output events, which means probably completion of the task. And we have a process control software to check if event is, uh, if the process is executed in the right way. So the whole system, we look and we structure the architecture not from the perspective of data. Data is important because you have to, of course, use these data in the processes, but also the events, dynamic occurrence of all kind of activities. So we think that this is uh, necessary to deal with the complexity of disaster management. So uh, the first question that immediately you have, this is our publication, in order to steer the processes, you need to define the 
like you see here, process control means that you need to be able to measure the activity performance. So we are also putting a lot of uh, monitors everywhere per, actually, per uh, process to measure if the process is executed in an efficient, effective way. Therefore, you need to define key performance indicators for every processes and then uh, monitor it. So it's actually an active control system, large platform distributed over many machines, mm, taking data and acting immediately. So it's not offline, it's online system like a large communication system where we, uh, uh, for every task we run, and execute it. And when we look at the, this, traditional data-oriented architectures are like web servers. Our case, our abstraction is actually automation of tasks. Therefore, our data needs are determined by the operations that you want to automate. So what kind of operations? And therefore, you need to collect extra information like performance, online performance of activities. Therefore, for example, we track, we track all the intervention activities online and record them and see. And of course, it brings all kinds of complications because if, if, if the plant is different from the actual cases, then, um, uh, then uh, you have to maybe reschedule. So basically, a task automation is mainly a resource allocation problem and optimization problem, and you have two basic problems in consistency management and conflict management. Okay, so here actually I'm talking about uh, three digital twins. Uh, in order to share events and, and uh, all kinds of things like that, you need all kind of automicity. That means that everybody should see the same event in the same way. If you, if you are not co co uh, Careful, the system may be inconsistent. Okay, so the, oh, I'm sorry again. <laughs> Time to wake up. <laughs> I, uh, there should be a way to put it on. My computer is so silent. All right, so these are the questions I have. I think my six minutes is over already. <laughs> uh, is it tough? So Did you? Yeah, we are yeah. conscious about time. Okay. Let's, uh, move on. So these are the questions I have. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, this one. Uh, I'm sorry. Next. Next, we welcome Ansley. Hi everyone, my name is Ainsley Johnson and I'm a data journalist at The Economist magazine. And today I'm going to talk about how uh, we at The Economist, uh, some sort of rules of thumb or um, principles that we use when we're communicating insights from data. So every week uh, our team produces a page for the magazine, normally it's on the second to last page, uh, it's also online, um, a story data-driven story, normally based on the news or on a topic that people are interested in um, at the moment. And we're effectively just trying to tell a story uh, with data, which I'm sure is something that a lot of you have experience with, with talking about your papers um, in public. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, some sort of rules that we use uh, when we're doing that, sort of focusing on this one uh, project that I worked on back in February uh, in collaboration with an academic at UCL uh, called Ollie Ballinger, which is this middle uh, project here, uh, looking at damage after the earthquake in Turkey. So in this project, we were using uh, satellite remote sensing or to detect damage to buildings in Turkey, and we're specifically interested in looking at whether buildings in sort of poorer parts of town and poorer neighborhoods that may have um, less uh, sort of building regulations uh, were more impacted by the earthquake. So yeah, the principles I'm just going to talk about, just to give a little overview, are getting people's attention, keeping it simple, and giving people context. 
So whenever you're telling a story, I always think about it as if you're trying to compete for the attention of this person, listener, or reader against every other million possible things that this person could be paying attention to. And in that sense, I think often data journalism can have a bit of a, or data stories can have a bit of an edge over regular stories in that you can make completely unique images that tell your story in a captivating and beautiful way. So in this case, we had, uh, we sort of led the story with this big map here. Um, it sort of had two roles. It kind of orientates people to, to sort of what the story is gonna be about. You can see a little map here of, of where we are um, in the world. Um, it's visually interesting and it has a lot of, you know, details on it that people can get lost on, but just from looking at it alone, um, it sort of draws people in. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to make good maps and charts, how to make them beautiful, and how to make them interesting to people. Uh, the next thing we do to try and really grab people's attention is to immediately tell them what they're gonna be taking away from reading this story. So what is the one takeaway point that they're gonna leave the story for sure with? Uh, we often put it in the title, so in this case, it was that poor areas suffered three and a half times more damage in Turkey's earthquake. And we often try and see if we can show this in a chart. So that's, you know, can really help people to sort of see that this message that we're communicating to them, they can actually see it for themselves in the data. So here we have just this simple line chart, a simple scatter uh, diagram where you can see that uh, areas that suffered more damage tended to be cheaper, uh, cheaper real estate per meter square. The other thing is about keeping people's attention. Typically when we're writing stories, we get the important information in first and then gradually add more detail as we go through. So in academia, I think often uh, caveats come in up top, but in journalism, we, we normally keep them to the end. We find that they kind of lose people. People sort of lose interest if they, they see all of these um, sort of modifiers. Generally what we'll do is, of course the caveats are really important, we'll use words like may or could just to signify a bit of uncertainty or some conditions surrounding this conclusion uh, up at the beginning and then leave the caveats to the end. The next thing is to keep it simple. Um, that's in charts and in text. So remove any clutter from the charts. You don't need loads of uh, axis labels. You don't need labels for every point. Um, you can use color or emphasis to highlight important data points. So here we have a couple of outliers. We generally annotate things rather than using keys. And here we have another little bit of annotation to sort of guide people how they should be interpreting this, this chart. Uh, the, uh, yeah, over here, more damage. Uh, we tend to prefer showing raw data over residuals from lack like, of an analysis. If people Raw data is just easier for people to understand. It requires less explanation. Uh, in this case, this is actually a, a, a residual plot. This is uh, some results of analysis. Um, this is probably at the upper end of complexity for what we would show. But as you can see, rather than write, this is the results of some complicated residual, some complicated analysis, we've kind of tried to use simple language to just explain exactly what these numbers show. So these, this is the share of buildings that are probably damaged, I'll explain what that is in a second, compared with expected based on the average building footprint. Just try to think of more intuitive ways to phrase um, your analysis. The final thing is to give context to your results. So um, try to express things rather than just in raw numbers, try and give them comparisons. So for example, if you're talking about a large area, give that in comparison to a country or a state or something that people will know. Um, the general public are not interested in p-values, but they are interested in effect sizes. So forget about writing about significance, instead focus on how big is the effect and find easy ways that you can describe that to people. So here we're describing it as uh, the share of um, buildings that are damaged in areas with expensive, most expensive homes and the areas with the cheapest ones. The final thing is uncertainty, which I'm sure is something uh, a lot of people here deal with um, in their papers and analysis. Um, it's really important and we don't shy away from it. We just try to display it and talk about it in an intuitive way. So we'll have error bars on our charts, but we'll explain what they mean. Uh, particularly uh, in this example, um, 
these different colored buildings are, uh, that's based on like a probability, that's based on a threshold uh, level of significance from some analysis. But rather than try and explain that, we just get rid of all of that information and just say sort of intuitive terms people can understand, possibly damaged or probably damaged. So yeah, those are some very quick principles of data storytelling that we use at The Economist. Get people's attention, keep it simple, and give it context. Thanks. Next, Sam. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here today. Who in this room uses climate data in their daily lives or in their research? Okay, good, good handful. And who's heard of the Copernicus Climate Change Service? Oh, this is great. All right, well, I don't need to speak then. Fantastic. Anyway, so. I love what I do, and I'm very excited about what I do. So hopefully I can express some of this enthusiasm in this talk. So on the left here, you have a, one of the most famous Im images of our planet. So it's the NASA Apollo 17 image taken in 1972. On the right is the recreation of that with ECMWF's ERA-5 reanalysis. So right now, our, as, as Saman mentioned in his introduction, our planet is more observed than it has ever been before. What this means is with numerical weather prediction and data assimilation, we can recreate what those astronauts saw 50 years ago. And that is cool. There's no other way of looking at it. So C3S, the Copernicus Climate Change Service, is a service funded by the European Union to give society free access to climate data. So we cover all time periods of climate data. We cover the past in terms of direct observations, so in situ observations from the atmosphere, from the land, and from the ocean. And of course, satellite information, because we're funded uh, by the satellite program or by the Copernicus program, which is uh, Europe's eyes on Earth. In addition to these observations, we also have reanalysis. And reanalysis uh, is effectively our maps without gaps. So it combines a numerical weather prediction with uh, observations that are assimilated into that model. And our era five goes back to 1940. So we have a coherent gridded product that can show you anywhere in the world what the weather was like any hour of the day. Uh, we then have seasonal predictions and climate predictions. So seasonal predictions or, or climate predictions are looking at the, the next forecast, so what's this summer going to be like? And of course, climate projections are the same data that the IPCC used in the recent sixth assessment report. Um, so what this means is, and not only do we have access to data, and open access is extraordinarily important. I don't have time in my six minutes to bang on about how important open access is, and that's how we remove borders, by giving people access to the data so they can recreate all these exciting maps and figures themselves. But this is a storm that impacted um, Spain and Portugal in 1941. So through era five, going back to the 1940s, it means we can recreate a storm that we only have newspaper archive evidence and you know, notes in, in articles and in people's journals of the damage that this storm caused. But with reanalysis, we can go back through time and really understand what the weather system was like that caused that damage. And again, that's really cool. So as I mentioned, this is a um, reanalysis provides maps without gaps. Our global product goes back to 1940. We have a bunch of other prod products that are much higher resolution. So our Arctic reanalysis is two and a half kilometers. Um, these are all close to real time, so five days behind real time for era five in particular. And they can be used to analyze extreme events, um, such as you see here on this screen. Um, it's incredibly well used in the scientific community. So the methods paper that was published in 2020 on how ERA-5 was developed is already got 6,500 uh, citations, which 
really shows the value add to the scientific community and the world at large of how useful reanalysis is. So the part of C3S that I lead is climate monitoring. So we do a bunch of things. Our graphs normally aren't nearly as pretty as what the economists can produce, but, but we do our best with our scientific limitations. Um, and this is one of the figures that we showed from the European State of the Climate Report that was published in April last year, uh, sorry, April this year, covering last year's weather. And 2022 was a really interesting year. It was the fifth warmest year on record, second warmest year on record for Europe, and warmest summer on record. What this means, to distill it to what people can get out of it, is Europeans were under more heat stress last year than ever before. We had 16,000 excess deaths in Europe last year due to heat stress. So by giving people access to this information, we can't prevent those 16,000 deaths that have already happened, but we can ensure that authorities are working with national meteorological agencies, working together to provide those warnings in place to pr protect the most vulnerable elements of society. Another really nice example of using our data this is by a international organization that's just down the road from us in our Bonn office, so the International Renewable Energy Agency. They've used ERA-5. Um, so ERA-5 has hundreds of different variables. They've used two variables, uh, solar radiation or radiation, um, to understand uh, photovoltaic potential and wind probably at both 10 meters and 100 meters. What they've done is they've then mapped for every single country in Africa where the placement of renewable energy location should be based on the cheapest location. The um, resolution and, um, is based on our data, particularly from a temporal perspective, but they also found for things like solar, most places are as sunny as each other. So what matters most is the proximity to the electrical grid. So you don't have the opportunity for power failures between where you're capturing the radiation and then trying to give it out to the community. So hopefully I'm still in time, the alarm hasn't gone off, but open data <laughs> really enables better decisions to be made. And we're at a really exciting time with machine learning, with artificial intelligence. We know, for example, that all of the machine learning models, weather models that Google and everyone else has put out, they've been trained on ERA-5. So this is a free use that, you know, multi mega billion organizations are leveraging our free and open products to give more information out for free but where we're about to enter an information revolution so hopefully we will see better management of disasters in the future through more open access data thank you very much thank you so much last but not least let's welcome summer for the last open talk. Okay, uh, I will try to um, talk about this relationship in six minutes. I will try to say uh, how AI loves data without borders. I only give one example, but of course, that's the recovery assessment. How, how I used AI and machine learning for uh, the recovery assessment. So, just to start with a very basic explanation of what is AI, machine learning, and how they differ from each other. You may already know, but to clarify this, AI is a broad concept, but machine learning is a branch of a branch of AI, which is a, uh, actually try to study of computer algorithms that allow computer programs, programs to automatically improve through experience. That's it. Just learning and from our exp from its experience that this experience will come from the data. Deep learning is uh, something is a more advanced. Let's call yeah, we can call it more advanced. But it's mimic of the human brain, and it is somehow the state of the art now. But what is very important here, um, first of all, when I say AI, it refers to machine learning in, our, in my time, because AI is a broad concept, but why, uh, what I call AI now here refers to machine learning. 
What is super important for us, you don't have to be a computer scientist or AI scientist. You should know that machine learning and deep learning methods are mostly used to process data in an automatic manner to extract insights and knowledge. That's it. No, there isn't any magic there. So we just develop methods and algorithms to automatically. So why automatically? Because it can be quickly. You know, in the satellites, uh, we can use it for uh, automatically just extract the building damage. Is, we should assess the accuracy, but you know, in general, we can use this. So, just one example I give here that I propose to use a deep learning based method for post disaster building database updating fully automatically, hopefully. I'm not going to in detail. Just saying that, mentioning that I used uh, crowdsource uh, data called OpenStreetMap to automatically provide training data to train the deep learning method, and finally come out with the result of building footprints or with building footprints we can actually update the previous ones. So it's important first of all after the disaster to find out the extent of the damage, so we can extract the damaged buildings, we can also classify the, the type of the damages, severe one, medium, or just slightly damaged. And also we should look at the reconstruction process and in the recovery, if uh, some buildings are recovered, newly buildings are reconstructed or not. But what is important here, we need different data to train the model. It is perfect in this paper, and we say that we achieve the accuracy of more than 85%. But no, it's not that good. It's specific for that local area. It's in the Philippines. If you just pick it up and use it in somewhere else, in the, I, I mean in Vietnam, even in, within the Philippines, if you go to other areas, it is not going to work. You know why? Because we didn't have with data, the rate of data, amount of data to train the model. This is one of the reasons. Of course, it also depends on the method itself, but one of the problems is not having the good data to train the model. For example, here, uh, I mentioned that we achieved more than 85% accuracy in detecting the damages and also detecting the newly built buildings and finally update the building database. But just look at the uh, areas denoted by uh, yellow ovals and circles. You can see that uh, here, of course, the uh, blue areas, the ones are that false positive. There are buildings that the method should detect them, but couldn't. So, looking at the, a bit in detail, maybe it's not really uh, clearly been seen here, but they are a bit similar that our method couldn't catch them. Why? When, when I go back and look at this again after publishing this, I just realized that because we didn't have the good amount of data for such structures to train the model. So if we have such data, data without borders, in terms of types, in terms of size, in terms of the, I don't know, uh, colors, then we can train the model achieve more accuracies. Nowadays, why ChatGPT is doing well? Because it's trained in all the data that we have in the internet. So it could be the same here. So it is essential to have data without borders. But the main question again, if we have data without borders, then we have a very good machine learning model. Can we, after all, trust AI and this model, even without data, even with data without borders? Not really, because in deep learning and machine learning methods, there are black box, there are black box inherently, and we don't know how they do these decisions and finally come with the solution. But nowadays with explainable AI, we are trying to address these issues as well. That's it, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for all our panelists. Now let's start our panel discussion.
Европейский сети. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, so now let's uh, get started with our panel discussion. So first, uh, this is a question for our, for our Earth. So the theme of this session is that data without borders. So what do borders mean to you? What are the implications for us in terms of um, addressing global challenges? Yeah, if, if I start, um, for me, borders mean barriers. Um, so it's barriers to, to understand and, and leverage the, the information available. Um, because I, I'm not dealing directly with disaster risk reduction, it is not about physical borders, but, but I guess unphysical barriers. Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, I'm not always working on projects related to disasters, but um, yeah, for me, again, it, it, it's, it's barriers. It's often uh, barriers to, to make my work more difficult. Um, a lot of what we're doing in data journalism is very responsive. Um, we're covering topics that people that are in the news and we, we really need to cover them quickly because that's you know, when they're interesting and when, um, when people want to, to read about them. Um, and yeah, it, borders and data are, are a constant problem for me. I mean, trying to merge data sets with the, from data across different countries together, from data through time that has perhaps different methodologies. It's, um, yeah, it's just, it's challenges for me. Okay, so what I think, borders are three kinds. One is uh, physical borders because you don't have access. And we see a lot in commercial organizations, they, they are very protective. And this is what I would call physical borders. Other kind of border, maybe uh, because we don't have really agreement or standardization, and therefore it is somehow difficult to access. So there are borders due to uh, non, non standardization, let's say. And the third one is probably borders without, uh, because of ignorance, let's say. Uh, for example, in the process automation approach, we realize that many data are not kept because there are very few process automation uh, approaches defined. So therefore many data are not collected because we don't know really what kind of data we should collect always. Especially if you have a new system, you want to have a, a new kind of information that may not be available. So according to me, three kind, physical, non-standardization and lack of ignorance, you could call it maybe, but because of technological progresses, we may not always know what kind of data we need tomorrow, let's say. Yeah, uh, I do agree with all of you. Actually, the borders are limitations, barriers. Um, yeah, again, it, it, it could be uh, physical, uh, at least if you start from the physical ones, I guess. Uh, I'm going to also challenging if we are in favor of data without borders or not. Uh, do we uh, need to actually have borders or it's not good to have borders? You know, uh, I can give an example of uh, fake data. You know, now AI produce deep fakes. And now they entered, uh, also they are producing deep I'm pretty sure they're going now to produce deep fake maps for disaster. So do we need actually borders or we should just completely, on a, I don't know, uh, look at this data without borders and challenge this or address this problem from other perspective rather than uh, providing some limitations to them. 
Thanks for all these excellent ideas and your understanding of uh, data and borders. Next, uh, we will go into a more specific topic, digital twins. That's a term that has been brought up again and again these days, especially in uh, some talk. You also talked about this uh, digital twin of our Earth for us to better understand today's climate. So how can we use digital twins to break the barriers and improve our understanding of our world? So I think first and foremost, um, one of the misconceptions that I come across is that the, the digital twin will replicate reality and there will still be uncertainty, there will still be bias corrections that need to occur, there will still need to be documentation of what's been done to understand whether you can trust it or not. So I think digital twins enable us to get a higher resolution than we've ever had before, and this is due to, to machine learning and deep learning, but we still need to understand how they add data. They, they add petabytes of uh, information, well, of data, but how do you transition that data into information that's useful for society? And I think, and this is where, where I see it quite a lot, is this distillation of turning data. You know, if, if you download the, the ERA-5 data set, and I've, I've lost track of the number of conversations I've had with, with journalists in particular, but with, um, you know, policymakers, whoever, and we've said our, our data is freely available for you to download, and they, they don't have the data literacy to be able to do anything with it. So that's where a lot of the work that we do, um, and I, I challenge Saman's point actually, for me it's about trust. You have to trust the source of the data. So for us, for C3S, we're funded by the European Union, so we feel we're an authoritative voice of climate data. And I think as educated individuals, you need to trust where you're getting your data and information from and ensure that it's a reliable, reputable source and that you understand how they've treated the data and that you can recreate it yourself. So I think digital twins will be a game changer, particularly on this topic, but I think we also need to build that trust in, in the outputs of those digital twins to verify that they're better and providing better and more information than what we have right now. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, digital twins are not something I really ever work with, but, uh, well, I mean, I suppose in working with sort of the data from uh, ERA-5 data, I suppose I am. But uh, I think what I would say to that from a sort of journalistic point of view is um, I think that there can be skepticism sometimes from people about, um, you know, like modeling results or sort of uh, simulations. and. Uh, I think that there's obviously, I mean, there's so much that, that these models can add uh, to, to our knowledge, and I think it's just very important for people to um, understand sort of how they work, understand their limitations, um, and for that to be explained in a way that is not intimidating and not going to just put people off and, and make them uh, disinterested. Um, and yeah, and, and another thing actually was, was Salman was talking about, I suppose, this sort of links into, you know, um, fake data and data that is produced that's, you know, um, like you're saying, these, these sort of deep fake uh, types of information. Um, I think another, uh, I think a, a sort of growing role for the media, and as seeing it a lot, particularly through the Ukraine war, is doing, um, you know, having people on the team who are real specialists in, in this kind of information and people who can go through and bring together you know say uh, I'm thinking for example about uh, you know fake or videos that um, online of destruction or bodies on the streets in parts of Ukraine and um, a lot of journalists are using now satellite data from independent sources sort of bringing together you know data from um, from say uh, open sources but also data from companies like Maxar and Planet to, to try and um, sort of match this up with other sources of information to try and, um, you know, see whether they, they fit and try and verify this information. So I think that, I think that it's a concern, of course, um, but I think that people will always have ways to, uh, you know, just through multiple sort of points of triangulation verify whether information is, 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 um, is fake or real. 
Okay, so I think digital, if you focus on digital twin, the digital twin is very important uh, to set, to, to, to remove the borders. So we, we have a basis then if you have a digital twin, but we need to have a, a measure of accuracy and preciseness. So the, the data, uh, so it's also a mathematical problem or, sorry, we need a, a digital twin is essential, but we, we need to have uh, measure on preciseness and accuracy, and this will give us a, a, a trust somehow. So this will give us a trust. But a digital twin means also modeling. So modeling means also uh, definition of standards and the syntax and semantics. So therefore, we have to also agree on all these. And if we have models, models must be multifaceted. So you cannot have one single model for everything. So it means multiple views. So you have to define different views on the model. And uh, of course, if you have multiple views, then you need to have consistency among the views. So it's like in every uh, scientific progress we have is modeling has these challenges. But also, uh, in my ex experience, uh, we need also uh, some, if we talk about multifaceted modeling, and uh, then we need also dynamic information, changing information, online information. Uh, so digital twin is not easy to design as we hope, but it is the right way and uh, like in any science, uh, I think we should progress on that direction to remove the borders. Okay, what is digital twin? Do you know? Just raise your hand. Okay, let me explain what is digital twin. Uh, I'm not going in details. Digital twin uh, starts with data collection, then processing the data, then simulating all the uh, physical objects or the systems that we are aiming to actually model them, then use the outcome with you know, uh, testing different scenarios. It looks like a conventional simulation model, isn't it? But how it differs from the other one is that it should be dynamically updated with a, let's say, real-time data stream and real-time data processing. So you can just now understand how it is important. But from first step to the last one, we all engage with the data. Collecting data, pre-processing data, using data as information to simulate the environment, then also finalize it by uh, using the output. And the important part is to do some interventions. And we can using this information in disaster connect context to, uh, let's say, uh, informed decision making. So uh, if we have more data, then we can more precisely develop a digital twin. Actually, we can more precisely model the system or the object, whatever we are looking at. And it, it has really very good impression. You know, whatever you are going to do, it's brilliant. You know, just establishing a digital twin. I, I, I think that myself, it's what we need for uh, optimizing the efforts in disaster risk reduction. Uh, also, there was another uh, uh, part in deepfake. We already have some suggestions how we can uh, address this. You know, we need to, uh, I don't know if you still, if you also look at as journalists, the data are coming, what is the source of the data? Don't, then we need to look at the data sources, if we can trust them or not. Excellent, we can do that, but still there are some challenges. Yeah, thanks for the sharing. It's um, really exciting to learn the advancement of digital twins and uh, how this important tool can be applied in various aspects to improve our life. And um, we just uh, embarked on this uh, important topic, AI, and also deepfake, as uh, some mentioned. And uh, I don't know the panelists here have interaction with ChatGPT or not. That's a cliche these days, but. Uh, we are really concerned 
about uh, the, uh, its quality? The answer they give us are they trustful. So how do we deal with the ethics issues related to AI and all these kind of beta-based tools? I'd like to hear your thoughts. So in our case, research, um, AI be used uh, not as a big monolithic block, but uh, wherever there are problems of uncertainty. So AI, as you, as you also formulated, it's a continuous, in our case, it's continuously active. It's continuous learning, continuously improving. So on all uh, decisions you make, where uh, there is uncertainty, we build uh, learning systems. And it can be deep learning or it can be as simple as statistical learning, depending on the problem. We use these to remove uncertainty. So for example, very good that you summarize digital uh, twin. Digital twin is a reference model we have. And there we try to co gather information, interpret and understand but also we use digital twin to track online activities like intervention. And there are many cases where we cannot precisely determine the parameters. There we apply AI techniques to learn. And for us, it is more like problem solving way of reducing uncertainty. But if you, I think my opinion is that if you don't know what you want to do, AI cannot help you. So in our case, it is for reducing uncertainty in uh, digital twins, you may call it. Uh, with regard to uncertainty, I mentioned even if you have a very good deep learning model and it, sh it looks like that it works well, we cannot trust that model even because we don't know how it makes decisions what is the reason behind of that decision has been made? And what are the characteristics, what are the properties, what are the indicators that it used to make this decision? Okay, nowadays there are plenty of publications, researchers that's doing their research and say that, okay, we developed a new deep learning model. In this case study, uh, we can detect the building damages with more, you know, above 90% accuracy. I challenge them if they can, you know, prove that their model will work in other locations as well or in other, you know, type of disaster. For example, if you train your model to detect the damages to buildings uh, in an earthquake scenario, it will not work most probably for the typhoon case study. So there are so many uncertainties. Even within digital twin, we need to use machine learning because we need to process the data very quickly because we call it the uh, real-time modeling. For real-time modeling, we should do all the processes very quickly and have the automation in processing. So we need machine learning models to quickly process the data for a large scale study area. So we definitely need them, but we need to tackle them and recently more works are coming up for in explainable AI. How we can explain how that model just made decision. Or we can, um, we may also develop methods inherently can be explained, you know, based on the uh, algorithms that we can provide. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, AI is something that we uh, use different ways, um, just generally. I think it's very useful for coding, uh, particularly regex functions. I don't know if anyone ever uses them. They're a nightmare. And uh, ChatGPT can just tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we also use AI sometimes. Um, I mean, this is maybe very relevant to, to the topic of the um, topic of the panel, uh, to, you know, to, to fill in data that we don't know we don't know what, what the data point is um, there. So one a big example that 
our team has been working on for, for a long time um, is uh, sort of quite unrelated to, to sort of natural disasters, but um, still disasters, uh, is a model to predict the excess deaths um, from COVID-19. So their um, countries throughout the pandemic were publishing death figures. Um, but really what is important is, is the excess deaths. So not just the deaths that were attributed to COVID where people had had a test, but deaths that were far higher than normal um, and that were probably directly or indirectly related to, to COVID. Um, and countries were publishing these excess death figures, but you know, mainly um, sometimes by a yearly basis, some countries um, weren't publishing them at all. Uh, so a few members of our team built a, uh, a machine learning model to take the known data that we had uh, from countries that were publishing excess death figures regularly and trying to train it. It was a complete black, black box, it is a complete black box, but um, feeding it in information about cases and um, you know, environmental conditions, basically anything and everything, and using it to predict for the places that we did not have data for how many deaths we might have expected in, in those places. And um, we used it to, to get an estimate of the, the true death toll of the pandemic. And I think in those sorts of cases, of course, um, you know, this is a very, very specific problem. And um, I, can, I can completely understand what, you, what you're saying that, you know, having it as a black box, in some ways it's quite limiting. I mean, with that, we don't really know what it is, what are the exact parameters that are driving these predictions. Um, but there's no other way to, to get predictions of, of this. I mean, without throwing in a lot of our assumptions about uh, what are the, the factors driving excess deaths. And I think, um, yeah, to, to me, that's, that really adds a lot of value. If, if I may add something there. Yes, please. So uh, deep, deep learning is typical, of course, it's more black box. In our case, we have small AIs, let's say, machine learning algorithms. Uh, when there is a control parameter that you cannot determine, so uh, what we do it in the feedback in the loop. So, uh, for example, you say, is the parameter 0 0.5 or 0 0.6? Then uh, we try to, uh, when we adjust it to 0 0.5 to 6, and then we apply it in the real control case, then we measure immediately parameters if there is improvement. So in the feedback in the loop, sometimes very simple machine learning, by the way, not no need to be complicated. Then we try to get uh, with feedback if the indeed new, newly learned parameters are uh, better. But of course, if you have a large image and you do deep learning and this kind of processes, it, it's not applicable, this kind of control schemes. But if you are, for example, directing uh, ambulances, firefighters, and so on, and then you apply certain strategy to bring them to where you need, and there you may have small adjustment by AI. So AI, machine learning is, of course, include many different kinds. In our case, in feedback control mechanisms, you may have a measure of the success. But of course, many times you try these things also in simulations to see if you can improve. Uh, so, uh, but it doesn't work for large, big images, as you pointed out. So there may be techniques where you can use AI in smaller scales to optimize the online going processes. So I'm sorry about the checking in here. I'd like to challenge you a bit okay. from uh, the perspective and the physical climate modeler. Mm -hmm. So we know like these days, especially in the past several months, we've been seeing a bunch of uh, deep learning based uh, yep. numerical prediction models. They all claim to outperform the ones in your agency, uh, UCMWF. They do claim that. Yes. So which made me very worrying. Will I lose my job? What's the answer from UCMWF? So I, well, I can't answer for your direct circumstances because I'm not as familiar with your research as perhaps I could be. Um, but the, so we have done a analysis. So we've invited all of the um, machine learning weather models in to give a presentation to ECMWF. 
and then we've directly compared their scores uh, with the ECMWF multi-model ensemble. So um, for those of you who aren't as familiar, perhaps, as um, uh, Ting and I with weather prediction, so it's not just one model. It's um, for ECMWF, we run a ensemble of 100 members. And so we, we're looking at the distribution of uh, everything within those 100 members to understand the statistics of probabilities of particular weather events. And where uh, we find the biggest divergence between machine learning models and our model that is you know, developed by scientists and, and based on the laws of physics is if you talk about mean state weather, then they're, they're fairly comparable. If you talk about extreme state weather, then the ECMWF model normally edges out over most of the, most but not all, of the extreme weather events that we've interrogated, the, the ECMWF model is more accurate at defining the hurricane track, for example, than the machine learning model. But I think we do need to adapt as well. And I think machine learning is here to stay. So how do we build it in so that we can improve our resolution, improve our or reduce our uncertainty, make sure that data is accessible to the people who need it, but trusted as well, so that it is not uh, coming from a black box that people then don't know, particularly if they're relying on it, whether it is a true representation of what has happened or what will happen. And I think we're, we're not there yet, but we will be in the next decade. So we definitely need to adapt and evolve, bring in these new techniques and, and improve what we're doing alongside mm -hmm. the automated process. But I, I, I don't think meteorologists are going to lose their job in the next decade or two. I'm not so sure now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, since we are here also talking about um, data, especially breaking the, the barriers, with AR, with all these tools, let's uh, shift the topic a little bit to the open science. How are we really moving our data science towards the open side to break all the barriers? What are your experiences and thoughts for the future? Um, yeah, so this is something I think about quite a lot um, and it is one of my favorite topics as well. I, for me, open science is a game changer. Um, and, and now I'm kind of, well, I'm also in the luxurious position that if I am working with other scientists, you know, we have a general policy that we won't publish in journals that require subscription fees or page charges. We will only choose open access journals because I, I am funded by taxpayers and I feel like everyone should have access to the information that I'm producing. And I feel this is my personal philosophy, but I feel like any other scientist that's funded by taxpayers should also make this leap of faith to not chase the citation index of the journal, but to chase the, the open access, the accessibility of your data, of your expertise, to ensure it's relevant for society. And this will then change those impact factors in the future. So for me, it's critical, but I think the, the authority and the trusted source is also really critical. It's great that there's open source data everywhere. And you know, I get challenged all the time. We, we work with a media agency and they ask me to, to fact check things. And ultimately I don't have the time because it's normally some nutter on the internet who's grabbed a graph, cherry picked some data and gone, the curve is not what you say it is. And it's like, well, here's our data set. You can replot it directly from ours. Here are the other four international data sets that we use. You can replot it from theirs because they're open access. And that's the Met Office the NOAA, NASA, and the Japanese reanalysis as well. So you know, go for it, prove me wrong, but you know, it, you've got to choose your battles. And I think really relying on trusted open source and, and ensuring that the media also leverage trusted open source for their stories is really critical. Yeah, I mean, obviously from a, from a media point of view, it's great. If we can read your articles and we can see the data because it makes it so much easier for us to, to use. Um, but I guess one thing I, I will say is, I mean, it, it's so great and there is so much data available now, particularly on topics like climate and um, yeah, satellite imaging imagery for uh, looking at covering natural disasters. Um, but I, I 
there is definitely, and I don't think this is the fault of open science, and, and I don't really know how you get around this, there's, there's huge biases in what data is available. So, you know, a natural disaster in Europe is infinitely easier to cover than a natural disaster in Africa. Um, obviously, you know, satellites go over the whole world, but um, b basic things like you're talking about open street map, open street map, um, you know, if, if we're wanting to look at, say, mapping damage to, to buildings, um, the first place, that, the first story we ever did, which was sort of based on, on some of that work, was in Ukraine, and there was great coverage from OpenStreetMap. The next one we did was in Turkey, and it was far poorer. Um, and, you know, there, there are parts of the world where you just can't get good data. And um, often the places that do supply data uh, are not government bodies, it's not coming from EU grants, it's private companies that are collecting this data, and you know that's the only way that we can get a hold of it. So I think, of course, um, open science is great and amazing, but um, it sort of changes, you know, it, it's then kind of the, the choice of, um, it's the, the funders who are sort of deciding what, what's gonna be, what data they're gonna provide. Um, it, it just kind of shifts, it, it's almost a bit like, like with open, open publishing. Um, you know, rather than it being the libraries or, or individuals who are paying to view the material, it's the scientists themselves who are paying to, to have it out there. And it just changes a bit um, who, where the sort of motivation is coming from. And um, I think there's probably something that, that just needs to be thought about going forward to, to try and make, as we're discussing today, data without borders, where we have coverage, um, we, you know, we have data about uh, things we want to know for the whole world. So, um, I, I, I think uh, this is, uh, of course, this event now is a very good thing. Uh, so we are now discussing these issues, the borders and removing borders. I personally, I've been working on it as well. So I'm um, working on um, starting a, some sort of alliance, international alliance, and uh, currently uh, Malaysia uh, is part of it, uh, University of Malaya, and we have also interacted with the Malaya, Malaysian government. Uh, I also uh, had interactions with Brazil, uh, also uh, federal uh, government of Sao Paulo, uh, and uh, so they have uh, agreed on uh, starting discussions about setting up the rules and standards and uh, uh, so I hope, of course, I was uh, yesterday in University of Bristol. I talked to scientists there and uh, asked their opinion and help also to participate in uh, the movement which you have started here with this event. Um, so I think we should form some sort of alliance uh, from with different disciplines and we should start discussing how to uh, define the, how to remove borders, what kind of standards we need, how to how do we approach this problem. Uh, so uh, I I hope uh, in my from my case I will be very of course extremely happy if I could set up such an organization. Uh, we have already succeeded to some degree. Can I, we are also talking with Canada. Uh, I will be going next week to British Telecom uh, and I will discuss with them also the issue of removing borders. But in order to, of course, share data, share information, as I said in my first uh, statement, uh, we need to have, uh, we need to remove physical borders, but also we have to agree on the standards, let's say data architecture, and also uh, what we want to do with it. In particular, as I said, I'm interested in process automation and process automation may demand new kinds of data and very much online uh, data. Uh, so I hope uh, we come all together and form an alliance and make a statement to the world that how world should be and uh, start building on creating the world without borders, data without borders. So I think we really have to organize and somehow formally in some way. So for me, uh, it, it 
uh, let's say, study it starts with most of the cases with data collection, then data analysis, and the last part that most of the time is missing is sharing information. It's not only about open size or open publication. When we go to the disastrous areas and when we talk to them, collect information, doing some surveys and interviews, we should go back and share the results because they, are, they can also use the results. Of course, this is important to also share in open access, uh, also provide the data in open sources, but also going back to people who are not necessarily going to read the papers and share the information, share the results that they can use to improve their resiliency or decrease their vulnerability. But again, I agree with all of them that we should promote, actually we promote this at UCL and IRDR open uh, access publications. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks for the sharing about your understanding of uh, open science and uh, open data. Then um, we are really coming to an end uh, about this panel discussion. So I'd like uh, our panelists to use just a few sentences to summarize the data without the borders approach in your mind. If you'd like to like uh, summarize your approach in your work as data with about without borders, what is it? Um, so I think for me, ensuring that society has the ability to leverage data to make better decisions, that, that's a fundamental personal philosophy that I believe in. The challenge with that, or the challenges with that, are numerous. Um, one um, was mentioned just before, the, the north-south divide. Um, the, the Southern Hemisphere is ultimately much less observed and has much less um, uh, experts to take advantage of satellite infrastructure that is global right now. So capacity building, knowledge exchange is extraordinarily important to build that capacity for local people to make local decisions rather than international people or Northern Hemisphere people sharing data and expecting local local people to a understand it and b do something with it i think the the other challenge with open data is ensuring people understand the limitations of the data um, so a, a very short example um, we've had some you know lengthy conversations with a journalist in norway um, who pointed out that our data set, ERA 5, which is a gridded product, the grid size is 31 kilometers, was different from the weather station where he was living in Norway. And we were like, yes, it is different. This is a 31 kilometer grid and where you live is on the coastline. So our grid takes up a bit of ocean and a bit of land. And they, there is a, a differential, but it's well known, it's documented in our documentation, which we can refer to you in this you know, technical report, page number XX. But he didn't fundamentally understand the difference between a weather station and our data. So enabling people to understand how they can use the data, what the limitations are, is also part of the package of open data and removing those borders from using the data and using it in the right way. I'll stop there. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's just given me a bit of inspiration for what I'm going to say. Um, I think I would say, for me, data without borders would be um, being able to write the same stories and cover, uh, you know, the same sort of topics that I can in Europe. I would love to be able to cover them in Africa, in Asia, in every part of the world. Um, and right now, that's just not possible, in part because the data doesn't exist, but also because you know, we don't come out, we don't sort of come up with stories out of thin air. You know, we get, we get ideas from, from academics. Sometimes it's, we're writing about papers. Other times, you know, we get um, tip-offs from sort of local news organizations or we see other people's analysis on, on things and we work with them to build on that. And, you know, as you say, the expertise is, um, is very sort of, or what we see anyway, is very kind of Western, Northern centric. And um, yeah, I would love if, if we had sort of more access to stories from other places. So I agree with all your statements. 
my addition could be maybe I would say uh, let's have a, we should have a canonical agreement on this. So um, my opinion, okay, may be important, but not that, that important unless we have a canonical agreement from a multidisciplinary perspective. So I think if we accomplish that, then uh, life will be easier for us to influence or to be effective. So uh, I will have a meta statement that we should have a canonical agreement on open data and for this disaster management issues. Uh, and this should be multidisciplinary. So that's what I would say. Canonical means here by experts agreement on this issue. A yeah, thank you. That's great. So, there are so many things to say about data without borders. I just talk about from talk about it from AI perspective, and AI loves data without borders. As I mentioned, we need uh, much more data uh, in in terms of type. If you have different types of data. Um, in terms of amount of data, volume of data, um, looking at different locations, then we can provide, we can develop much more better, let's say, perfect uh, machine learning or AI-based models. So definitely we should remove the borders in, in any sense, but we should also have some control measurements to you know, address the challenges do not be really used it in a fake ones. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. So now we will leave the time to our audience for some uh, burning questions. Please, sir. I think it's on. Thank you for a great discussion. Um, I think many people have been starting to touch on, on this point a little bit, but you know, you, you've been talking about the importance of trust, the importance of open data, data without borders. And I think one of the um, phrases that, that I like to, or one of the people I like to borrow a phrase from when it comes to openness is, there's a philosopher in Cambridge called Onora O'Neill, and she talks about not the importance of openness, but the importance of intelligent transparency when it comes to openness, which I think touches a little bit on what Saman was saying about not necessarily need for regulation, but the need for you know thinking about some some of the issues that might come with with being fully um, transparent about these things. And and one of the um, ideas that she she says is important for intelligent openness is making information accessible, which comes down to uncertainties, both about uh, as, as you were saying about you know being transparent about statistical uncertainties, but also then the quality of the data as well. And I think I wonder whether the onus is on the data science community to some extent to start to develop some kind of scale that you can rate the quality of data that's coming out, like you have in in the medical community or some of the what work centres for rating um, you know quality of policy impact. Um, so I was just wondering if you could m maybe reflect a bit on what such a scale would, would look like, what, what, what the um, components of good quality data might be, you know, might it be consensus, might it be um, not being a black box decision making and, and so on. Um, I can start on that one. Um, I, I think there's a question at the back on the, the far end as well, if the microphone can make its way up there. Um, so for us, we um, have a, a, and it's one of the parts of the program that I lead, so we have an evaluation and quality assurance component to the program to enable users to trust, um, well, to effectively help them to choose a data set and to therefore trust why they're using that data set. Um, and this evaluation protocol is done by external scientists to us. So we, we run a contract which people competitively bid for, and we're going through the process of redefining it because the, the previous process was, was still quite convoluted. And it's a question when you're dealing with, so for us it's all climate data records, that often 
um, you know, when, when is a good climate data record? Ideally, you need at least 30 years, but for some sensors on satellites, there is new technology, so we don't have a 30-year reference period yet. We will, but not yet. So it, it shouldn't prevent people from making decisions now. But I think really enabling users to understand what the limitations are of the data set. And for me, that's much more important than uncertainty, because I think and, and I've had many conversations internally about, you know, many scientists like uncertainty is really important. And it's like, no one cares if it's 5% or 10%. It is mostly right, is mostly good most of the time. So let's focus on what people are trying to make a decision on and frame what we're, how we're providing data based on the decision that they're making when the 5 or 10%, whether it's 5% or 1%, doesn't matter. What matters is, you know, how much heat stress is there in Athens and what do they do about it because it's only going to get worse. So let's make sure that we're intelligently asking the question of what do users need and the, the answer is that, that that is an enormous spectrum and you can't possibly deliver everything. So I think it, it's co-creation as well as dialogue to ensure that you're working with the users of your data to understand what they need and you're developing it in a way that works for their requirements rather than thinking you know other people's requirements and then no one uses your data set because you didn't get it right. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> So, hi, my name is Lisa Danker and I'm a lecturer in global health here at IRDR. So my question is, how can we move towards a more ethical and moral, moral conversation on AI, data science and remote sensing, given that we're working in the, in the humanitarian sector? Because the work that we do affects humans, so although you may not be using human participant data, it does have an impact, so that's my question. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's actually also about, you know, trusting AI included. One of them is ethical AI. Uh, if we can, uh, again, have some controlled measures on AI, first of all, we should understand how this model is working. Then we can have some rules or regulations to control it, also in terms of ethics. So that's from my own perspective in AI, how we can do that. Are we doing that? No. Can we do that now? No. Maybe in the future. Yeah. Next. Shams? Yeah. Um, yeah I'm Shams uh, from IRDR. Fascinating uh, talk and the discussion so far. Shams, Shams. Wait for the mic. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the fascinating talks and the discussion so far. The word I was looking for throughout this session is validation. Because I think we can do a lot when we go without borders, but we probably cannot eliminate borders because we need borders, either physical or logical, because this is where we collect ground-based observations. And I think without validating our satellite data or simulation or AI-generated data with ground-based observations, no matter how fancy model we can develop, the ultimate impact will be questionable. So how do you go about validating data? Thank you. So uh, what we try to do is uh, data fusion. Uh, so collect information from multiple sources and try to, uh, of course, it depends on the kind of information uh, you have. So the more granularity of data collection is smaller, the more automation you have, the more sensors you have. For example, I'm now working in a, in a lab setting where about 45 different data sources, we try to uh, gather uh, and, and make it a data fusion. But in order to make data fusion successful, you have to define the objectives. And of course, it's a complicated stuff. But this, this is a way, I think, 
to increase the effectiveness of the uh, decisions you make. So that's one way, but uh, as I said, this is, in, in, is quite complicated because of many possible data sources and it's quite expensive. So our challenges, for example, limited to earthquakes at this moment, is we have four objectives to determine the damages done uh, to uh, find out where the living people are under the rubble, for example, to determine the coordinates, and uh, to make them affordable, reasonable price, cheap, and uh, the time. So uh, the question is to find out optimal composition of data sources uh, where you can satisfy these four objectives. Uh, and uh, also without, of course, you, when you collect information, you may uh, interfere with the privacy of people. So there are also laws that uh, make it sometimes difficult for you to get information. So uh, it is, uh, for us, is an optimization problem, uh, satisfying these four objectives. And so I'm working on actually synthesis, automatic synthesis of finding out the best composition of data sources to have maximum effectiveness and within the constraints as I specified. So that means probably a lot of sensors, a lot of data units everywhere. But then again, the problem of privacy comes to picture. So it is uh, trying to find your way in a constrained space of money, time, and uh, laws, privacy laws. But we are working on it. I think data fusion is the, the way we can, uh, you can try. So that's my way of working on it. OK, we are really conscious about time. So I'll leave the last question to our yeah, students. Just a quick one. Uh, I'm Shi Yijiang, the first year uh, PhD candidate of RDL. I just have a very quick question. Uh, for countries that uh, like uh, strong uh, data transparency, uh, besides collecting and utilizing data from the uh, reputable international organization or uh, third party research institution, what are other ways to uh, choose uh, trusted words and correct data? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll start. So I think um, if, they, so if they're publishing in open journals, if they're publishing the code that they've used to um, create any graphics or data visualization on GitHub, that gives you the automatic opportunity to, to try and recreate what they've done. And if you can recreate what they've done, and if you can use a complementary data set to prove the same thing, then you, you can probably add that data set to your um, volume of data sets with confidence. And I think um, I, I would also go with experience. So you're, you're in a fantastic institution with a, a lot of expertise. So also leveraging the expertise of others of, you know, you've got this particular problem wherever you're working in the world, where have those people found useful data sets and, and leveraging their network as well of, you know, have they been to that location? Do they know scientists there? Speaking directly to people who may be aware of different data sets than, than what we're aware of in the UK is also really important. Great, thank you. So to ramp up this uh, data session, ramp up our panel discussion, I'd also like to leverage some data science-based technique, GPT, to ramp up <laughs> this session, give you a few sentences to summarize today's uh, <laughs> okay. So this is what ChatGPT tells me. Okay, let me read that aloud. In summary, the panel discussed the implications of data borders in disaster reduction and the limitations they present. They also explored the potential of digital twins as a tool for addressing cross-border issues related to climate change and natural disasters. The importance of promoting open science and data sharing policies was highlighted while also acknowledging the need for rules and standards. The panel also discussed the potential threats posed by AI-generated fake data sets and the importance of collaboration among experts from different fields to create a more cohesive data without borders approach for addressing global issues like climate change. That's it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it uh, gives us some insight. Okay, uh, thank you all.
for our excellent panelists and uh, our audience in this room and online. Thank you so much for the support. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us for uh, the second and last panel this afternoon. So um, it has been a very um, long day of very interesting insights. And um, I'm very happy to chair uh, this uh, panel session on uh, scientists beyond borders. Uh, so before actually starting to talk about uh, this, um, uh, this panel session, I um, just want to first introduce ourselves to you. Uh, so uh, I am Fatemeh Jalayer. I'm a professor of geophysical hazard risks. Uh, I've joined uh, recently uh, UCL IRDR. And uh, together with me, I have our um, uh, wonderful panelists uh, for today. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce them, but then I will actually ask them to introduce themselves in a, a more uh, detailed way so that you can get to know their, them and their background. Uh, so uh, we're very pleased to have with us today uh, Dr. Carla Washburn. Uh, she's an associate uh, professor in environmental science and policy at uh, UCL. Um, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Haynes. Uh, who is uh, very, very soon actually is going to be a lecturer in uh, disaster and crisis response uh, with us at IRDR. So it is also a welcome to Dan. Uh, and uh, we have also, we are very pleased to have, it, to have with us uh, Dr. Anavat Supastri, who is a, an associate professor at uh, International um, International Research Institute of uh, Disaster Science, IRIDES, at University of Tohoku. And uh, we are really privileged to have Anavat with us since he's uh, right now visiting UCL and IRDR. And so it is great to have all of you with us uh, today. And uh, thank you, uh, the audience, uh, for, uh, for the attention. Um, so I'm just going to provide a brief introduction into the theme that we are covering in our discussion today and a little bit also about the format of this panel uh, discussion, which is going to be a little bit different with respect to the one uh, before. Um, so we talked a lot about um, the challenges we are facing uh, and you have all heard several times words such as um, the climate challenge, the environmental deterioration, uh, the, the disasters, uh, conflicts, and the crisis coming up during the day. And we also had the privilege of hearing various insights about um, different actors in this, like we talked about uh, we talked about uh, the law and legislation, we talked about um, the finances, we talked about humanitarian organizations, and uh, we, we also obviously talked about decision makers. A lot of times we also talked about politicians. So we, we really talked about different actors uh, in order to tackle these, uh, these problems. So um, it seemed to me, clearly, we discussed also um, oftentimes today the several boundaries and the several barriers that existed uh, in order for these actors to be really effective in order to tackle problems such as climate change, the disasters, crisis, and conflicts. And um, so clearly, we, were all, we are all thinking about the difficulties that exist and the, the common wish for us to come together and tackle these problems together. So um, it seems very uh, timely also for um, the conference today to, to kind of bring back the discussion to us as scientists, as researchers, I mean, of different fields, of different disciplines. So how can we help uh, in, in all of this? I mean, how can we provide some insights in trying to be, to be together and to tackle these problems to, together. Um, clearly, we also talked about the different boundaries that exist, and, and we talked about the boundaries of, like, of some sort of um, 
let's say, physical boundaries, your geographical boundaries, the historical ones, the, the cultural ones, the beliefs, uh, the, the linguistic ones, uh, the boundaries that are caused by inequalities of not everyone having access to the same kind of privileges. Um, so I can really talk and provide a very long list of, of boundaries that, that can divide us. So um, with that, I actually would like us to, to focus in our discussions today about what have we in common and how can we actually um, kind of make the most out of the sense of urgency that characterizes this moment because of many reasons we feel we are in an urgent moment we all of us somehow feel that we would like to contribute with our research in different ways and try to solve the many problems that we feel that kind of somehow the clock is ticking on them so um, with this uh, I would like to actually um, start our discussions, but first of all, a little bit about uh, how the panel discussion is organized. So um, I'm going to actually first ask our panelists to, to introduce themselves in their own words so that you also get a sense of uh, how uh, interdisciplinary our panel is, the different type of expertise that we have at the same table. Uh, so that we can look at the same problem from different angles. And uh, after this round of uh, introductions, uh, each one of our panelists is going to um, discuss like the several cases of where there has been boundaries or where boundaries have been actually been overcome, how scales have been overcome, and, uh, and after that, after each talk, we are going to have uh, questions from both the panelists and also from you. So that was just to give you an idea of how uh, the, the discussions are going to be organized. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to ask um, Dr. Carla Washburn to start giving, introducing herself. Thank you. Sure, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. So I am Carla Washburn. Um, at the moment, I am an associate professor at UCL. Um, but previously, my training was in uh, natural sciences, so earth science and engineering to start with. Um, I essentially lapsed a little bit from geotechnical engineering and geosciences into the policy space and really have worked at that interface ever since, I suppose. So the examples that I'm hoping to talk through uh, for just a short while uh, as an intervention to this panel are really in that space, their interfaces between uh, mostly environmental science and uh, Thank you, Carla. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan, can you listen to me? Thanks, Fatima. Um, yeah, I'm Dan. As Fatima kindly mentioned, I'm about to start here uh, a week on Monday as a lecturer in uh, disaster and crisis response. Uh, I'm currently at the University of Bristol in the history department, and by background and training, I'm an environmental historian, which simply put is the study of how humans and the natural environment have interacted in the past and how the two have influenced each other. And I tend to specialize on uh, modern South Asia, so India, Pakistan, a bit of Nepal uh, in the 20th century. Uh, and I've done a bit of interdisciplinary work with uh, geoscientists, uh, other kinds of environmental scientists, social scientists, NGOs, and policymakers. It's, it's big, big teams, uh, as we will discover, um, in Nepal and Bhutan. And I'm also the author of many, many, or rather co author of many failed bids for further funding to work with environmental scientists and social scientists in the Himalaya. Uh, so I'll be talking from the perspective of somebody who has, in some ways, a fairly traditional uh, disciplinary history background, but also trying to engage with the kind of big questions and mixed methods that you use here, here at IRDR. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Anna, please. Okay, thank you. Once again, thank you for in your invitation. It's my um, great honor to contribute to your um, annual conference while I'm visiting here. Um, our institute is actually just um, um, established one year after the 2011 tsunami, which is two years after IDR, and we are doing things inter interdisciplinarily. Uh, we have not only engineering and science, but also medical science and like history and um, yeah, so economies and things like that. Myself, um, civil engineering by training, and um, we, um, 
my focus is on all perfect perspectives of, of tsunamis. So, um, so like here in this panel, we have also people from science, as a science geologist. Um, we are doing tsunami deposit studies, and we are also working with um, history professor who is reading like difficult um, 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 old characters of, of Japanese. Uh, Japan, in Japanese, and also as an engineering, we are doing simulation. So we, we are doing this kind of interdisciplinary to, to fight against, for example, one big tsunami in the past. So so this kind of thing um, is, is really by nature. And for, for today, I would like to give um, you some idea using a tsunami as an example of the hazard that how um, international um, community, in, in tsunami community, how we, we work and we, how we continue, contribute to our research. Of society and resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, as a short um, introduction to uh, to Carlos' presentation, uh, I, I would like to actually um, um, dedicate some words to um, to the climate challenge. Um, it feels um, very global. I mean, we are all talking about it. We hear about it a lot. And um, clearly, uh, it is one of those things that seems to actually be some sort of a common language where all scientists somehow are, are from different angles uh, talking about. Um, but at the same time, the effects of it are quite local. I mean, in many ways, they are going to affect our lives, our personal lives, not necessarily our professional ones, but it's something that we have touched so um, it really seems fitting that any kind of um, activity that is going to start to look into solutions is going to actually cover different scales, like uh, starting from a global level to a regional level and then um, um, to, to the global um, actually scene. Um, another point is actually the interface, I mean, like talking about boundaries uh, that uh, exist, one boundary, which would be sort of like a, one of the biggest one for scientists is to actually breach the boundary towards policies, because clearly we would all want to make our work have an impact. And, um, and obviously, that boundary sometimes seems actually can also be a wall we might feel that we have difficulty in actually crossing that boundary. So um, it seems to me very fit and um, very uh, timely to have uh, Carla kind of talking about her work and how uh, this boundary between uh, science and policy can be overcome and how different scales can be uh, traveled uh, across. Uh, thank you, Carla. So maybe I help you to that. where I try to work out where to clip this bit. I might just put it down. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, I am going to speak, is it okay? As I say, I'm gonna speak a little bit about three examples of science policy interfaces on the environment. And I realize I gave a very, very brief introduction to myself, but hopefully this unpacks a bit um, of what I do day to day, to which the best description is it's complicated. Um, all of the work that I do, I say, is interfacing between different entities. And actually, I think this introduction was uh, was wonderful and sort of saved me a little bit from going too much into the definition that I was going to give on science policy interfaces. Uh, the reason I put this up, I think, was to remind me to say that science policy interfaces really talk about these relations between scientists and other actors in the policy process. But this is a variety of different actors. So the examples that I'm going to be giving are not just scientists interacting with parliament, legislatures, government, but interacting with lots of different actors who all interact within the environment that influences or influences the making of policy. So some of these are going to be a little bit more arm's length, and some are more directly, perhaps, with the people that you would think of when you think about policy makers. Um, but the idea behind these interfaces is they're places where there are exchange, there's co-evolution, there's co-construction of knowledge, 
Um, and the idea is that we enrich the decision making that comes out at the end of it. Um, really, these two definitions are saying very, very similar things, but I've included the second one because this does give a bit of sense of hopefully, hopefully still having a, some semblance of speed to this, so that actually these are processes which can hopefully operate at speed to get things done when there are very significant time pressures in taking action. Okay, so the three examples are going to kind of build from very local to uh, global scale. And I thought what would be quite nice is really just to walk through what these interfaces were, just give you a sense of uh, how they can constitute it, what they're supposed to do, uh, some of the challenges that exist within them. And then at the end, if I have time, and I'm gonna to try to have time, um, I'll talk quickly through some general kind of challenges and opportunities, because I know that was one of the, the framings for this session in particular. So at the smallest level, there's this entity called the Green Space City Lab for London. This is something that I helped to set up a few years ago now, um, in 2020, with the London National Park City Foundation, which I hope you've heard of, and if you haven't, please do look them up, just generally, because if you're based in London, they're wonderful and do amazing stuff uh, with promoting green space in the city. Um, it was a very small space, it was 20 to 30 people, and the reason it came to be was because I kept encountering people working in green space in London who all said, we don't have anywhere to talk about green space that's not a specific project or somewhere that I have to say a certain thing where I can just come in and say, here are all these problems, but here are all these great things, and actually, what can we do with this collectively? Um, so that's what this was. It was an informal space, a regular gathering of people working in and around this topic. Um, it was proximate to policy in the sense that there were people from the Greater London Authority, there were people from local authorities engaged, but this was everyone from arts practitioners, engineers, planners, landscape architects, um, and the policy makers in there as well. And as I say, it was as, as open-ended as that, really. We had a topic of shared interest around green space in London, making it better, but we didn't really set anything more prescriptive than that. And what was kind of great is that this did evolve over a number of meetings um, to develop ideas about making positive change in the city. So we do have some things that we've documented, uh, which I'm very happy to share, um, to do with actually how different entities can work together and actually mapping entities to get people um, knowing who's doing what in the city. But also just actually connecting those people who probably hadn't met before in this space. There were some challenges with this. The scope and the remit were problematic to set because it was so open-ended. We knew that we had a general sense of what we wanted to do, but it wasn't prescribed from the beginning. Part of the beauty that we co-developed it, but part of the challenge that it could kind of go anywhere and it was difficult to know what level of intervention uh, to give that. Time and resource commitment. This is gonna come up again for the next one. We were all just committing our time because we cared about the topic. We weren't being paid to do it. We were doing it um, kind of of our own volition. So that was a challenge. I think a lot of people working across science policy interface work aren't necessarily formally recognized, although it's improving um, for doing so. But also keeping momentum going of something like this, something that had that, that reason for being, um, took particular individuals and particular groups to push it forward. So I'm gonna say it's on hiatus right now because simply it's hard to keep momentum on something like that, but also because I think we did reach a consensus of we know who's in the room now, and actually we can come back to this when we have more questions or want more discussion. I'm gonna try and whip through the other two uh, very, very swiftly, because I took longer than I intended to on that, and please do cut me off <laughs> um, if, I'm, if I'm overrunning. Um, the second interface is at a kind of regional level, so this operates at a European level. It's an interface called Eclipse, uh, or the Eclipse Mechanism, as it was previously known. It has a core team of about 40 people, and um, it has more prescriptive aims and objectives than the previous examples. So this entity was established with European funding originally to answer questions from decision makers by synthesizing evidence um, and really kind of synthesizing the best knowledge available on biodiversity and ecosystems. There's a facilitation um, that takes place through a request process. So actually decision makers across Europe can make requests to Eclipse to say, we need evidence on X, are you able to help us with this? Um, and Eclipse will then go to people like myself, so there's my face along with some colleagues at the bottom here, um, who are part of the knowledge coordination body of this entity to say, can we? Actually, do we already know this? Um, do, you, do, you, you know, do you know that this evidence exists somewhere already? Are there materials that you can bring up for us? Or is this something that we need to do? 
if this is something that we need to do, we commission groups of experts to actually create um, these materials. And there is one soon to be hot off the press on biodiversity and pandemics. So this is often stuff that's very responsive to topics um, that are happening or have just happened at the time. Again, there are challenges to this. Um, again, the main one is time and resource commitment. Many of us are doing this voluntarily uh, alongside or on top of academic positions. Actually, not all of us are academics, so many of us are, but some are independents, either working on um, projects themselves. There are people in agriculture, etc. cetera. Um, there are people independently working in other institutions. Um, but also duplication of effort. So working at this kind of scale, even having this process in place, to trying to triage questions in and get a sense from as diverse a group of people as we can find across Europe as to whether we already have answers out there. We do find ourselves in the middle of a process sometimes and we find another body is doing the same thing or something very, very similar. So there's a lot of coordination between uh, networks of networks almost between different, different bodies doing science policy work. And the very final one I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to walk through the request process, but that's, that's just to give a sense of it's pretty detailed and pretty rigorous, and um, the way those requests are triaged and answered, um, is IBES. So the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, established in 2012. This body operates at the global level. Um, it's more commonly known, I suppose, as the IPCC for nature. Um, it operates in some similar ways to the IPCC, if you're more familiar uh, with that model. It has 140 member states, it's a very big entity. Uh, it will have its next plenary this summer, so it does have regular plenary meetings and other activities that take place beyond those. And the major thing that it best does, if you're not familiar, is it conducts assessments. So you may have seen the global assessment released a couple of years ago. It was very, very much in the press. Um, but they have done thematic assessments, regional assessments prior to that. So again, it's an entity that generates knowledge products to put out into the world about biodiversity and ecosystem services. It does a lot of policy support with its member, its member states, um, both developing tools and methodologies to support the integration of that evidence uh, when it is generated, capacity building along a similar line, and actually a lot of communications and outreach just to get the messages out there too. There are challenges with IPVES also, so as I say, I'm gonna quickly summarize these at the end, but in terms of knowledge to action, obviously really, really tricky. I think one of the main things that they are recognized for doing is these big assessments, be it global, thematic, regional, et cetera, but to actually then have something done with that is, is trickier. Um, so I think this has been one of the things that IPVES has been really focused on. Uh, actually taking that knowledge into action. And also the simple pace that you can do things at when you're a really, really big entity with lots and lots of processes and lots and lots of people involved is just the pace at which you can operate. I wonder if I should just leave this up for a moment because I can have people read this through. I realize this is a, a wordier slide than I would normally put together. Uh, but this is actually taken from a paper that myself and some colleagues put together a few years ago. It's the opening paper to a special issue on science policy interfaces uh, around biodiversity and ecosystems. And we tried to set out some general opportunities and challenges as we saw them. And I think actually these tally with some of the things that have been said about the previous discussions. Um, so challenges really just being highlighting what's going on, giving the scope of what's happening in terms of the deterioration of the environment and the consequences, um, addressing the interconnectedness of ecosystems and people to tackle the planetary crisis and be able to communicate this through a kind of systemic perspective across scales. Um, dealing with the complexities of science policy interfaces, I've given three small examples on a similar topic and they all have their own trickinesses. Um, they all, perhaps intentionally, don't really integrate with one another even though there's, there's ways in which they kind of overlap in the realities of the world that we work in. Um, and the last one maybe is one that we can talk about a bit more, and I guess we will talk about more, the kind of transformation or the positionality that scientists have in this evolving space where, yeah, it's becoming more and more urgent that we listen to um, the alarm bells and actually act on them. Maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Sorry.
Um, okay. Um, so actually, before um, before moving to the audience and asking questions, uh, um, having audience uh, asking their questions, I just uh, wanted to um, to ask um, Carla to. Um, a little bit elaborate on the final point where she left it, uh, us with to um, to um, to think about. And so, um, how do you think we as uh, scientists can 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 really, in a concrete way, realize that sense of urgency that there is? And how how can we act in a timely manner and not be lagging behind in our let's say own construction? Good question. Um, I, I, I realize what I just presented probably gives a sense of what I'm trying to do. And I think a lot of colleagues I see are doing a similar thing. Um, and a lot of that is, uh, what's the phrase that I'm looking for? It's kind of, um, uh, it's, it's, it's spreading yourself out, I suppose. <laughs> so it's, it's recognizing that actually you can and should engage with things at as big a scale as you possibly can if you can be involved in these processes at kind of regional and global level, that actually we kind of need to be acting at every single one of them. So I suppose I've quite consciously tried to sort of spread my effort, as it were, across different, um, different scales and different spheres because they are all acting and reacting in different ways at different paces. I don't know if that completely yeah, answers Yeah, yeah, you. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, it kind of shows how, um, let's say, horizontal everything has become, mm. including us as scientists. We have to um, kind of, not to be less focused, but to kind of realize that uh, we need to also be more active in, in working with others, mm. I think. Yeah, so absolutely, absolutely. Um, obviously, I have other questions, but I just want to first ask our panelists whether they have questions. We, we, I give them this privileged position <laughs> before the audience. Dan, please. please. Um, thanks very much, Carla. Uh, I've just come back from a two-year secondment to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, where I was in one of the ex-Foreign Office bits rather than one of the ex diffid bits, so my job wasn't really to deal with um, science or development questions directly. Uh, but I did see there was a definite cultural difference between the ex diffid side, where evidence, including scientific evidence, is taken very seriously, and um, colleagues on the development side made heavy use of knowledge for development, which sounds um, quite similar to uh, Eclipse, but uh, it's run out of the Institute for Development Studies in um, Sussex, in case anyone here doesn't know. Um, but that, that mechanism of directly answering questions that decision makers are worried about right now in a quick manner seems really essential mm -hmm. to the uptake of science or evidence from social sciences and humanities more broadly in decision making. But it also relies on people within those institutions already having the, the awareness and the knowledge to ask the right questions. So I was wondering, in your experience, how do you sort of engineer <laughs> the people in those institutions to ask you what you think they need to be asking? <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a lot of dialogue, I should say. So there is a lot of dialogue at the beginning. So the process that we normally receive questions through is uh, is an online process. It's not always. So there will sometimes be conversations that happen in meetings and plenaries and in places. Um, but yeah, most of them will come online. Um, but yeah, generally we'll have a series of conversations with the people who've made the submissions. And we will, in part, try to get to understand, as I, as I said, like firstly, does this exist somewhere? And it's actually just it hasn't been identified, um, so maybe uh, is actually an even quicker, even quicker uh, win for the people requesting. Um, sometimes, yeah, we, we do end up having a bit of a to and fro on, is the question answerable? Like, can we answer the question with the resources we have, with the methods that we have, with the, the kind of scope and remit that we have as individuals? Um, so I think it's often an interplay of, yeah, sort of trying to address the core kind of thematic topic that has been requested, but actually recognizing that, I suppose what I'm getting at is if an appreciation of if you want something to be done um, quickly, perhaps you're not going to do a systematic review. Um, so a little bit of a balance of what's possible in terms of the methods and the time that we have available to us to be able to answer 
those kinds of questions in the ways that we would normally do within academic research. So I suppose that's often quite a, quite a part of shaping the question um, as well. I mean, the thematic scope doesn't tend to go to awry because I think we're often, we are very bounded within, it has to be within Europe or within a country in Europe, ideally something across Europe, but even if it's one country that's further applicable, it has to be on biodiversity and ecosystems. So I think there, there are questions that automatically get scoped out because they're completely not within that remit. Um, but for example, the biodiversity and pandemics was an interesting one because that came from, as you can imagine, like a whole cascade of questions that related to biodiversity and pandemics, but some of which were incredibly open-ended that actually would have been really challenging to answer or were being answered elsewhere, down to things which were um, how to say, very policy prescriptive. So they were really wanting uh, something that would recommend exactly what courses of action to take, for example. So again, we have to kind of have that conversation of we exist to generate knowledge, but not necessarily to tell you what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions from the panel? Yeah. Um if, but just in case if you could share your experience. So this is probably related to what um, joint research that I'm doing with Joy and Rebecca about tsunami warning in Japan. Well, um, as a scientist, we, we know, okay, okay, what is the risk of, of things? But um, as a policy maker or um, kind of the gov local government agency who, who is in charge of um, giving the warning, they would like to make sure that no one will be killed by, by these things. But for us, we would like to minimize non-necessary evacuation or non-necessary non dis the disturbance of the um, like processing of things in the business. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this this kind of kind of conflicts or kind of mismatch between scientists and policy making or per person. Do you have any experience? For for me, still there's still we cannot solve this kind of problem. But if, based on your experience, if you have any sort of thing you could could share to us, I'm trying to think of. Good example. It's quite a difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> <Are> you <laughs> You're thinking. <laughs> yeah. Just because, as you say, like it's, 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 there's a very different level of certainty that we're prepared yeah, to, yeah. to exist with um, often in these spaces. Um, mm. Yeah, there's not one that immediately jumps to me, yeah. which is like a really good example of yeah, where yeah, we've yeah. kind of resolved that. Um, I think there's been some wonderful work done on the processes of how we do resolve that. Mm -hmm. So I know that certainly within our teaching, and I think we, we have updated this because I know the original of this was, was published some time ago, but um, the um, PBL Netherlands, the Dutch Environment Agency, did some really wonderful stuff on uncertainty communication, trying to build kind of matrices for how you, uh, I guess, understand different elements of uncertainty and communicate mm -hmm. those between different actors. So I know that there's some really nice process stuff, but I, I, yeah, I can't pick out of the air a really good example of action. Thank you. I so think maybe we, we need more communication or yeah. give knowledge to local people or stakeholders to understand more what is behind the, the reason of that. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we can actually take a question from the audience. Uh, I see a hand, maybe you can give the mic. There. Um, uh, yeah, very interesting discussion, but I'm not sure we actually accurately captured what the problem is within that configuration. Just to highlight the last point, the divide between scientists on the one hand and policy makers. I don't think it's like that at all. I mean, so many examples would uh, counteract that. And just to give a few. Uh, the 2008 economic crash, you know, the Queen went up to the LSE and said, why did all the economists fail to predict this, you know? Um, in Fukushima, which was just highlighted, you know, um, Germany was abandoning their whole nuclear project as a result. In the UK, we amplified it, you know? It's, uh, it, the, the power circuitry crosses that divide by a million miles, you know? It's, uh, I mean, there was a famous Bishop of Durham, who said that, you know, if there was a flood in Bengal in which 5,000 people died, that headline on the BBC would be two Brits got the hair wet. You know, this is the configuration we're dealing with. 
moral conflict is at the heart of this. And in reality, it's moral privilege as a vantage against moral praxis. And if it's going to be moral praxis that wins, people have to lose. And large numbers of people and institutions will have to lose. And who's going to be coming forward for that? So, um, is the question clear? Um, not so much. I mean, as a comment, I, I completely take your point. I, I don't know that I can respond to it as a question. Um, yeah, so, so was it, I mean, was it a question or a comment in the sense that do you think... Uh, Elon Musk, Elon Musk is planning to evacuate to space and, you know, take a few of his uh, fellows with him. But that's how the situation is. Hmm? Uh, uh, okay, um, thank you, actually. But can you introduce yourself also? Because I think, yeah. yeah my name is Heli. I'm an independent researcher and uh, curator and architect. I document these kind of configurations through art and sound. But for me, in my, in my understanding, it's really an installation that we're able to exhibit. We're not able to exhibit concrete normative change because it's power which is so beyond our possibility. You know, the power circuits within the world which define all of these decisions they're not just divides between science and public policy. They're divides between resource allocations and the way in which asymmetry provides its own generation of power. And that's the definition within this, you know, I don't know, it's like a kind of industry now of disaster prediction, you know. We, we, we fail to predict every disaster going, and we keep predicting even more, you know, but they just come and evacuate whoever they evacuate, and then it's the next one. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Clearly, clearly this um, kind of focuses on the inequalities uh, very clearly. And uh, uh, do you have something more to say? I, I can again. I, I think I'm, I'm probably just building on what you've said, though, and like I absolutely don't disagree that the, the power symmetries play out enormously. And I, I recognise we're focusing on a kind of science policy interface here in a very kind of um, uh, caricatured way, as it were. So uh, recognising that everything we say is, um, yeah, situ as I say, the examples that I gave, I tried to situate within those three spaces, but actually, of course science policy interface and all of these interfaces are far bigger than what we can cover just now. Yeah. It is also about what we can do as scientists and um, clearly I think it was also said in the morning that to try to be optimistic and try to take one step at a time and try to improve and I think knowledge always improves. I mean, so that, that is from a scientist point of view clearly. Clearly. Um, I wish I could take more questions from the audience, but we kind of need to uh, move to the next presentation. And, uh, and then, clearly, if there is time, we're going to take more questions. And obviously, uh, you can grab Carla after the session to ask uh, your questions. So, Dan, please.
that in the right place? You picking up the books? Great. <clears throat> thanks, everybody, and thanks for sticking with us to this point in the afternoon where uh, I suspect much of the energy and enthusiasm that carried us through the morning might be dissipating, uh, but you are still worse so you've stuck it out. Um, I admit I had a moment of panic when Fatima told me what the theme of this panel was because uh, my first thought was that I should provide some examples from my historical research of the power of science overcoming boundaries between people, be that people from different communities, people across geographical divides. But unfortunately, all of the work that I've done in this space is about how science and engineering has failed to overcome divides <laughs> in the context of uh, international river water disputes between India and Pakistan, where the fact that the, uh, the cohort of engineers who are dealing with divided water after those two countries' independence and partition in the late 1940s came from the exact same engineering schools and had worked very closely together as colleagues for some number of decades and then could not agree on an equitable settlement of water. And that is a problem that still plagues international relations today. But fortunately, uh, it turned out it was OK for me to talk about some of my own experience trying to be a historian crossing different kinds of boundary, be those disciplinary or geographical. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll start with my conclusions in case I run out of time, because that, <laughs> that, uh, that unplanned that's anecdote twice. about um, engineers has taken up a minute of my ten. Uh, so there are two basic roles history can play in hazards and disaster risk reduction research. One is what we might broadly call social analysis, and in that, I would include econ economics, policy, culture, labels as a matter of choice to an extent. Um, and that is the traditional domain of the humanities and social sciences. I do hope that wasn't me. Uh, and the other is what we might call data mining. So using historical tools and methodologies to extract data about past hazards which colleagues in the physical sciences can use. And I'm going to outline each of these modes uh, very briefly today. To work effectively with historians, uh, we need really quite well-targeted interventions. Historians aren't always the most relevant person to any given piece of work, but when we are useful, we can be really useful. When you do decide to involve a historian <laughs> in your project, it's essential to focus on relationships, so preferably co-working and really understanding each other's methodologies is absolutely essential, and understanding the constraints and mixed incentives. I mean, I don't want to get into a whole discussion about REF and impact case studies, but suffice to say that incentives differ across boundaries and uh, across disciplines in quite important ways. And finally, that historians have a curious mixture of often quite narrow specialism in terms of region um, and time period. So personally, I'm most comfortable in 20th century India and Pakistan. Uh, and if you ask me to work on, I don't know, uh, 16th century uh, Southern Africa, I probably wouldn't be a whole lot of use. But within our sort of um, tram lines, we're used to being adaptable and flexible to a certain extent and to attacking uh, questions from a variety of different standpoints. So to take these two modes of historical research in turn, firstly, I'll talk about a project which uh, I'm just sort of finishing up some of the research outputs. And by that, I mean starting writing the book, um, which was a project on the social and political impacts of earthquakes across uh, colonial South Asia, which in present day terms is India, Pakistan, uh, and Myanmar, with uh, a kind of nod to Nepal, which was not colonized, but was affected by one of the earthquakes. And it was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And I had a project partner based in Kathmandu, the National Technology. So in this project, I was using one of the key strengths of history, which is understanding change over time. And what I have found, uh, and what my team has found, is that there was a definite shift in how the colonial authorities responded to earthquakes between the 1890s, when the first of these major earthquakes happened, and the 1930s, when three more occurred. And over that time period, the colonial state become, became much more interventionist. It did more, and it was much more ambitious in terms of its relief response and its interventionism in reconstruction. A lot of that is down to shifting global norms. So this is a period in which uh, earthquake management and earthquake governance was becoming more established internationally. It has something to do with uh, shifting public understandings in Britain, among the public and in Parliament, 
about the colonial state's responsibility for Indian lives and livelihoods, which mainly played out in terms of famine, but had some read across to acute hazards. Uh, but I focused much more closely on the dynamic relationship between the colonial authorities and anti-colonial nationalists, so most famously the Indian National Congress, uh, most famously led by Mahatma Gandhi. So within that broad trend towards greater intervention, it's also really important to emphasize uh, a couple of things which we can draw out. The first of which is the highly contingent nature of responses to different disasters. So although there was this general trend, the actual political outcomes of different earthquakes could be very different. If you take the 1934 event in uh, Bihar, the epicenter was actually in Nepal, but I focused on Bihar in North India. Uh, and the 1935 earthquake in Quetta, what is now Western Pakistan, uh, which killed about 30,000 people. Although they took place just a year apart, the way that the Indian National Congress uh, interacted with the colonial authorities was very different. So in Bihar, they worked very closely together. It wasn't frictionless, but it was a pretty effective coordination between um, col a colonial government and the people who wanted to kick them out of the country, with pretty good reasons, we must say. Uh, in Quetta, just one year later, the colonial authorities declared martial law and banned Congress volunteers from even entering the damage zone. Congress protested as a result, and this was the only earthquake in late colonial South Asia which saw significant political contestation over earthquake response. And yet, even despite those um, differences in outcome, there were some commonalities between the way that the colonial authorities and some leading nationalists thought about earthquakes and why they mattered and why relief response mattered. And much of this has to do with how they envisaged the class composition of Indian society, but it also came down to a common conception of what hazards and what disasters were, and particularly the idea that disasters are caused by nature and the place of humans is to respond to them. And this means that there was no serious discussion about things like the root causes of vulnerability, the way that colonial economics produced poverty, and put some people more in the way of harm than others. So the second uh, use of history, what we might call data mining. So it's a pretty well-established practice, particularly in historical seismology, to use historical records to supplement the uh, instrumental data because basically uh, we didn't have seismographs before uh, the early 20th century or the late 19th century. <laughs> And so historians can help uh, physical scientists recover data about past events. And I was involved in some of this work in a scoping study in Bhutan, uh, funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund, now dearly departed, more or less, um, which was led by Francis Cooper, uh, a structural geologist at Bristol, who, as it happens, has also just joined uh, UCL in the Earth Sciences Department. Um, and we had a team which mixed social scientists, physical scientists, uh, policy makers uh, in Bhutan, and me, drawn from across the UK and uh, Bhutan. And uh, one of our engineers was on loan from India as well. So my part in this project was to uh, tour um, libraries and uh, what are called zongs, which are kind of a cross between a monastery, a fort, and an administrative center and speak with the monks there and try to identify evidence they had from their historical records, so the archives they hold within the songs, which could help illuminate past earthquakes. And this was a short scoping study, uh, one of the two, two, at least two, of those many um, failed funding bids that I mentioned were for follow-up work. We haven't yet been funded. Any funders in the room? I will have your money if you are offering it. Uh, so don't ask me for definite results yet, but we at least had a proof of concept that there are real references to um, past earthquakes available in particularly biographies of religious figures. That's one of them you can see in the, uh, the image on the right there, um, which either reveal new events, you know, small-scale seismic events that we didn't already know about, or give better data on ones that we already did know about. For example, this is from an autobiography of a religious figure who lived through the 1714 earthquake. Um, and this helps provide some data which, frankly, I don't really understand, but my physical science colleagues uh, can use to input into their models. So this kind of work is really challenging. 
because as a historian, I already outlined my, my limitations in the sense that I tend to focus on India and Pakistan. Bhutan, although geographically close, is culturally, linguistically, politically a very different environment. Um, so actually, I knew much less going into this project than I would expect to if I was working on India or Pakistan. Um, but at the same time, it was fantastically rewarding. For example, in this uh, photo on the left, that's myself and my colleague Max Werner, who's a seismologist, speaking with a monk about this record in the photo on the right, and seeing the kind of questions that Max asked from his deep understanding of seismology, and comparing those with the questions that I asked with my historian's instincts, was really productive for both me and Max. Not quite sure how much our um, respondent got out of it, but he was very polite and generous with his time. So I've already given my conclusions, which is lucky because I'm over. So it just remains to me to say thank you very much. OK. Um, thank you, Dan. So, um, so just uh, first of all, it was nice to see Max Werner because I have read his work, but I've never seen him. So <laughs> that was nice that you have had that experience um, working with him. Uh, so um, actually, I asked this question as an, actually as an earthquake engineer because um, it is very interesting to me to see this group of like very interdisciplinary group of, of engineers, scientists, sociologists, and yes, also policymakers come together to, um, to, to work on seismic risk. So what was your uh, experience? I mean, was it a smooth kind of, let's say, interaction or they were barriers in that? Um, bit of both in, in the sense that it took an awful lot of work uh, to agree what questions we were going to pitch to the funder and how we were going to address them. And actually, the many hours that Max and Francis and Byron Adams and I uh, spent sitting in various offices in the Earth Sciences Department in Bristol, knocking around questions, turned out to be really valuable in establishing what we did know and what we didn't know. Um, so, for example, we would sit there and look together at previous published research on historical seismology in the Himalaya and in, and in Bhutan, and they were able to explain a lot to me because I'm you know, not scientifically trained. I didn't understand the physical processes, but I could also evaluate the historical evidence that went into those papers and on which claims were being made. So, for example, I, I forget now the, the detail of the case study, but there was one case in which the scientists were citing the authority of somebody who had lived through an earthquake as a four-year-old child and decades later was writing an autobiography. And so I was able to point to the large body of work in oral history on how memory affects recollection, um, thinking about degrees of evidence and what's first-hand, second-hand, third-hand evidence, hearsay, and all those kinds of things which are kind of very basic to my discipline, but not and a lot of it's common sense, frankly. There's nothing mystical about his historians and what we do. Uh, but if you're used to thinking about these things, they spring to mind more quickly, right? Um, and that meant that when we got to the field, we had a relationship of trust between myself and my scientist colleagues, and also a reasonable sense between us of what we hope to get out of it. Um, I will say that in some interdisciplinary work I've done, there have been tensions uh, across the humanities and social sciences, uh, which are, there's nothing inherent about that again, and a lot of it comes down to people and priorities and personality. But in some ways, it's kind of easier to slot together a humanities subject and a physical science subject, which are completely different, because you start from the point of view that you have little in common and you need to build a bridge. Whereas when people in more similar fields work together, we often find that we're trying to do different things but using the same language, which just confuses us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there other questions from our panel to, to Dan before we move to the floor? Carla, do you want to speak? Although, I mean, it's not a very technical question, but I'm just fascinated from the last image you showed. What was the most, what were the most, I suppose, unusual or kind of surprising lines of evidence that you found in this, um, in this scoping that you were able to use? I think it was it was these biographies of religious figures, which are a type of source that I wasn't familiar with beforehand. Um, so the archives I normally use tend to be government 
um, generated or uh, memoirs of individuals or sort of private papers of, of people which are catalogued in quite familiar ways um, to, to my kind of UK upbringing. Um, but in Bhutan, there was no tradition of archive keeping in that sense. So there weren't government records per se uh, in, in the sense of kind of administrative archives which departments generated. And so the main sources of history that Bhutanese scholars use to write the history of Bhutan are these biographies, which, because they, they center on individuals, but they encompass information about other things that were going on. And so you can catch references. Actually, Kama Prunso, who was one of our partners in Bhutan, who, who runs a uh, kind of cultural heritage organization there, was planning to organize um, some scholars fluent in classical Tibetan, um, Choke dialect, which is what was used in Bhutan, to systematically go through some of these um, biographies to and the scoping work he did turned up re a lot of references, not just to seismic hazards, but also um, uh, rain, rain induced landslides, flood events. The kind of, there's a whole rich repository of data there about Bhutan, but it takes an incredible <laughs> level of scholarship and learning to access it. So, you know, even an ordinary Bhutani would not necessarily have either the language abilities or the uh, understanding of the very specific uh, genre conventions and writing styles of those religious biographies mm -hmm. in order to actually understand what they're saying and to triage what are um, sort of uh, allegorical references to what look like geophysical processes to actual records of things that happened, if that makes sense. Thank you. Anna? Well, um, yeah, I have several questions, but just for the time, just me, yeah, just to choose one question. So, um, like for my in my case, we are talking about more older document. I'm not sure. Like for example, your your case in Pakistan, still you have photographs, so you can sure this is a certain damage or um, kind of record. But like your example in Bhutan, it looks more o much more older. So my question is that um, how d would you um, make sure or how do you classify the reliability of the document? Like for example, if we talk about tsunami or flood, maybe in the, the old records say, okay, the water reached this step of the temple or reached that hill, something like that. Sometimes in the, in the history, historical record, they probably say too much, like too over talking like that. So in your experience, how do you have any experience about that or how would you classify the reliability of the document? Um, thanks. In Bhutan, I am basically reliant on our local partners who have the, the understanding. I don't remember very specific technical data, so it would be more like identifying that there was an event which in their subjective perception was serious or not serious. If it was serious enough, if it was a big enough event to be in a religious figure's biography, that probably means either it was smallish but highly local to wherever they were or it was something national scale if it wasn't local and kind of understanding the difference requires as i said a lot of contextual knowledge for colonial records and post-colonial records in india and and other successor states to colonial india um, actually those were highly modernist bureaucracies that kept a lot of scientific records so for the 20th century um, i mean you as a as a scientist would recognize if I gave you one of the geological survey of India's reports from 1897, you would be able to go through that and very easily pull out the data. Um, and they also, the GSI in particular, were very careful about recording the reliability of their data, uh, which maybe we should talk about it afterwards because I'm on <laughs> time, but I've got some good, some good stories in that. So um, I would like to also take a question from the audience. Are there questions? Yes. I'm Sobia and I'm also doing, I'm from Pakistan and I'm doing my research on climate history of a particular region which is in disputed region, which is disputed part of Pakistan. It's mountainous and hazards and disasters are like a uh, usual phenomena for us. So I was wondering as a historian when you'll go and when you, you'll try to rely on historical records and you mentioned uh, that colonial records which are kind of modernist and perhaps reductionist in nature. And how, do you, how did you try to integrate those cultural imaginaries or indigenous perspectives which may be different than those colonial records? Again, um, 
the power imbalances still exist, which try to suppress and dismiss indigenous voices. For instance, people wouldn't assume earthquake as um, maybe not disaster, maybe for their imagination it can be a different thing. So how do you try to balance that view? Also being an outsider and historian, how did you try to build that trust or how did you try to maneuver your standpoint in those particular regions or areas? Can I ask yeah. which, um, which district are you from? Uh, I am from Hunza, which is in Gilgit, Baltistan, Karakrum, area, Karakrum mountainous ranges. So Huns is a, an interesting kind of counter to my, my big claim about colonial um, record keeping because about a third of what is now India and Pakistan and Bangladesh was under what, what we would call princely rule, so not under direct administration of colonial officials, and actually Hunza was one of those, as you will well know. Um, so you don't have the same kind of record keeping for areas like Hunza. Um, but in a way the kind of history work I do is not ethnographic, so I don't spend most of my time going and talking to indigenous communities. I spend it sitting in archives in Lahore or Delhi or um, London a lot of the time because, you know, colonialism. So Britain <laughs> acquired a lot of the records about India and Pakistan. Um, and actually one of the limitations I found with my earthquakes project w is that I began with this grand conception to study many earthquakes uh, with a small amount of resources and a small project time frame. And actually, to really properly tell the story of any one earthquake, you would need much more intensive research in a, a range of languages with a range of local expertise. So um, frankly, I wouldn't tackle the definitive history of an earthquake in Hunza. Uh, and I was pretty limited looking at the Kangra earthquake of 1905 and the Shillong earthquake of 1897, because those happened in areas uh, where there was a relatively low imprint of the colonial state and um, local literacy at the time was not very strong, and I didn't have the time or expertise to go and do uh, large-scale oral history or sort of folk memory research. Um, I could go on about that, but I probably shouldn't. <laughs> we need time. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, actually, I have to move on to our uh, third and uh, final um, speaker uh, for today. Um, I mean, we actually had a uh, tsunami uh, being discussed earlier today, and uh, so um, I think the topic does not need uh, introduction. But here we are talking about um, a phenomenon that is literally global in the sense that the waves of tsunami literally travel across the world, and consequences that we have heard also from different uh, people today mentioning really go beyond the borders. So let's see what uh, Anavat can say about us from the experiences of a country uh, that really has um, suffered through, um, through tsunami events and a country to which we really look up to for a culture of prevention and preparedness. And, uh, and discipline to tackle this uh, problem. So uh, with that, um, maybe I just need to help. Maybe just take a scary, it's okay. Yeah. Hello, this is okay? Okay, thank you once again. Um, so, um, so this is the, the topic that I was um, assigned for my for, for today's um, session. And thanks for um, patience and stay, um, stay until the last talk for today. So I'll, I would like to, um, well, as, as you mentioned, um, well, tsunami is the, probably the only um, natural hazard that is um, called, called in not, on, not English term, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So um, yeah, that is another reason why I, I choose um, to study about tsunami Japan, and um, that this is. Um, I would like to use this phenomena as the example how um, our scientific community how we, we work together to um, to um, to try to reduce the, um, the 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 damage or things in the future. 
Um, talking about our community, we have started our what we call International Tsunami Survey Team um, since um, 1992, Nicaragua Tsunami. Um, because as, as Father Man mentioned, tsunami could go everywhere, this um, a water body. So we, we need um, like international collaboration to do the survey. Some, in some many, many of tsunami events beyond um, the local, th that country to, you know, to have tsunami scientists or experts to do the field survey, the right survey. Um, for this, um, with um, the UNESCO IOC, uh, we, we are also um, published kind of a manual guideline how to do the, the survey so that to make sure, this is probably related to um, the previous session, we talked about the data. So we need um, proper data to make sure that this data can be used for everyone with the same standard. So, and I will talk a little bit later how we, we make use of this kind of data. So um, as a team, we, we do um, survey, we do loc education to loc local people, um, we, we produce the, the data that can be used for, for future to understand what, 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 has, uh, what has happened. And to, to share the data information among the scientific um, com networking community, we also, well, I think ma many of you might join the IUGG next, next month in, in Berlin. And um, actually, in, inside the IUGG framework, we also have um, set up what we call Joint Science Commission. Um, we have like um, 50 or 60 um, scientists in, as in the team where we, we, we also do like um, tsunami session um, every four years under IUGG and every two years um, we, we change the host um, every, like that. So this is a, a way we, we share our finding and, and well, re research um, result. We just start since um, 1960 where we had a great um, earthquake in Chile and also that produce tsunami um, reach to Japan after a day. At that time, we have no um, international warning, um, so that is another uh, point, point of view that we, we have to work uh, very internationally, especially for our tsunami hazard. Um, for our community, um, probably we, we, we started a bit later that compared to um, earthquake or volcano. In earthquake, we have GAM, or for volcano, we have, uh, they have um, GV, um, GVM for, for tsunami as well. We also have um, a kind of community um, called GTM, which is what we call a um, global tsunami model, where we a kind of a network, international network of um, researchers from different universities and institutions. And we were working with, um, uh, it, now it's UN, uh, it used to be UNISDR, but now it's UNDRR, and the, um, the World Bank um, to, to they, they, they support us how to we, we contribute our scientific result to the um, stakeholders and local people. Um, some of the product is something like, for example, the mac well, probable um, tsunami height um, for, for each area for different um, return period. And as um, Elon mentioned, uh, introduced in the, the, the last talk in this morning, uh, 2004 Indian Ocean is kind of um, the initiative that um, tsunami should be more um, international. And as I mentioned, it, it goes everywhere um, where the water body is connected. And this, as, as I mentioned, um, this also this is the, um, probably the, the first um, event in the record um, of many countries, including my home country in Thailand, where we, we have never um, such a um, record of, of tsunami before. So that, that is why um, we, we had an um, international um, survey team as I mentioned in my first slide, that we, we go and, and measure the, the run up of tsunami height and um, yeah, that will can be used in the, uh, in, a, in the things that I would explain later on. And the, the, first, uh, the, the, the right one is another one in 2011 that you, you, you might um, have know already, but you can see that uh, we also, again, um, from the, the international team, we, we could, um, observe um, many thousand points of, of tsunami height that can be used for the, um, to understand the mechanism of the earthquake. So this is an example why we, we have to, to measure or um, what, what, what we can make benefit from international um, survey team and what we can learn from this. Um, for example, um, in, in case of 2004, Indonesian tsunami, again, it's not only one country, so it's, um, it, it impacts many countries all over the ocean. So um, from by knowing this kind of, of um, tsunami height, so we can do some reverse analysis 
to okay what what is the the uh, what to be the the location of the fault what is to be the location of the high slip area and um, yeah for example if you use only the the data on the east side of, of the fault you might you could be able to propose a source model fault model of the earthquake that could reproduce um, tsunami height in the east but might not be able to produce a nice uh, a, a good match with the uh, tsunami in Sri Lanka or India, for example. So this is the kind of thing that um, we need more data and we need collaboration among the um, global um, scientists to, to get uh, enough data to understand the hazard. For vulnerability or risk assessment as well, um, unfortunately, um, 20 years ago, we have less um, um, technology or kind of um, knowledge to, to arrange the data. Although we, we had many, um, we, we got a lot of damage in many areas, but um, we still have lack, lack of um, survey and um, kind of uh, technology to, to, to do the database. And um, for example, one, one example is that uh, in, in, in Thailand, we have less um, way to, to store the data, even though we have many, like many thousand of damaged buildings, but in the database, we have only just 100 or 200 of buildings in our database. Or in Indonesia, we, we have no such a good um, collection of the data. So what, what we could do at that time, so we, we just um, classify the damage by using the satellite image before and after the tsunami and try to um, virtually um, classify if the, the roof is remained or not. And, and so we, we could have classified with the types of buildings. We, we only know um, from, from the, the sky. And uh, so, but anyway, from, from this kind of data, we, we can somehow relate it, um, for example, the, the flow depths and the damage of the building. So once we know this kind of relationship, we can do, do more for the urban planning. What is the minimum um, flow depth that could da destroy a building? Then we can do it for better for the urban planning as well. For, for Japan Tsunami, we have more data. Um, we have, as I mentioned, we have like, five of 6,000 um, points that we, we measure for the height. So by using this kind of data, we can, again, yeah, do the reverse analysis to understand, um, okay, what, what, where, where was the high slip or is the location of the, the fault rupture? So under, for the hazard perspective, we, we under, can understand more in this case. And for the, the vulnerability perspective as well, we, we, prove, we improve a lot. Um, for example, in the case of building data, we in Japan we have a lot of um, data and we is quite well organized. We we know the uh, types of building, and for example, then when we talk about the vulnerability curve, we can plot for different types of building or different types of structure or different type of number of stories. So by knowing more um, accurate um, this kind of relationship, we can apply this for um, urban planning. For example, this is the the map of Sendai City where um, we, we propose to um, increase the road elevation at here to six meters to, to, to make sure that um, even though the water um, overtop the, the road, this road, the, the, the floor depth behind the elevated road will be less than two meters, um, so that this two meters we will not destroy the building, something like that. And how? How can we draw the conclusion or criteria of two meter? It is the fact that what we learn from the data that we, we gather based on the international collaboration or the data um, arrangement in the database. And last but not least, I would like to, to conclude that is, oh, of course we need some scientific, scientific background to, um, to back up or to, to help for the, um, the, the things for the planning or the deconstruction. But we also need to, to collaborate with like um, international organization or um, to post uh, decision making or um, pra practitioner. To do that um, with UN, the U, uh, UN, UNDR, we, we, since 2016, we start uh, what we call the World Tsunami Awareness Day, the 5th of November. Um, well, we can search later what, why was that, because I think we don't have time to explain about that. But yeah, so every year we're trying to make use of this kind of campaign. To, to raise awareness of, of people um, around the world, um, not only scientists, but um, yeah. So we, we organize um, like the Tsunami Museum Conference, or we, we, we help the UNDP um, to, to promote the school preparedness 
um, or evacuation or during COVID, we, we know that the, the, it is, you know, I mean, the, the, it, the action evacuation is more, to save life is more important than um, to get COVID in the, in the shelter or something like that. So we also have tried to help to, to um, make a guideline, something like that. And I would like to end my, my talk here with um, just a small piece of work that um, we could um, initiate while I'm doing uh, my visiting in, in UCL with, again, uh, this five people that uh, we, again, as an international um, community, we are trying to collect all possible um, vulnerability data in one database so that everyone can, can, can easily see and, and share. So this is kind of, um, again, uh, we, we need um, in, in, uh, international collaboration. And by having this, um, we, well, by having these kind of things, we can apply to other areas and could help to understand the, the risk and um, it, um, qualify the risk and do more better planning for the reconstruction and future risk management. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anavat, uh, for the great presentation. So, um, are there, I'm going to first ask the panel, are there questions for Anavat? So, uh, Carla, do you have, or uh, Dan? Who wants to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, thank you. Um, Please. Just a, a, a quick one, which is, how, how much does your work directly involve um, what we might call political buy-in, as in, are you operating in the domain of science or are you also on the science policy interface on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, yeah, do, does the work you do require a kind of constant engagement with policy and the administration and politicians or are you uh, generating evidence and understanding that can later feed into policy? Yeah, so as our role, we, we are helping local government, for example, after the, the tsunami, um, when we would like to, um, for example, the, the six meter elevated road, we, we, we help them by doing simulation. Okay, what is the, the best height of elevated road? That should be, um, okay. Um, of course, we can build 10, 10 meters, but it's probably not um, economy <laughs> good. And also, uh, we need maintenance things or something like that. So this kind of, uh, we help them as a support. Uh, we give like um, scientific um, data as a background for them to make um, um, decision making. But as I like my, my comment at, at, at the beginning about the, the warning, this is the thing that is actually happens that um, what the government or local people thinking is different to um, things because they want to make sure that um, things will not be such thing will not happen, but yeah, they are, they are not considered about the physical defense or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I realized I, I was trying to formulate, it's probably quite a similar question, but I was curious as to, yeah, maybe it's a broader question of the target audiences for some of the outputs that you make, so particularly the one that you, you were speaking about at the end, like who do, you, who do you hope to use it? So there'll be policy makers, but is it? Is there a broader remit of stakeholders you hope to use it? And maybe a kind of sub-question about how do you share the data? Because presumably okay. these are huge amounts of data, so how do you um, open up those data sets and allow them to be shared and used? Okay, yeah, I, I, didn't I forgot to mention another big um, stakeholder that being using our data is the insurance company, <laughs> insurance <laughs> section. And um, yeah, so in general, we, we share by publish the paper. So, and of course we, we share our statistical parameters so they, they can report the same thing. Um, yeah, so in, in general, we have two main users, which is um, local government, so that they can use these kind of things as a criteria mm -hmm. um, to, to quantify the, the risk or damage. And of course the insurance company they use for, for them, but, but they cannot open their, their own things. But, but yeah, so, but for, this is for the vulnerability things, but, but for the, the hazard as well. So again, we, 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 share, we publish our data as a map, which is um, local um, government, they, they will use um, by, by themselves, or they, they probably do ask um, some, another company just to visualize or do some more um, simulation. But in, in Japan, we, we be pub I'm not sure the situation in the UK, but in, in Japan, every single, I'll say like county or um, local borough, um, 
in the website, you, you can have an access, access to the different hazard map. You can download and see different, or some, some local government, they put in a la different layer, so you can, you can check something like that. So this is kind of how, how we, we, we open our data. Yes. Thank you, thank you. So um, questions from the audience? Yes? Um, yes, Mark. Thanks for the very wonderful presentation. One general question for all of you, actually. My name is Mark Oja. I'm from Kenya, so I'm happy to be here. The question is on uh, challenges of uh, the link between science and policy. So if you are to consider um, the science policy interface as a, I call a loop, if you will, what do you see as the biggest barriers or enablers for this loop to be completed? And um, the second part of this question is, um, what do you see as a place of politics of knowledge? This is within the different epistemic communities, but also uh, the north-south kind of uh, relationships. Does it affect the way in which uh, this loop is completed, whether it is? Uh, Mark, can you repeat the last question, the second question, before the north and south, so that we understand? Yes. Yeah, so, so here I'm, I'm exploring the place of politics of knowledge in yes. uh, either hollowing out or thinning the, the, um, the cycle of uh, or the interface between policy and practice. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so um, who wants to go first? Uh, okay, I can maybe relate it to, maybe I can mix up your first and second question in, in my one answer. So, well, my, at, at the beginning, I mentioned about the, the conflict between warning things and another thing related to this is probably maybe um, answer your question. It's another point of view is um, the challenge that I'm um, facing or feel, what I feel right now in, in tsunami community is that um, as, a, as a scientist, we, we t maybe you have heard a, an article like, okay, um, we expect this height of tsunami or of flood or whatever within this many x, x year or return period or probability and the height, for example, which is quite difficult to non-expert to understand. You, you might understand, okay, when you check the weather forecast, tomorrow is probably probability to be, to, to be sun, sun or cloudy, cloud or rain, that would be more, more um, easy to understand. But if we talk about, okay, we expect to have um, magnitude of seven within 500 year or every, yeah, something like that is quite difficult. But once when, when we talk with local people or um, like industry owner, they, they ask for different things, which is like, okay, if the earthquake happened in this point, will tsunami will reach, will tsunami reach to my industry uh, uh, factory or shall I, ev should I evacuate or something like that. So from, from my research right now, I'm trying to, to change um, my um, way to visual, for visualization or to to um, well ex show the, the result. We're doing the same thing. We we did many simulation, many many case to get the, the the output. But the way to we convey the output is that we 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 try okay. Let's focus on one area and let's see if um, from our result for from our simulated result um, if what is the the point of the earthquake that will definitely produce tsunami to, to this factory or something like that. So that this kind of, they, once we have this kind of data, so we can help um, support the decision making of the, the factory that, okay, they can see that, okay, from the map, if the earthquake happened in this area, they, they might have less priority to evacuate or stop the, the production or something like that. This is, we use the same thing that to produce the the, the height and probability, but just try to use the same data, but adapt way to, to con convey or um, communicate with the, the decision maker or local stakeholder. Thank you. 
Yeah, so I think on the barriers and enablers, I know I spent a little bit of time on this, but um, yeah, in terms of the critical ones, there are definitely some elements of kind of language and culture institutionally between science and policy, which I think maybe that's a bit, try to say that's the biggest one because it's, it's everything, but, um, but I guess the artificiality of those as well and the fact that we've kind of probably proven that various points throughout today that many of us are not, we're not just scientists, we're not just policymakers, we're not just citizens, we all overlap across all of those things. So as I said, kind of clumsily, you know, we're making a caricature of the science policy interface because we are all more nuanced actors within that and all of those systems are, are more nuanced. But yeah, there, there are definitely things that we've perhaps preserved within the practices of doing policy and the practices of doing science that have made us talk across one another. Um, and hopefully, um, yeah, there are opportunities in these science policy interfaces to reconcile that to some extent. I realize one thing I didn't say, and this is absolutely not a perfect answer, but something which I find encouraging, that especially global um, interfaces like it best are doing, I'm not gonna say the whole name again, um, is from the beginning and actually increasingly, it's been very intentional that indigenous and local knowledge is part of the assessments. So it's not Western science, it's supposed to be an integration of different kinds of knowledge on biodiversity and ecosystems that goes into that. And that's in everything from the global assessment um, to things which have come out much more recently. There was a values assessment that came out last year, which is looking at methods and practices for the very different ways in which we, uh, as a global community, understand the value of nature. So I think things like that, you know, it's not perfect, but it, to see the effort going into it and the attempts made to do this and to integrate and communicate the variety of different knowledges that we need to appreciate and act on is encouraging. So I'm going to say that's an enabler or an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, I think we've heard from the experts on this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so um, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, we are actually uh, coming to the end of this uh, panel session. And uh, obviously, it's very tough to compete with ChatGPT for providing you <laughs> with the summary of this uh, session, and I'm not even going to attempt. Um, and uh, so there is not much time. It's just that I would just uh, maybe uh, spend uh, some seconds to, um, to just um, say that maybe it all comes down to um, trying to ask the right questions at the right time. and because that is going to set our priorities as scientists on what we are going to focus on er our energies. And uh, this is totally something that I guess cannot yet be done by artificial intelligence to ask the right questions. So I guess we take all that privilege to us as, as uh, let's say, people, <laughs> not just scientists. And, uh, and obviously, um, I would also like to refer to um, uh, in the morning, we heard about pipelines. Clearly, pipelines are very important, and it's also important to think about uh, pipelines of knowledge that connect us all together as, uh, as people, first of all, and as scientists. And obviously, that kind of com emphasizes the importance of open science and open data because that is one way of empowering uh, everyone and kind of trying to um, to focus on the different velocities that can exist in the sci advancement of science and focus uh, between the north and south, uh, global north and global south divide would be to try to, to bring the knowledge as far as we can, uh, more than the tsunami waves, hopefully. <laughs> and with that, I really thank you for your uh, attention uh, and, uh, yeah, and thank our excellent panelists for uh, the great insights and the great uh, discussions. Thank you.
And uh, that brings us towards the end of our day today. I was just trying to reflect on what, what have we learned today? What have we discussed today? What's our mood now compared to where it was at 9 a.m. this morning? And I think particularly in the morning, but sort of in the afternoon as well, a key message was be an optimist. If you don't try anything, you will not do anything. That, that came out very strongly in our talks this morning. There will be challenges. Things get in the way, borders, barriers. But, but let's try. Let's try and make a difference. Let's try and keep going. Do the best research we can. Do the best engagement we can. Work across these barriers. Work across these borders. Another message that came through was there are initiatives that do work. <laughs> Three figures. Things can actually happen, things can work. Particularly in research, particularly in academia, we, we are trained from the beginning to criticize. We are trained from the beginning to find the flaws, to find the faults, to destroy you know, the work that we all do and find every single possible thing that could be wrong with it. If we actually want to make a difference, sometimes we have to accept that an initiative, an idea is not perfect. You know, that again came through very strongly this morning. And again, talking about the politics this afternoon, an initiative may not be perfect, but if it's good and it has good impact and we can monitor and evaluate that good impact, let's, let's try it. If we can come up with new, better ways of doing things, fantastic. And if it doesn't work, let's stop and move ahead. But we don't need to reinvent the wheel every single time. And that implies to both things happening now, but also learning from throughout history. And, and, and let's learn from history. Let's not repeat the same mistakes time and time again and from different regions. We also saw that initiatives, interventions, and even disasters themselves may not cause a change, but they could be a positive catalyst. They could be a positive influence. So even if it's not the fundamental cause of the change, we can still use these things to help along, to improve, to make positive influence. And one of these things that perhaps we could make a difference with, and to question what is the role of technology, AI, digital twins, chat EBT, <laughs> what, what is their role? What are the barriers? What are the borders? And I was thinking I, I, one of the borders is between the human and the AI. Um, Geopolitics has come up a lot today. It came up a lot yesterday as well as, as you know, something, a really big barrier. So maybe that's something we all need to think about. People in the room, people online, communities, everybody working in the disaster space. What is our role in geopolitics? What research can we do? What evaluation can we do to try and move the dial? We're not going to solve that tomorrow. But what can we do? What can we show? How can we influence? How can we improve the situation so that those with the power are more interested in sharing it and not trying to cling on, as we discussed yesterday and today, in difficult, different geospheres, different political spheres, different geopolitical spheres. But what can we do? And particularly at the end, I think we really focused on the importance of asking the right questions. And yes, ChatGPT might have summarized the session, but it didn't ask us extra questions. That's what we can do. <laughs> we can find the next questions. We can ask the right questions. And that is somewhere where that's still our role. That's something we need to do. And let's make sure, as I said at the beginning of the day, that in five years' time, we've got a new set of questions. We're not still asking the same questions that we're asking today. After we've uh, closed this session, we have our posters from PhD students and others in the foyer. We're talking about what research we're doing. We're talking about what questions can be asked. How can we be improved? These are the next set of bright minds coming through. So do go and speak to the PhD students about their posters. Um, for prospective students who are in the room, or, or not those online, because I'm afraid you're not here, but those of you who are in the room, um, do come and find uh, Roberto Gentile, if you uh, wave your hand, uh, and he can talk to you about the programs if you've come to talk to him. And I just want to say, um, finish with a huge thank you to all the speakers. I've learned a lot. Uh, I think everybody in the room has learned a lot. To all those behind the scenes organizing, it's a huge amount of work over the last two days, so really appreciate all that work. And to everyone who asked questions, or to those of you who sat quietly and just absorbed. So thank you to everyone. It's, it's been absolutely fantastic. Continue to enjoy yourself, come to the reception, and we will see you not just at next year's event, but at all our events in the meantime as well. Come and work with us, come and collaborate. So from everyone at UCL IDR, thank you so much for being part of today and those of you who were here yesterday as well. 
And at that point, the conference is closed. Thank you.